Okay, this is mic one, check, check. Mic one. Mike, can you hear mic one? Okay, we're checking the left. This is the lavalier microphone. Um, I don't know what channel we're on, but how's it sound? I'm walking around the room a bit. Um, you might hear the music too because The next speaker said he didn't have any computer audio. The
Testing one, two, three. Oh, look, it's working. Awesome. Okay, I tend to ramble on a bit, so I'm going to try to start on time in hopes of actually finishing somewhere close to on time. Uh, sorry, let me adjust this a little bit. There we go. Welcome to our developer track. Um, I'm your host. <laughs> uh, and I've also got the first talk because I'm filling in for another speaker, so I am sorry. Uh, but we had a last minute dropout, so I didn't think it was fair to bring anyone else in on a presentation at the last minute. Uh, you know what, this isn't working out. I'm going to do the other mic. Is this working better? Yeah. You guys can definitely hear this better, right? All right, we shall start. Um, so uh, welcome again to the developer track. And uh, might as well dive into our first talk for the day, which is my talk. Uh, it's called Rules for the Road for Distributed Compute. Um, and as I talked about in the abstract, distributed computing is increasingly pervasive. Almost every computer system now ends up being a distributed system. Uh, what with the proliferation of SaaS providers and containers and network computing, uh, and just the internet itself. Um, so just to start this off as a fun exercise and encourage you all to engage and really do feel free to interrupt me with questions throughout the presentation. I tend to work better in that kind of a context anyway. But to start things off with a bit of audience participation, I've got a quiz for people and anyone from Ticketmaster here you're not allowed to answer. Um, the question is, what was or when was uh, Ticketmaster's first distributed system? Basically, how long have we been doing distributed computing at Ticketmaster? Any guesses? Yeah, at the back there. 1987, good guess. You're off, but it's a good guess. Anyone else? Getting warmer, getting warmer. 82 over here, way in the back. No? So actually, that's, that's pretty close. That, that, and technically, that's right, depending on how you look at it. Um, Actually, our first uh, distributed system was uh, January 23rd, 1977. Uh, it was for UNM's uh, Johnson's Gym, a show there by uh, the Electric Light Orchestra. That's, that's how far back it goes. Uh, and technically speaking, actually, this system was deployed in 76, earlier uh, in the year. Uh, but this was the first time that someone could buy tickets at multiple different locations and at every single location, the same tickets were always available at the same time. So that was actually a real distributed system. So we've been doing this stuff for a while. And it was actually a very basic and simple distributed structure at that time. It was basically a bunch of uh, terminals that were talking to a mainframe. Uh, but it was nonetheless a distributed system. Um, things have changed a little bit since then. This is what Ticketmaster looks like today. We have a lot of virtual machines, virtual servers, physical servers, lots of stuff in AWS, lots of Kubernetes systems, over 300 different uh, products, over, well, it's actually 887, I think is a little bit low, but that's how many uh, components, software components we counted. Those are distinct components, all of which are serving different functions. Uh, so our distributed computing environment is now significantly more complex than it was then. Um, and this leads to our problem case, the unhappy developer. They're staring off into the darkness and it feels like they can do nothing right, they can get nothing done, and everything is breaking around them. Uh, and this is, this is the problem that we want to solve, uh, and this is what our goal is. Uh, and I gotta tell you, this picture, I searched on the Creative Com Commons for happy developer to see what would come up. And this was the closest thing I found to a realistic representation of a happy developer because we all know they're not smiling and laughing because software is frustrating, right? But here's someone who's productive, she's getting stuff done, she's typing away, she's getting work done and she feels like she's accomplishing something. You can see it in her face, she's very purposeful and focused. If we could just get to that level, that would be considered a win in my book. Uh, so 
we looked at the various problems we have and we came up with some high level systemic goals that we wanted to work towards that would get us to this promised land of the happy developer, working in a complex distributed environment. So first, before we go into what these specific uh, targets are, I thought we should talk about the various enemies that you might encounter once you have a reasonably uh, complex distributed system. And by complex, we all know a distributed system, like once there's five or more moving components, it's already complex, right? You don't need 15,000 virtual servers before things start to get ugly. Really, at two, it starts to get ugly, but five is when it gets complex. So. The first problem, the sad tale of uncoordinated caching. This is where you know, you've got a distributed system, things aren't performing well, how do you solve your problems? Oh, I know, I'll just add another cache. And then you add another cache, and then you add another cache. And all of these different caches, are all, they're all caching calls out to other services, uh, and they all have their own made up invalidation rules for when that cache expires. This creates interesting circumstances where it's almost impossible to glean the truth. And in fact, it's not, there is no one truth. Um, uh, for example, you might have one experience that shows the state of the world. Uh, hey, you've got tickets for sale still for this event on your website, but your mobile application, when you look at it, says, nope, sold out. Uh, it's because they're, each of the different channels are calling different services who have different cash expiries, and neither one of them actually is telling the truth. Uh, about the system, it's actually a third state that's somewhere behind all those layers of caching. Uh, and if you do it properly, if you if you screw this up really right, and I've never, I've never actually seen it done, but you can create a state where the system never goes back to the original source. It's just one service calling another service that still has a cache record from before, calling another service that is pulling in that cache record, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you can avoid actually ever taxing your databases. It really runs fast. Uh, but it doesn't actually accomplish anything. Uh, and, and by the way, every time you screw something up, now you invalidate all those caches, all your systems, that's your repair process, right? You invalidate the caches, everything works great again, except nothing performs now. And so now you're offline because you can't handle all the traffic you get at your doorstep. So the other enemy we have is inscrutable state. If you can distribute your uh, state in your system across enough microservices, you can make it impossible to know what is actually going on in your system at any point in time. You'll go and look in one place and you'll find one record and then you'll have to call out to another service to find the other piece of that record and then you have to call out to yet another service to find another piece of the record and finally now you've figured out that, oh, it's Chris Smith and I know his age and I know his address, but by the way, we've already changed the address on Chris Smith and it's totally different value somewhere else in the system. Um, so this is incredibly frustrating for people who are trying to diagnose what's going on in the system uh, and it also really makes innovation very difficult because you spend most of your time trying to figure out how to access all the different components uh, in the system in order to make anything happen. And then we have state wars. Uh, this, this is the best part. Uh, if you can get multi-master replication going and you don't know what you're doing, you can easily create circumstances where multiple masters all disagree about what the truth is. So I, my name might be Chris Smith, it might be Christopher Smith, I might have you know, a two at the end of the email address, just kidding, just not really trying to make a joke with that, but it's true, um, or I might not. And some poor guy in Chicago might get all my emails because that's what the system thinks is actually my email address. Um, this can get very difficult when you're doing transactional work and you want to ensure that you have properly recorded transactions everywhere. If the system thinks two different people actually bought the product, it's not gonna go well for you. And they are cascading fa failures. This is actually my personal favorite, this one. This is, if you build your systems correctly, you can make it so that the smallest, most minute failure can take out the whole system. And then, and then you can go home and rest, right? Everybody can, uh, no, instead you're up all night, you're missing meals. Literally, this is, or how I learned to lose weight during business disruptions. Because <laughs> you can't do anything else but try to fix the system. No, you, we, you have a really nasty problem in a distributed system. Uh, people always think of, well, distributed systems are much more reliable, uh, and that's true if you design them correctly. But let's face it, if you have one computer, then the only thing that can go wrong is that one computer crashing. If you have thousands of computers, then you have a thousand different possible failure points 
Uh, just on like strictly from an electrical problem, let's let's not forget all of the network protocol problems you could have, you know, all of the problems in coding logic and inconsistencies in state between the different systems. But just from trying to get power to keep those machines on, you have a thousand more ways to fail. Okay, um, so that's that's the other one that uh, is terrible. Uh, and yes, the the question of trying to figure out why things are slow. So you know that a particular service is responding slowly, but you have no idea why. It looks like everything it's calling is taking an inordinate amount of time, but you don't know where that's coming from. You start chasing it down, those things are calling another thing, those things are calling another thing. It's spread across your entire network, and when you trace it all down to the bottom, it turns out that all of those different services you're talking to were all calling out to other services, which were in turn calling to this one poor service that got smacked with a thousand requests just to answer your one question, right? And don't worry, we can solve this. We'll just put caching in front of it, right? Then we're back to, oh shoot, problem one all over again. And this is the insanity that, that goes on in your head as you're getting your system increasingly more and more complicated. So we, we were experiencing pretty significant reality of this uh, at a pretty uh, extreme level to the point where we sort of said, wait, we need to take a step back and reflect on how we're gonna get out of here. And part of uh, that thought process was a reality, a reflection of reality that it's not enough to have a target for where you wanna get to and how you want everything to be perfect in your utopic distributed computing environment, but you need to have a plan for rolling it out and a process for rolling it out that is practical, that gets your results reasonably quickly and that can be employed incrementally because obviously we're not gonna change the software in 15,000 virtual servers overnight, right? This will be a journey that uh, we don't expect to finish for years. So um, I'm gonna talk about the various uh, pieces that we thought would be very key without requiring a rewrite of all these systems and, and I'm gonna present them in the order that we thought would make the most sense for rolling out and we've been moving through this process uh, slowly but surely uh, over the last uh, year and a half. So the first one is distributed tracing. How many here, people here know what distributed tracing is or think they know? All right, I should definitely clarify then for everyone else so I don't lose y'all. So you can think of distributed tracing as a smart form of uh, logging uh, in some sense or a smart form of performance um, uh, metrics. The key problem that you have if you do logging with distributed systems is you get logs that are going uh, into a file somewhere from all these different systems. And yes, it's very clear what's happening in each individual system, but you can't tell what happened when a customer clicked on a button because th that generated logs in like 20 different machines and you don't know how to correlate them all together. What distributed tracing uh, does is it provides a framework to tag uh, that information about what's going on in your system with a context that is tied to that initial button click so that each um, step of the way, there's a new context created that's tied back to that original context and the system can trace the movement uh, and the execution of the code across all the distributed components in the system and pull it together for you so you can see everything that happened because of that one click. And the, nice, the other nice part about it is you get uh, timings of all the different steps in between so you can see that, oh my goodness, we're losing like 50 milliseconds here and we were expecting to lose one millisecond because all we were doing was talking to another process. Um, there, this uh, idea and this approach was popularized by um, uh, Google putting out a white paper called, I think it was Dapper was the, the white paper it was about, um, but has increasingly become so popular in the industry that there is now an open standard for it called uh, open tracing. Uh, and that's what we've uh, standardized on internally as our, our go forward way to do tracing. Um, and the nice part about it is you can plug in lots of different systems into it. We're currently using uh, Jaeger, which was uh, out of the folks at Uber, uh, which does a great job of uh, letting you query and introspect all the interactions between all your services. But there's also a number of commercial providers out there. Uh, some of them are actually in the vendor pavilion. If you go talk to them and they, they're talking to you about solutions for tracing, now you'll know what it's about. Um, but the idea of this is that it gives us an ability to have the insight that we used to have when you were dealing with a non-distributed system with a single computer and you were stepping through things with a debugger or looking at log lines in a log file and you could see the entire flow through the system easily. 
This allows you to still have that even though the systems are distributed. It also provides you with very good guidelines for when it comes time to refactor because one of the most cha depressing challenges in a complex distributed system is when you want to replace one component, you obviously need to make sure that none of your dependency, none of the people who depend on you are going to be impacted by how you change it. Well, that raises the first uh, painful and obvious question, who all is using it? And there's, there's the list of people that you intended to use you, and you always have that in your mind. You know the services that should be using you, but in a more complex environment with lots of teams trying to execute very quickly, the reality is if there's three people that you know that are supposed to be using you, there's 10 other people who figured out that it was really useful to take advantage of the service you were using, and you're going to break them without them even being notified. And that's, that creates a very difficult environment where nobody can trust anybody to provide services. So once you have tracing, though, you can query the tracing engine. You can literally see, here's everybody who talked to your system over the last month, right? So that's step one. Uh, and this is actually relatively easy to deploy because a number of uh, web frameworks and application server frameworks actually already have uh, built-in modules and middleware that will hook you into distributed tracing systems. So you can actually like plug this into your Apache server or into your Spring uh, uh, environment and you instantly get at least telemetry for everything going in and out of the framework. So that's good, that's a nice start. Uh, step two, uh, generic uh, query dispatch, doing composable queries. So one of the things that naturally comes out of distributed systems is you end up building lots of APIs so that the different components in the system can talk to each other in clean and, and established ways. And you want that abstraction so that you can then drop in a new version of the service without disrupting all the people who are calling you. You just have this contract that you know you have to fulfill, and if you fulfill it, everybody's happy. The only problem is most of these APIs end up being technical debt. They're not that APIs are a bad thing, they're actually a great thing, but the important thing to realize is every time you are building out an API, you're actually making it more difficult and, uh, for your organization to be agile, to make changes, because APIs have intrinsic assumptions about them, about how you're doing business each day. And that's great if that assumption turns out to be true. It actually is fantastic if it turns out to be true. And that's why we build APIs, to make things simpler for those cases of things that we know we're going to do every single day. But what you tend to see happen in organizations is APIs actually get built most for when you're building something new. And you know what? When you're building something new, you still don't know how it's really going to work with your business. Whatever you thought was a good idea when you first did it, six months later is now tech debt because you need to change how it's going to work. Um, so, simple solution. Don't have APIs. Just have a data model, right? And use a generic query engine to navigate that data model. Uh, we kind of uh, selected GraphQL for doing it on the front end side for all the front end clients. And it's great because we can, all you have to do is know how to navigate the data model and you can effectively make up your own uh, queries whenever you want your own APIs for your use case and it's very optimized for your particular use case. There's a smart query engine that someone spent a lot of time in trying to figure out the most optimal way to pull the data from these services for your particular use case which is a lot better than trying to handcraft an API especially if you've got lots of different potential customers are trying to guess all their different use cases and build a flexible enough API for it. By the way We've done this. We actually have internally a number of APIs that we've built that are very flexible, that do serve a very broad set of consumers. And you know what they all look like? Query languages. They look like SQL. They look like GraphQL. They're already there. We just built our own handcrafted version. So it's much easier to use something off the shelf, and then you, and then you don't slow yourself down. Similarly, on the back end, we've been uh, working towards using uh, Kafka Streams and Stream Sets, and more recently, KSQL. Um, provide a standard querying layer uh, for any, th any data that's moving in flight uh, through streams, uh, which we'll get to more of in a, in a little bit. Uh, so the one catch with all this is that in a true distributed system, um, you know, you're going to have schema changes. And for a query language to make any sense of whatever is going on, you're going to need a consistent schema. Uh, so you also need to deal with the challenge of schema versioning. When someone changes their part of the data model, you don't want to disrupt everybody else in the system. Uh, so we've uh, employed a few different technologies in order to help us with that. 
Uh, probably the most obvious one is uh, the schema registry for that Kafka has and, and uh, Avro, the serialization framework, that sort of automatically handles changes in schema versioning. Uh, we also have picked uh, a number of database tools and technologies that are very comfortable with the notion of a schema evolving in a distributed fashion, because that, that's the tough part, right? Schema doesn't change instantly. You roll it out in one place, and then it slowly percolates through the system, and you have to handle all that transition without breaking anything. Um, and then the, uh, the other catch about this as well, you know, that's nice to have like a generic query engine that I'm querying data, but like that may not always perform well. The data may not be uh, organized and set up in a way that will be efficient for my particular use case, especially if I'm doing something totally new that no one anticipated before, which is the goal here, right, to make everything as agile as possible. Uh, and the way that we address that is uh, because uh, what we'll do is we'll rematerialize the data for a particular app to get its performance. So we might have um, customers organized by, I don't know, something crazy like uh, last name, right? But now we've got people logging in with an email address. We need to do a lookup on that. But we'll just create another materialized view of all of our customers that is indexed on the email address so that we have very efficient lookup for that case. That's a toy example, obviously, but you can imagine the more complicated use cases. Um, so next piece, composable functions. Oh, this is so important and, and, and so counterintuitive for a lot of people, especially if they're working, in, uh, working with microservices a lot in distributed computing. Um, the most reusable piece of code you can have is a simple composable function. That's more useful than a microservice. That's more useful than a RESTful endpoint that uh, answers a query. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best way to package up your business logic. It's better than a framework for, for executing on your business logic. And the simple reason is this. It's the smallest piece of work. It's the least amount of work, right? You have left all, a lot of other decisions for someone else to work with. Um, and to give you an example of how this can go uh, sideways, um, Let's say that you um, have an e-commerce site like, like we do and you want to be able to compute taxes for when someone uh, is about to um, buy, buy your product. You could have a function for that that you could plug in anywhere you want in your system that computes taxes, right? It has all the logic for it and you just, it's a library, you link it into your code, you execute it. Or you could have a microservice, because that would be you know, the typical way to do it. Have a microservice out there that's deployed, that you query it, you tell it, here's what I got, tell me what the taxes are. But if you were to design it the way things tend to work, you might go, hey, there might be a lot of stuff that I'm asking you to calculate the taxes on, and that'd be a lot to send in the request. So why don't I just give you a reference to the shopping cart? And then you'll go to the shopping cart and at query it for what it has in it, its contents, and then you'll calculate the tax, and then you'll hand that back to the system. Um, now you've got this interesting game going on that makes perfect sense in the one use case of someone checking out, right? You put stuff in a ch shopping cart, you then calculate the taxes for it, you show that on the page, you move on. That's great. What if the, the opposite is true, though? What if you're like trying to take um, all of the products that you have and all of the people who are looking for, uh, potentially might be looking for uh, your buy your products because you're doing a marketing campaign and you're thinking that everybody in the system is going to be very price sensitive so you want to figure out in advance how much you're going to charge them for any particular ticket well now you need to build a shopping cart for every person for every product that you have that's probably going to a database somewhere because you don't want to lose sh the state of your shopping cart in the middle of a checkout flow and then you're going to send out a million queries out to this one poor little RESTful service that's probably running on one machine because it doesn't have to do much work, and it's going to have to answer these million queries as fast as it possibly can so that your system can now make a decision about who do I send the next email to, right? So if instead that function was pulled out of a microservice and just a library that you could link to, you could ask that question as you're scanning through the data in your in doing your marketing campaign, trying to build up your marketing campaign. Um, so yeah, th this is a weird idea. If you just make your function uh, uh, as a library and make it available to everybody, you actually get something more useful. I do want to emphasize, though, the importance of composable. The composable function, basically the golden rule of a composable function is that for the same inputs, it will always produce the same outputs. That means you can't be a function that goes out and checks for the database somewhere 
It can't be something that uh, has an internal counter in it that, that does some kind of odd thing. You need to reorganize your code so that your business logic is always represented in an input, therefore this output kind of state. And of course, that makes a lot of sense, right? In a distributed computing environment, the toughest problem is managing state, right? And if you can separate that logic from your business logic, you get so much more flexibility. Now your business logic can change without having to figure out how to move data around. Let that problem be solved separately for the particular use case involved. Ah, yes, bulkheads and circuit breakers. Um, so we were talking about frailty before, right? The most obvious thing to do in a distributed system to ensure that everything goes down is assume that nothing will and write your code accordingly, right? But you know, reality is, hey, might lose, uh, might lose a connection to our database. Okay, well we could solve that by reconnecting uh, as fast as we possibly can to the database. That'd probably go well, right? And that'll work out great until the reason why you lost the connection to the database is the database is being overwhelmed by people trying to connect to it. So you get into a pretty nasty mess. So instead you want to have something that's more practical and you want to think through the process of what actually should I do when I have a failure in the system? Should I rate limit how much I'm trying to connect to the database and just accept the fact that everything is going to slow down? Should I continue to function without that particular system, right? Maybe there's a way that you can operate, like um, a classic example is you might have a, a, a commerce site that is doing recommendations for additional products that someone might want to buy. When that system goes down, when the recommendation system goes down, that's no reason not to render the page that shows someone what they already bought. It just means you can't make recommendations for additional things for them to buy. The odds are they're gonna wanna buy the thing that they already got in their shopping cart. Why would you take out that whole system and not let them buy just because you can't make good recommendations for additional products for them, right? So you need to plan your product around the possibility that these various services might go off do and, and have strategies for recovering when they do come back online. That's the other one that's always important is the, oh, that reconnect problem is really bad. I, I solved it. I won't reconnect. Well, now if there's even a slight network glitch for a moment, your system goes offline until someone reboots it because it won't try to reconnect to the database ever. Um, there's some really great frameworks in this space. Uh, one of my favorite ones is called Resilience for J uh, that lets you sort of declaratively talk about how you speak to each of your endpoints and what the strategy is that you want to employ to deal with failure. Um, and that's really the best way uh, to tackle it because writing the code yourself means you'll tend to introduce a lot of bugs. Uh, it's much simpler to just declaratively say, hey, I want to have a retry mechanism. Uh, by the way, I know it needs exponential back off. Uh, and, by, and by the way, I should never be hitting it harder than like, you know, 10,000 requests a second because that'll definitely kill it. It won't be ready for that. Um, and so you can just declare that and it will manage that process for you in a way that doesn't create new bugs. Uh, the name of the uh, library was called Resilience for J. So there's a bunch of other libraries uh, like that for and for a wide variety of languages. The thing I like about Resilience for J is it tends to be pretty lightweight. Uh, a lot of Java frameworks have a tendency to get very heavy. Resilience for J is pretty lightweight and focuses on just trying to give you resilience and giving you a way to employ different strategies for tackling it. And then here's, th here's the one that actually in a lot of ways I'd like to move to the front of the line, but from a practical standpoint, I knew I had to roll out after some of these other things were happening and delivering some important wins for us. Uh, and this is my favorite topic because a lot of my work is in data science and it's stream all the things. And, and it literally means exactly what I'm talking about. Every time there is a mutation of any kind in your system, you want to publish that data out into a stream. We've been using Kafka as the tool for getting that done. Um, and the rationale here, and, and, and the, co the parts of Kafka that are really important for this is that it's a pub-sub model, uh, which means that the consumers of the data are completely disconnected from the publishers of the data. That means you're publishing data but nothing that the downstream consumers do can break you. In fact, it's not even connected to you. So even if someone does something stupid and deploys like 10 million new servers that all try to consume the data that you're publishing, that might cause some stress for Kafka, although it's very resilient to that case, 
but your system that's publishing the information they're getting to sees no additional load. You push the data out once, doesn't matter if nobody's listening to it or everybody's listening to it, it's the same workload for you. Your system doesn't get stressed out when other people make changes. Um, but, the, but the key thing is, and this is really uh, the opposite of a lot of the design precepts that are uh, commonly found in microservices where the, the idea was every s microservice should have its own database, its own data store, and that should be isolated and no one else should be able to access that data store. You always have to go through the microservice. And in principle, there's a lot of good reasons for doing that. But the downside is you start breaking up your data into little tiny pieces spread throughout your system and there's no way to consolidate it all and get an understanding of what the heck's going on, right? But if you publish the data out so it's available for other people, now you have a lot more flexibility in your system. If I tomorrow want to combine the information from three different uh, systems to make something new that no one anticipated before, it's very easy to just connect to the three different streams that those systems are producing, join together the information, and then execute on it, okay? Instead of having to call out to these different services, possibly through interfaces that never anticipated how I wanted to use the data, uh, and, and, and make sense of it all without knocking any of them over. Um, so you can see another common thing here is we're, we're, we're moving the data away from the business logic, we're moving the state away from the business logic, and so you can decouple those two problems, the distributed system and your business logic. And finally, and this is the hardest one uh, that uh, we've only started uh, touching on uh, just a little bit, um, is, it, is anyone familiar with uh, the Call Me Maybe uh, website uh, uh, for distributed computing? Uh, yeah, that's some great, great blog posts. If you're interested in distributed computing a lot, I highly recommend uh, reading the, those blog posts. Um, but yeah, there's, there's this um, need. We have these composable functions now, right? So we can connect them all together and rearrange business logic and do whatever we want. But we also need our data structures to be composable so that we no longer have to worry about what happens when there is, uh, you know, some server wakes up that went to sleep or went offline or crashed and it's got a bunch of transactions that it had processed like three days ago that finally get pushed back into the main system. And, you know, if you've done, if you've got a transaction processing system, I'm sure your transaction records will still have full integrity and you'll know that there were 10 new records or 10 new purchases that happened three days ago, you'll get that right. But you don't want your metrics on your data warehouse to suddenly show that you got 10 new sales three days later or to suddenly uh, freak out about the numbers that it had from three days ago. You want everything to, to just uh, arrive at the consistency that it should have been in the first place, uh, even though the data arrived out of order uh, or potentially even in reversed order. Um, so this is where this notion of conflict-free replicated uh, data types uh, come from. And, th and the win with them and the conflict-free part is very important. It means that you can have multiple copies of your data throughout your system without having uh, inconsistencies in what the truth is. It's always possible to figure out what the truth should be. It just depends on whether you've got all the data or not, what truth you see. But there is always a true, an accurate truth at any given point in time. Um, and these are, uh, th there's a whole bunch of different strategies for this. So this is actually from uh, that Jepson.io is the site where, where this information about CRDTs is up. This is a diagram from there that sort of talks about the taxonomy of different approaches to achieving CRDTs depending on uh, what outcomes you're looking for for your particular system. And believe me, you got a lot of choices here because you're trying to achieve consistency which means you have to have different levels of flexibility. But probably the simplest model for CRDT to think about is one that's actually commonly deployed in, in a couple of eventual consistency databases, which is simple rule of last writer wins, right? So whoever has the newest timestamp, that's always the truth uh, or the last thing that happened. But it's important to think about what that means in a, um, in a more sophisticated kind of context where if I have a record that shows up with an older timestamp that is actually just updating two fields, right, and the most recent update was updating two fields as well, but they're two different fields, I should be able to combine those two operations, right? And it's a very easy way to solve it, which is you look at the timestamps on each individual field for each time they get updated, and you just say the most recent one always wins. And then it creates this interesting uh, uh, 
context where when you look at it, it actually looks like all of your rights were atomic. They either happened or they didn't in every context. In reality, under the covers, they didn't. It was just all comparing timestamps, and everything just happened to work out beautifully. Um, but this ensures that you can avoid um, having a completely um, uh, disparate system when you're dealing with that multi-master replication problem that I was talking about. There's always a way to resolve those multiple masters. You don't need a lock anywhere. You don't need some arbiter about the truth. You've got a set of rules in place that ensure that your systems never go down. And at the same time, because you don't have a master anymore, if there's a break in the network or someone destroys an entire data center because, I don't know, what was the thing that happened to Delta? They were testing UPS, took out a whole data center. Um, that's, that's not a problem for you. You lose that data center for the moment. All your other data centers know how to function with the data that they have. And when the data from that data center comes back online, whatever you can recover, uh, it just magically blends into your reality without you having to write special case logic for handling that scenario. And that's, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've built a lot of systems with a like, single master where I have to deal with about 20 different failure cases and writing all of those branches in code and testing them and making sure that they all work correctly is way, way harder than just having a simple eventual consistency model that ensures there's no conflict and that I get to a truth at the end of the tunnel. Down, down with Mongo, he says, yeah. Up with Cassandra, <laughs> right? Up with React, down with Mongo. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Mongo's the framework that teaches you the importance of CRDTs. Uh, so so the, the fun part about that, though, actually, is, is realistically, if you build your own CRDTs, right, you can actually use systems like Mongo and not have a problem when there is a failure because you've got eventual consistency in your own data models. The only problem is you had to do a little bit of the work to do that. It's nice to use a framework that has that built in, but you can realistically, you can use this stuff with like an Oracle database and it will make handling replication lag so much easier, okay? So there you go, that's the last and the hardest one. Um, and, and all I can say now is like, you know, safe driving. Uh, enjoy the distributed computing road. You've now got a system that will be resilient to failure, that you can make changes and understand the consequences of them before you roll them out and measure them after they're rolled out. You can uh, make decisions about uh, how you want to reorganize your business without being frustrated by the existing structures that are limiting uh, how you wanna, wanna go about your business and you're into uh, a free and open distributed world. So that's my talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. But thank you very much. I think the dog had a question, but we're gonna skip over him. But you had a question over there? Yeah, J-E-P-S-E-N dot I-O, I believe. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, uh, you know, this seemed like a pretty carefully thought out process for rolling it out, uh, rolling out these kinds of changes in an existing environment. But if you were building out a new environment, would you do, would you roll things out in this order? Is that, was that, did I get that right? Yeah. So um, no, actually, yeah, I would do it differently if it was a completely from fresh environment. Uh, I would actually approach it differently. Um, so I. I I would, I would definitely, st first of all, you would try to start with all these things, honestly. Like if you're doing it from scratch, it's a lot easier to just do all the right things. Um, so I, I would say that distributed tracing, if I knew I was building a distributed system from the get-go, I would make sure that's there before I even start doing any work because it just makes all the work after that possible. Actually, I, I'm not even gonna say easier, I'm gonna say possible because it, it's, it's that bad when you don't have it. Um, the other thing that I would uh, be tempted to do is the streaming part, okay, right from the get-go. Uh, it can seem unnecessary when you build the first component, 
but as soon as you have a separate component that's in a different, uh, you know, in a different distributed context, um, things start to magically become easier when you work on a streaming model. And there's other benefits that come from the streaming model as well. Um, it allows you to um, pre-compute things in advance so that at the time of request, you do the least amount of work to resolve the request, um, which allows you to s handle scale a lot better. So there's other side benefits that come from it that make me want to make sure that I'm doing that earlier on in the process. Um, and then, and then, although bulkheads and circuit breakers are super important and a really, really good idea, the funny part is you can actually get to those later because when you're first building your first set of components, you don't have enough components. That egregious failure in, in one component is going to take down a whole system. It's it's going to be terrible, but it's not going to be the worst thing, right? Your failure rate's not going to be high, but once you start having, you know, 10 or 20 components now, your SLAs, even if each component has a 99% SLA, you start doing the math on that, and it's like, now your uptime is like 89%, right? And that's not good. Um, so you can wait on those until a little bit later, and that might help you get out the door a little bit faster. Um, and then the, um, and certainly uh, CRDTs, I would try very hard to put those in right from the get-go. They are so much, they're, so they're hard to get uh, your head around if you've never worked with them before. It takes a little bit of time. It helps to have frameworks and libraries that do it for you. But if you can put that in from the get-go, it reframes how you think about architecting your data model and your systems uh, in a pretty significant way. Um, and so it's good if you can do that at the get-go instead of having to like sort of refactor all of that infrastructure at a later point. Does that answer your question? Yes? Yep. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the question was, you know, are there cases where GraphQL, um, what, what are the cases where GraphQL makes sense? Does it make sense in the back end? Um, and, and also, if, if I heard you correctly, like um, a lot of APIs seem like they make pretty, pretty decent sense by themselves and they're really independent and you don't see the benefit of gluing them all together through like GraphQL or a query engine. Um, so first of all, I, I don't highly recommend it uh, for back end, a lot of back end stuff. It's possible to do and it works. Um, but there is uh, a lot of overhead in translating everything into JSON and going through all the resolvers um, that you might, might not be ideal. A lot of back end systems, it's really important to be extremely efficient uh, and that can be problematic. Uh, and also a lot of the goodies that are in GraphQL are really designed to help you uh, when you're going over a WAN as opposed to uh, a, a normal traditional back-end environment where it's a LAN, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's for everything. On the other hand, when you're building all those APIs that are doing different things, you tend to find that a whole bunch of them are like CRUD operations. And and guess what? You know, if you just build a data model and use, use something like GraphQL, and really it's not about GraphQL specifically, it's about the idea of using a generic uh, uh, query engine, uh, you suddenly find that you're not uh, having to build a whole bunch of APIs that are really just boilerplate. They're really not adding any value, but they are creating risk, right? They're all ways that you can screw things up and also ways that you can make it more difficult to change how you do things. So um, classic example is you might build a retrieve service that returns back this nice big object, right? That has all the information about, I don't know, some order that was put through your system, right? Um, but there might be a use case where all you really want is to get the total amount of money spent from all the orders in the system. And if you use that API to get that information back, now you're pulling back a huge amount of data, creating a huge amount of load uh, on both systems just to get what should be a very simple query answer. And, and by the way, SQL is seriously a legitimate solution for that. There are SQL engines that can translate onto data models in multiple different systems. And you just query that way. We chose GraphQL in particular because um, it fit well with our strategy with React on a lot of our front end uh, pieces and it was very, it was very beautiful in that use case. In that use case, I would really go strongly for that instead of 
Yeah, it's really great for that. And and the nice the other nice thing about GraphQL is it's not purely a query based model. It also has subscriptions in it, so you can do the push based model. So it can fit in well with that streaming part of the equation, where you can say, okay. Now I want to know the moment that a new product comes out in the marketplace that I know to do a whole bunch of things in reaction to that. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's why we're not using it all in the back end. We have things like KSQL uh, and, and, and stream sets and a few other tools that allows us, allows us to generically work through the data. You had a question back there. So the question is, how do you uh, approach the uh, question of uh, functional testing uh, in a complex environment where you've got all these different pieces uh, moving together? Um, so the short answer on that is very carefully. <laughs> um, no, so, so uh, if you take that uh, approach of composable functions, it actually helps a lot because you can test composable functions very easily independently and also in aggregate together, because that, that's the whole point. They can be composed together, and so you can test what happens when you put them all together in a chain. That works very nicely. Where it gets complicated is composable functions, the whole thing is you don't have the state piece of the picture involved, right? And in reality, in all these systems, there is state that needs to be managed, and that makes testing more difficult, right? Um, so uh, the most important thing is to have a good framework for generating uh, state, actually, in the system. Uh, consistently. I'm a big fan of uh, essentially using a declarative model to populate your uh, system. So you'll say something like, I want to create 10 orders that look like this with three different uh, uh, users attached to them, and I want special case where one of those orders we detected fraud, right? Um, and then have a uh, test framework generate essentially random data that is in compliance with that declarative statement, but otherwise completely unpredictable and, and exercising all the corner cases uh, that could exist in your data. You shove that into the system, and then you look to see, when I create the system now, does it reflect the state I would expect it to be in? When all of those things have just happened. Um, and it's really important to build a robust integration testing framework that works in that fashion, instead of the more traditional model of individual uh, imperative uh, integration tests that are like just one particular functional piece uh, of the system. They just don't catch enough of the problems. Does that make sense? Do I do it by person by person basis? Is that what you said? Right. What happens when one service depends on 10 others? So uh, in an ideal world, and if you're doing it the right way, those 10 other services should be uh, able to be spun up with basically a s you know a single button push right in a test environment, um, and so the right model is actually yes when you are building your tests it should spin up those ten different services that you're talking to in your test environment and run the tests against the real services not some mock on them because most of your integration challenges come from making bad assumptions about how those ten services behave and getting a surprising outcome in the real world. Um, and so you want to test against how those systems actually behave, uh, and then you shut them down after the tests have run, right? So that's the real, ide that's the ideal world. Uh, we don't live in that ideal world. <laughs> uh, and so what we end up doing is we have uh, QA environments and pre-prod environments where we have uh, some guarantees about the uh, approximateness of those environments to production reality. Uh, and those services are available for anyone to do testing against at any time. Um, I will say that we do have challenges sometimes with multiple people independently wanting to run tests uh, and, and plot, pull out different pieces, and that's where it's so much better if you can just spin them up on an as-needed basis for your dependencies. Make sense? Yeah. Sorry, there was a question over here. Yes. Yes, schema versioning. Yes. Um, so there's a couple of other, th uh, so the question was what else do we use to manage schema versioning and, and the evolution of schemas? Um, so it's a good question. We're actually in the process of reviewing the tooling that we use for that and enhancing it. Um, we've been using um, a couple of in-house uh, tools along with some open source solutions to get us uh, to a good place there. We're using a product called uh, CKAN, C -K -A -N, um, that 
uh, is a sort of data dictionary of sorts that provides um, us with insight about all the schemas that are uh, deployed in our environment, although we're still getting all of them integrated into it, so not all of them, but in principle, uh, a bunch of them. Um, and the idea is when a deploy happens, it actually, uh, part of the deploy process is to publish a message to a co special Kafka topic that tells the data dictionary, here's the new version of the schema, and push that uh, into a central registry where we can capture not just the fact that there's a new version, but that there was a transition and what the previous version was. And you can go back through that history uh, and manage it. Um, there's a couple uh, of other tricks that we uh, try to employ um, on, the, on the data science side, like uh, representing everything as a feature vector um, so that we're sort of new fields just show up and it's not a problem. Uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of sophisticated tools out there in the marketplace that do about half of the problem and the challenge is cobbling them all together to make something that makes sense uh, in aggregate. And I haven't seen a lot of good products that actually handle all of it all at once. So you do have to invest a bit of time and effort into it. Um, so case ex in point, uh, Cassandra, which we're, we're using in a couple of cases, it actually handles schema versioning very well in distributed context. You can make a, a version change online. It ripples through all the clusters, all the data centers that you have um, Cassandra deployed in a very reasonable fashion that doesn't break anything during the transition in between. That's great, you've solved the problem for Cassandra, but that's absolutely no help for anybody who was using some kind of tool to, that was expecting a specific data structure in Cassandra at any particular point. Uh, and, and say it was like pulling out all the records from a table and putting them into a spreadsheet somewhere, right? It, the, the tool's gonna be like, wait, uh, you've now got another column that I didn't even know existed a few moments ago and could quite well break if it wasn't built to handle the reality of schema versioning. Um, but the biggest trick is tack on a schema version on every payload that you have moving around um, because at least that gives you the possibility later on of figuring out that there's a different version and how to resolve it. And that's basically what the schema registry does, right? It just tags everything with a schema version and then keeps a history of all the possible permutations. Yes, another question there. smiling at me there at the back. Um, so uh, we've gone through a number of different iterations on this, uh, been around for 40 years, and we've, we've there's a tendency in organizations to try to impose governance and then recognize once you impose too much governance that you're creating too much friction and that no one can move forward very efficiently. So then you compensate and you go the other way, and now you have a, a jungle of different technologies out there that you gotta untangle. And then you compensate for that by going back to the crazy levels of governance and so forth and so forth. So we've been through a few iterations of that. I would say right now we're probably closer to the jungle than we are to the tight uh, governance uh, model. Um, but we are taking an approach now that's fairly pragmatic of sort of recommending and guiding uh, engineering teams as they go to uh, solve a particular problem and encouraging them to sort of consult with uh, set centers of excellence uh, that, that can guide them on, on making the right decisions uh, in the right places. And one of the key things that we've been trying to do is ensure that there's someone who's, the title that, that we use as an architect, involved in that conversation because um, there can be this dangerous tendency to think that you know what kind of problem you have go to the expert at solving that kind of problem, and then they solve it that kind of way, and it's actually the wrong problem. It's the, the old joke about like, you know, don't go to a surgeon for asking for treatment about something you have unless you already know it requires surgery to handle it, because the surgeon will always tell you, you need surgery for this, right? Um, so uh, actually, I've seen this problem in a lot of uh, different companies with uh, DBA teams. DBA teams are always the experts about databases and data. Um, People, uh, developers love them because they can go to them with almost any problem and if it involves data, magically it gets solved for them. 
the problem is, is that not all data problems in distributed environment are database problems. Some of them are distributed computing problems. And if you go to a database team to address a distributed computing problem, you actually end up with a solution that doesn't really work because you haven't addressed the real problem. The database will work great, but the actual application will not. Um, and so that's where we try to have these uh, architecture experts who can help guide you, maybe not to how to solve the problem, but what kind of problem you have and who would be the expert to talk to to actually figure out how to solve that particular problem. Does that make sense? Any other questions? I think we're done. All right, cool. Thank you all very much. Come back for the next talk. We've got uh, the next talk's on uh, Zero MQ, and we've got gra a GraphQL talk later if you want to get a little bit more feedback on that. Um, thank you very much.
on. Okay, there we go. We have power. Awesome. And there are no real controls. <laughs> Welcome. You can be my guinea pig while I make sure everything works. Uh, is it too loud? When I, when I got it turned on, I suddenly go, whoa, the voice of God is coming down. <laughs> All right, good. It'll probably quiet down a little bit when there are people in here, but I would hate to, bl to blow people out, especially if I, you know, get excited and talking louder. All right, so that means we're basically ready to go. Yeah, there we go. So, if you're inclined to play the home game, you've got tons, actually have more time than anybody else, but uh, it's entirely up to you. It should be self-contained without it, so. And... Yes. Okay, we have it. Excellent. Is my pointer visible? Maybe. Sort of. Is that visible to you if I use that? Okay. All right. Well, then maybe I will. I think I'm ready to go. actually work. Oh, I know. Uh, it looks to be working well. In fact, I now have the voice of God. This thing is kind of loud. I, I think it'll be all right once people get in here, but I turn out and I was like. <laughs> so it looks like all is well, though. Okay, great. Thank you. could do that if I wanted to. Nice. Voice of God. No. Nope. 
What's that? Well, they might have to work at it. It's you notice I'm gonna actually do it in there, or at least I'll take it off at the last minute. It doesn't. It's not great to give a presentation in a coat, but man, <laughs> the speaker's room is at least this cold. And here I was hacking all morning, polishing things, and man, yeah, I needed hot chocolate.
Welcome to the North Pole. <laughs> I feel compelled to not give a talk in a jacket, but the rest of you should probably find your parkas because it's quite. Uh, I guess the machine. I guess the heart. The electronics will run cool, but. So I appreciate if you make it through the entire talk. I will appreciate your amazing dedication, or you'll have frozen to the chair. I don't know which. <laughs> Yeah, I think it would be good to, to take the edge off that. <clears throat> if it's any consolation, I spent all morning polishing thing in the speaker's room, which is easily as cold. So we, we have the speakers on ice today. <laughs> um, if you didn't notice, there is a home game. If you want to play along the slides that I'll be giving, because I just pushed. So I promise they're actually up to date. Uh, and the example code is uh, in the repo there. And, uh, and for bonus points in the home game, uh, tell me what my uh, t-shirt is actually about. <laughs> There's a puzzle. <laughs> but afterwards, because I'm going to try to try to stay on time. I think we have about two minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Although, if we get much lower, they'll freeze to their chairs and can't leave in the middle, even if they're bored. And I mean, you know, it's win-win, it's right, <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, but I have to give a more animated talk so I stay functional. All right, well, it looks like basically it's time to start. Um, the, uh, there is a home game. If you just came in, there's a URL there. If you feel like uh, 
uh, cloning the repo and playing along, uh, feel free. The slides are there too. People, I, I, it took me a while to realize that the best thing to do with the slides is to stick them in the repo so that you can pull them rather than me pushing them. So, um, all right, let me start my timer here. Okay, so we're going to talk about zero MQ. Basically, what we're going to do is we're just going to connect all the things, okay? Uh, so, first of all, the name is rather confusing. Um, it seems like it really should be a message, sir, a message queue or something, because after all, the name is just like RabbitMQ. Clearly, it must be related. Yeah, it's not really. I mean, I suppose you could use it to write such a thing, but it's not in any way a server, um, nor is it even a centralized message broker, even though iMatix is also, you know, heavily, uh, uh, or was heavily involved with AMQP. And it's not actually for existing protocols. So you don't use 0MQ to, say, write your uh, HTTP server. Um, you can bridge messages, but that's not really, I mean, that's not what it's designed to do. Okay, so what is it? Now, um, for those of you that are young enough that you grew up with social media, uh, I have tried to distill the description down quickly enough to match the modern attention span. There we go. <laughs> now, for the rest of us. <laughs> um, there are a number of, uh, of definitions floating around. Um, a reusable messaging layer is actually uh, pretty concise. Um, it is asynchronous, unless you choose for it not to be. Um, and it can look like a concurrency framework. That's kind of a tall order for, a, for something that's not totally specialized. I'll play with that for a minute. Um, now, the documentation, part of the reason for this talk, uh, or at least what kind of informs my thinking, is there's a guide. That seems to be the Bible. The guide is a pretty good tutorial. It's very thorough. It's a terrible reference, okay, because it's written as a tutorial, and the author writes in a very friendly style, and so you can't find them when you're looking. You find them as you get to them. Um, also, the uh, example code is pretty uh, variable. I honestly kind of despise the C++ the way they wrote it, but um, what I want to do then, I want to basically illustrate just how flexible and, e and easy this is to use, and especially get over a couple of conceptual humps that I think would have made the guide a lot easier for me to read um, if I had had them. Uh, I'm going to mainly focus on the socket types because that seems to be kind of the core of your thinking, and maybe we'll look just briefly at the threading performance since they actually talk, you can use it just for pure threads. And uh, basically it's built, the structure, it's built around three key objects, okay? So you have messages, um, you have contact, you have a context that you'll usually only have one, and you have things they call sockets, which look like Berkeley sockets a bit. They've met, the interface looks like it, and that's only to confuse you. It's sort of vaguely true if you squint, but they're much different, much higher level, and it's, so don't expect the semantics to necessarily be the same, okay? Now, we're gonna start with a simple warm-up exercise. Um, what we're gonna do is we're just going to have two threads talking over what amounts to a, a channel, something like you'd have in Go or Rust, um, basically because it's just really, really, really simple. Uh, and they're actually going to be synchronous just because, again, I'm really only illustrating how you get the library up and running, um, so there's no need to actually write asynchronous code. Um, so first of all, if you're playing the home game uh, in the repo, I should have it on the top of every slide for people who come in late. It never occurred to me. That would have been a great idea. Um, Basically, there's some very stripped down code in uh, echopair.cc. Um, now, the funny thing about this is, or at least when you look at it, all you really need to know is that the main function is going to function as a client, meaning it initiates requests, okay? And it creates a server thread to respond to those requests, okay? Now, how does this work? Well, this is the way everything works in 0MQ. You're always going to start off, you're going to create a single a context. It's almost always going to be a single one for, an, for each process, uh, and it's the only thread safe thing in the library. You're not supposed to need thread safety for anything else because if you're passing them between threads, you're doing it wrong. But the context has to be shared, so it is thread safe and re-entrant and all that stuff. Um, Basically, after you have a context, you use that to create sockets. There are uh, at least 11 different kinds of sockets. 
um, and you have to specify a transport. Um, and uh, what you share is, as I said, not the sockets. You share the endpoints, and then each thread connects to the endpoint it needs to talk anywhere else. So this is what this looks like uh, in code. Can you see my pointer back there? Is this useful? You can see it. All right, good. OK, so again, this is echo pair dot C, uh, CC. So everything, they in the C++ interface, uh, they put everything nicely in the ZMQ uh, namespace. So here's a context. I tell it how many I.O. threads I want. Normally one, they say probably one per gigabyte per second of data. So one will be fine for us now. Um, you actually don't need any for this program because we're not using the network. And so in fact, it's direct. But uh, Normally, this would almost always be one, okay? So then what do I do? Well, I create a socket with the context, and I have to tell it what type it is. So in this case, it's a pair, which is the least used socket, but it's actually the easiest to understand initially. Uh, I need a, uh, an endpoint, and the funny thing is, even though this has nothing to do with the network, um, how I specify the endpoint looks like a URL. Why? Because it has a single unified interface. In proc just means in process. It means it's inter-thread only, okay? So we have to bind. Okay, that should feel familiar. Um, and then I create a, ser a server thread here. You, I'm not going to show all the code in anything because all I want to show you is the parts that matter. And I'm passing it the context and the endpoint it should connect to. Okay? Now, here's the funny thing. Semantically, main is going to be the client. It's going to initiate requests. Why did it bind? Okay, so this is the first place where you realize, oh, these really aren't Berkeley sockets. They're only trying to confuse me. Um, first of all, it actually doesn't matter near as much. If you like using sockets, this matters to you a great deal because you can't connect to something that's not there. But in 0MQ, you can, okay, because they just, in the background, remember we gave it an I.O. thread? So one of the things it does is in the background, if it just automatically reconnects, if it's disconnected. If it's not there yet, it'll keep looking, and in the meantime, just queue up your, your messages. So you can do almost everything in either order, and no one cares, which is really, really nice when you have a whole bunch of processes that are coming and going for any number of reasons. Um, and that's where we start to see the ease of use. Um, so the usual recommendation, is, the usual rule is it kind of looks like sockets, but it's more of a, of a principle than a, than a binding rule. You bind for things that stay in one place, that have well-known sockets, well-known well ports, well-known addresses, and you connect if you're, the sort of, if you're a client or something that can come and go. Uh, the only difference is in proc is different. Um, in proc, bind has to happen first, and that's because uh, it bind creates the message queues that they uh, that they talk with. Okay, so pair sockets are also kind of special. They're not like the other sockets in the system. They're 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 almost like Berkeley sockets. Um, you can only have one on each end, meaning they act like a Berkeley socket. Um, and they have some handy properties that make them basically a channel, basically a message queue. Um, and really, their only real purpose is to do exactly what we're doing here. Okay. So what did we do in the child thread? Well, obviously, we, pass the co we get a context. We create our own socket. We bind to the same uh, endpoint. Um, another rule in 0MQ, not all sockets can connect to all other sockets. The types have to be compatible. Pair sockets only match other pair sockets. That's, as I said, they're kind of unusual. Excuse me. So here is what the, uh, the thread looks like. OK, so here we, got, we received the context. Um, um, I hope it's obvious, if it's not obvious to you why it's a reference, you're probably not a C++ programmer, and it's okay. Um, here's the, so what do we do? Uh, we just create a socket, we connect, and we're good to go, okay? Looks kind of familiar. Um, there's a just, I had to do a little slight synchronization. Since I wanted to time this, I didn't have to otherwise. It'll wait until everything's up, but um, I send a blank frame so that the, in other words, the, the supposed server actually initiates a frame so that the server knows, okay, now start your clock and start going. Okay. Um, so basically all we're going to do is we're going to sit here, we're going to create a message, um, we're going to run a bunch, send a bunch of messages. <coughs> uh, actually, sorry, this is the, this is the, uh, the server thread. It's going to receive messages, it's going to send them back, um, and that's all. And I'm letting it block. This is synchronous, which means, you know, it's has its limitations, but again, I really just want you to see how we how everything works. Every program is going to do basically the same thing. Okay, 
Um, so here's what the server is doing. Obviously, it sends first. It sends, you know, something important, right? Um, and then it receives the answers. Okay, so the real points are you've just seen the basic usage. You see it's very simple. It almost looks like sockets, but if anything, it will just work where Berkeley sockets would punish you if you didn't do it right. Um, the, by the way, the S receive and S send functions are convenience functions. I just, there, there's a Z helpers file in the guide. Uh, you can download all the example code for the guide. And it's also a nice way to see how to sort of make it easier to use. The message objects aren't as nice as just using strings. And you, usually, you often don't need them. So now performance, now this is a, quite an old laptop, but still 80K messages a second, not not super fast, okay? So just for fun, and this is the, the only timing I'm going to do, I wanted to see how it would compare with doing this with something that's specialized for inter-thread communication, okay? So first of all, I wrote basically the world's most bare bones uh, queue uh, protected with a mutex lock, and I got almost double uh, the speed. Okay, so, all right, it was kind of slow, but then if you do it right and you use somebody's uh, well-written queue, I got about 25 times faster, okay? So you might say, well, wait a minute, this is supposed to, you, you, I thought you liked this library, okay? Well, first of all, um, I, the timing is probably only vaguely close, but a factor of 25 should stand out from the noise. And actually, all the implementations, they're, they're almost the same code. They're nearly the same length, except writing a queue. So why would you use zero MQ? Well, basically, I set you up. While I was just showing you how it works, I set you up. That's probably, that's a secondary job for zero MQ, and it's probably the hardest one for them to do very well because everything fits together. So everything has the same interface. Everything just works. Um, so I was really playing to its weak weaknesses, okay? It's not actually intended for just using it. It's not, uh, MPI and OpenMP are safe. We will not be running this on our supercomputers simulating the weather, right? Okay, but just think about that code for a minute. What if we wanted to have multiple clients? What if we wanted multiple workers? What if we wanted them running on different machines, uh, different processes? What if we wanted to do some pub sub? Now, all of those would suddenly bloat the code up enormously, okay? And would be not fun, and it wouldn't reconnect when everything goes down. Whereas, as you'll see, it's actually quite easy to do here, okay? So that's the problem with specialty tools, and that's really what Zero MQ is really designed to do, okay? To avoid all the code to do da 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 all right? So let's look at something that's kind of real. Okay, so this is going to be a very simple load balancing server. Um, this is mostly in the guide, although I've done some different things with it. But uh, what I really want to show you, so it's in loadbalancingserver.cc. It is just what it says on the tin, okay? <laughs> and uh, what do I want? I want to have any number of clients. I want any number of work workers, and I want load balancing that will actually accommodate slow and fast uh, clients and workers so I can't do round robin, right? Okay, so the clients are actually even simpler because they don't need to send ready because I'm not profiling it. And, and if you look at the example code, I kind of print some things out so you can tell it's actually working, which means that the threads are slowed down to the speed of... Uh, of the console, right? So we obviously don't care about that yet. Um, why am I, okay, so the clients are all gonna connect. Why? Because they're the ephemeral pieces. The server is the, has the well-known uh, well address. Um, the only real difference is now the clients are using what's called a request socket uh, rather than a pair socket. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Remember, this is always the same. Context, socket type, connect, Oh, and those of you that are not C++ programmers, this is pronounced forever. <laughs> that is my preferred. You, you can do while one if you really want to, but that stands out and you go, what in the heck is that? And then you realize, oh, I've got, an, I've got a potentially infinite loop here. I hope that's what I wanted. All right, so what do I do? It's pretty simple, really. I can send things. I can receive things. Um, and let's see. Hang on. Oh. 
That's right, I actually gave you a Python example. So, that's another thing, right? It's very easy to do things in different languages because the bindings all work similarly. So let's do the same thing in Python. And this is in load balancing client.py, okay? I'm gonna create a context. The syntax is different, but it's exactly the same thing. Now I'm going to create a request socket. I'm going to connect it. The endpoint is all the same. And then since I can't do forever, it's while true. I'm gonna send something. Um, I'm going to receive something. The only tricky part here is that you do need to send binary data, okay? Um, because it expects binary data and not UTF-8, okay? So, what about request sockets, okay? They're the simplest way to do, uh, to do, uh, excuse me, to do uh, request reply. They're synchronous, so you actually have to call them. They're like a state machine that flops back and forth, right? Request has to go first then it has to receive something before it can send again, and so on. Um, that makes them kind of fast and simple to use. You don't have to do things uh, synchronously, but if you want to, these things are very simple, okay? Um, the server, however, isn't going to care. So the server will be, is going to be asynchronous, and it will happily support asynchronous clients. I just didn't write one for you. Um, and they use a different socket. They use something, in this case, for a request, the equivalent is something called a dealer socket, which has extra bells and whistles and comes with a 5,000, a five-year or 50,000-mile warranty, um, unlike the uh, request socket, okay? So uh, almost every socket type in 0MQ comes in pairs. Why are they in pairs? Because each one of them implements a specific pattern, and the patterns are asymmetric except for pair. So ironically, pair is the only one that doesn't come in pairs, right? So if you want a uh, request reply pattern, then you've got rec and rep for synchronous uh, work and dealer and router for sort of the full Monty, okay? Um, you've got pub sub for pub sub. You've got xpub and xsub, which you only use if you're relaying, really. Um, and you've got, for, you've got push and pull sockets for making pipelines, right? Data splits out, gather it in, um, so these are really all the baked-in patterns, okay? And you'll see in a minute you can do odd things with them, uh, which is part of why they're useful. Um, but they're specialized, right? So these are bidirectional. They obviously have to be. And uh, router, for example, knows how to get messages back to the origin. Pub sub, push pull, and obviously uni uh, unilateral, or sorry, unidirectional. Um, Pub sub has, some kind, has to have some kind of routing logic, push pull does not. So again, what you're going to do with 0MQ is you're going to think through the patterns and figure out, all right, which Lego bricks do I assemble for what I actually want to do, okay? And we'll see a little bit of that, okay? So what's the server going to do? Well, the server can't use a, a reply socket because it better not be synchronous and it wants to connect to a lot of clients. So it has a router socket, okay? And the great, and now one thing that, uh, yes, it's coming up, I'll show you. Well, this is where we start to see why this is a whole lot easier than doing this the hard way, okay? First of all, I don't have to select and pull, even though I'm going to connect to multiple endpoints, okay? I don't have to do accept. This just happens somewhere automatically. Um, I don't have to do different checks for things that don't have a file descriptor. It just works, okay? So how does that look? Well, all right, so of course, I create a socket with a context. I give it a type. What am I doing here? I'm just bind, 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 bind. I can just keep doing this. I can bind to whatever I like, um, which is, again, it's not really Berkeley sockets. It's just much nicer, okay? And I'm binding to an in-proc uh, endpoint, so there isn't any... Uh, there isn't any file descriptor to, to pull on, but it doesn't matter. It's going to act as though there is. It's all just going to work. Um, I, this is IPC. The way they implement IPC is this is a, actually a Unix socket in practice. So the guide says it doesn't work, a Unix domain socket. So the guide says it doesn't work on Windows, but it's, I believe Windows 10 might now have Unix domain. It does? So this may well work, um, but the guide says no because they wrote it back in the Windows whatever days single digits of some kind. And then, of course, this is the real thing. I'm going to bind it to localhost, but you can bind it to whatever you like, okay? So how do we route things? And this is where you start to see kind of the logic of using this for less trivial problems, okay? So, yeah, we're doing all right on time. Okay, so basically what a router socket does is it wraps whatever you send it, okay, so 
data comes in, the re you send the request, data goes over, it hits the, uh, the router socket on the other end, and it wraps it in an envelope. And the envelope knows the identity of who sent it. Okay? So what you receive out of it is not the original message, but the original message in an envelope that says, this is, this is where the reply is going. And when you send outgoing messages on a router socket, it expects that envelope to be there, and it will strip the envelope off and send it to the right one uh, because it's secretly keeping a thread pool. So it knows, it, it knows where they went, probably by which of the sockets in the pool it came from, but it will magically get there. Okay, but you have to make sure, if you do anything odd, as we are going to do, you will have to make sure that you give it the envelope. Okay? So, this is where, to, to know how we do envelopes, we have to know something about 0MQ messages. All you really need to know is that they're sequences of frames. I'm not crazy about that language, because frames can mean lots of other things. Um, but what they mean is, it is a sequence of chunks of binary data. They're just... They're just binary strings, okay? And that is all 0MQ has to know about messages, but it's enough to implement uh, envelope letter because all you have to do is just prepend extra frames with the routing data, and they often like to use uh, empty frames as delimiters, and I think they're, like, virtually free. I think they're a zero byte in the stream, to be honest with you. Um, and then you can manipulate the frames and make it do, do what you want. You could send it to a different, uh, a different origin if you were to put a different ID there because it is transparent to you when you're working at this level. So this is how the routing works, right? Here's a request socket in a client. It has a client ID associated with it. It sends a request. When it hits the router socket, what comes out is actually two more frames. There's the client ID, and there's an empty frame delimiter. And then here's the original request. So when it goes back, we have to make sure that this stuff is there, okay? And then here's a reply, hits the router, this gets stripped off, the reply goes back to the same client ID, okay? So if you have that in your mind, you're halfway to kind of seeing what it feels like to work with this, okay? So now, that was really easy, okay? So how are we going to solve the load balancing problem? That's a little harder. So what you would expect from what I've said, if you've been listening, you'd expect that the server is going to send the requests onto the workers with a dealer socket, right? Because if a router is the equivalent of reply, but with, you know, extra added features, then the dealer must be the request. And that's true, but the problem is the dealer will just sit there and round robin. And that's not really what we want if we have workers that are, you know, sitting on another machine across the network and workers that are in threads. So what we actually want the, the workers to do is to tell us every time they're ready. Okay? Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that means the workers have to send first. Okay? So they can't use reply sockets because reply sockets can't send until they've gotten a request, can they? So in reality, the way to think about this is the workers are actually going to be making requests to the server for a job, and their reply is going to actually be, uh, sorry, they're going to make a request. The reply that comes to them is going to be a new job. So what the worker, what is uh, sort of operationally, functionally a reply to the worker is the client's request. Okay, see how the language is getting tricky? This is why I said I wanted to get you over some humps. The guide will make more sense if you already know this can happen. Okay, we don't need an extra ready message because when it sends the, uh, the data, so what happens? It sent, hey, I need some data. Come, it, gets, it gets that. So it, it got a reply from the server. So what can it do next? It has to send another request. So its request functionally is going to take the reply and that's also going to tell the server, now I'm ready to go, okay? I do have a diagram coming, which will make this a little clearer. But the point is that the workers, even though you would think they are replying semantically, they are going to use a request socket. So we've inverted the socket's meaning in a sense, and I'm going to just say something about that. There's a lesson for this is the socket types are named. You would think they're semantic patterns. Oh, I, have a I need to send a reply. I will use a reply socket. That's not the case. They're actually, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, where, where do I say this? The point is that there's a difference between functionally and semantically. I don't like this language. I don't think it's that clear, but I couldn't find a better one. What you do 
is you actually just think to yourself, functionally, what am I doing? Am I sending a message first? I'm a request. I don't care what it means to some other part of the program. If I'm, send, if I'm only responding, I'm a, re I'm a reply, and so on. So again, the thing I want to keep clear is to use these patterns, even though the, type, the names kind of make you think that this is the semantic meaning, it's really just the pattern of their behavior. And you really just pick the behavior you want, whether or not it means to you what it sounds like. Okay? So, the implementation is slightly hairy. So, in a moment, we're going to see the diagram. But I'm just going to say what the diagram says so that you'll hopefully, the diagram will make sense uh, quicker. So the server has to use a router again because remember, the workers have a request socket. So I need to reply to them. Plus, I need to know who it is that's ready, don't I? So actually, router is perfect. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to get the ID of the worker that just told me he's ready. So I can store that. I'm going to put it in a queue, okay? And what I can do is, uh, is, is once I have something in the queue, a worker that says he's ready, when I get a request from the client, then I'll just pop it out of the queue and I'll stick the worker ID. Remember, I can wrap it up. I can send it to whoever I want. Okay? And the router socket will strip that envelope off and then it will send it to that guy. It doesn't matter that he's told me earlier because the router socket just going to do what router socket going to do, right? Okay. Um, and of course, I'm going to keep the original client ID because I'm going to have to persist that because eventually I've got to get it back to him. Okay. Now, the other thing is now I do have two sockets. I have a front end and a back end socket. Okay, so even though I don't have to poll for, you know, 100 clients on one socket, I do have to poll for the two sockets, okay? And you can do that. You can still poll. You just don't need to poll on nearly as many things because so many of them can just attach on one 0MQ socket, right? Okay, so here we go. This is the dreaded, uh, the dreaded data flow diagram. So what's happening here? Um, I get a request, right? It, what comes out of the, of the uh, router socket, as we saw from the front end, is there's a request, but it's wrapped in this envelope with client ID and the delimiter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a worker ID, a ready worker ID, out of my queue, and I'm going to put another envelope. So I'm wrapped. Put, you, know, you guys all know the envelope letter pattern, and that's what's, that is what's so great. They gave you just enough structure to the message to do the most, the most important thing. Everything else, you use your own serialization library. Send anything you like. This is all that they needed, and that's kind of the ethos of this library. Give you just enough to reuse without too much. Okay? So now I've got something that has two envelopes, and that's great because the router, is the back-end router, is now going to strip off the first one, so I'm back to this, aren't I? But I'm back to this going to the correct worker. Okay? What's the worker going to do? Well, we still need to know what this is. So he's just going to replace the request with the reply, send it back. Right. So this gets to the router. Of course, uh, what happens? Well, the router now wraps it up again, because he always does. So now we know who it was that just sent us the reply. Okay? And that's great, because first of all, I need the outer envelope to stick back in the queue so I know that he's ready for another job, right? And then the rest of it is exactly what I need. See how I have, I now have the original envelope here, but with the reply in it. And now that, the router, the, the other side, the front end router will now route that correctly, okay? So it's a little bit confusing, but the fact is that's tremendously powerful because it's a whole lot easier than writing the routing code for yourself, isn't it, okay? So how does that work? Well, so here's what a worker looks like. Let, this is the easier part. What's he going to do? Okay, this receive multi-part here. Um, I did this is I just used the Python code for this one. Um, this is so you get all the frames at once instead of sucking it off frame by frame, because that's really easy. All I have to do is replace the final frame, right? I'm just going to assign it here in this in the uh, the, the list or the. Yeah, Python calls them lists. They're arrays, but they call them lists. And then I'm just going to send it right back because I'm done. So the workers, again, are really simple. And that's good because you only have to write the server once, right? But you may be writing a lot of clients and a lot of workers, so the, the complexity is in the right place, just naturally, okay? So what's the lesson here? Well, the point is, Choose the right functional behaviors. We don't care what they say semantically. We want to know what the behaviors are, right? And it's easy to just 
slice and dice, mix and match, shuffle together, deal apart all of the message frames however you like it, and just keep, use frames for the pieces you need to slice and dice, and everything is really simple, okay? Now, that is, uh, is this time right? Okay, yeah, we're all right. Okay, now, first of all, I do have some time here, so let me go back to the big confusing diagram, because I'm doing well on time. Do we have any questions about the, or any, on anything really, but, but this is where I suspect questions may come up. I, is this making sense? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is this something, this pattern something I invented? It's not something I invented. Um, it is, th I, I adapted something out of the guide because I thought this was an extremely nice way to illustrate sort of how you actually use the tools in practice. So there is a load balancing uh, server there that I have kind of adapted. Um, but I think it's quite representative of kind of the ethos in practice. You don't worry about what the message frames look like. You pick the sockets for the right behavior and then you just slice and dice the message frames until they do what you want. Um, if you're just relaying, they even get, you could, it's trivially easy to pass them back and forth. They even give you a function for that. So you can write uh, proxies in a couple of lines, but normally you'll probably do something like this. Anything else? Okay. So here's our worker. Okay, now, when I was doing this, so believe it or not, um, so the goal of this talk was to illustrate how easy and quick it is to get your messages where you need them to go. And I got this fairly well polished up, believe it or not, last night, and I said, you know what I need? I want to show how quickly we can prototype things, because that one was a little hairy. So I actually kitted this up. <laughs> that quickly, and that's kind of my point. It was just trivial for me to say, ah, let's just prototype something that has some interesting behavior that's really easy. So, let's add a log server to this thing, okay? Now, what do I want? Okay, well, first of all, I really just want to show you the other two major so kinds of sockets, okay? So, we got push-pull and pub-sub, um, how quickly we can just throw messages wherever we want them, um, so there is, and I did this in Python because we're prototyping. Why, why, wh isn't that what slow languages are for? Um, I'm only saying that to, to tease the Python programmers, okay? Um, so I like Python, but yes, it's a slow language, I'm sorry. Um, so the code, there's a log server and there's a log watcher. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to actually make it so the log server just routes the log messages. And anybody, you know, anywhere you want, you need to listen in, you can do that. And listen in on the ones you want, okay? Now, I will say this. I only put the logging in on the Python worker and client. And the reason was that if I log from the, the threads, which are also can run there at the same time, it slows my C++ threads to the speed of Python. And I just found that unbearable. <laughs> but that's a real, I mean, that, that's not the fault of, of uh, zero and Q. That's the actual problem. Threads go much faster than the network, right? So you're going to have to figure out how to solve that. And, and, a, and the library can't help you with that. It could just put the messages where you want to go. You have to figure out how to get them, how to get threads to get their logging done without being unduly slow. Okay, but nonetheless, it, other than that, and just my um, odd dislike of ha seeing my C++ chug along at the speed of Python. Um, so, how do we want the routing to do? Well, it's really simple, um, but what I wanted to show you is the fact that why would I use, why do I have different pairs of, uh, of sockets here? Okay, well, what push and pull are good at is sending out lots of chunks of data out to be run by, you know, many... Uh, many workers in parallel, bringing, collating them back together, that's what they do, okay? So they're unidirectional, you can't send anything back the other way because that's not what that pattern does. So that's why I'm using this, okay? You might say, well, wouldn't pub sub be nice? And the answer is no, because then every single pub sub is also unidirectional. Every single worker would be a publisher <laughs> and the log server would have to subscribe to them, which is bizarre. I mean, you could do it, but 
didn't make sense to me. So instead, the log server just sits there. It binds to a pulse socket, and then all of the uh, all of the anything that logs just uh, connects to a push connects with a push socket to the same endpoint. Again, we see that I've got there. There's a, there's probably a socket for every connection in this pool, but I don't care because the pool is hidden nicely away in the context, and I never have to do another poll or anything just for that reason. But on the back end, I actually do want PubSub. And why is that? Because I want anybody to be able to listen. I don't want to have to know or care what they're doing with it. I want them to be able to just pick the messages they want. And if they're not there, you know, I still want the logger to run. So that is PubSub, isn't it? Okay? So let's take a look at how this looks in Python. So, well, okay, so this is in the client now that I wrote in Python. So he creates a second socket. It's a push socket, right? So what am I going to do? Well, this is the tricky, this is one little bit, another example of why frames are really, really nice. Oh, I did, what I didn't actually mention is that uh, even if you're not using the envelope wrapper stuff, it is incredibly nice to have so reliable in-order sockets that are framed for you, okay? If you've ever sat there and had to do your own framing and you go, wait, do I have enough data? No, I'm in the middle of a frame. Um, zero MQ frames or messages are all or nothing, okay? So if it can't deliver every ch byte of every frame in the message, you don't get it, which if you think about it is what you want in every, if that's not what you want, then Go grovel with TCP and, and suffer, right? Okay, so that's what's going to happen here, but I want to send two frames. Why do I want to send two frames? Okay, this is again this little bit where Python will do bad things to you if you don't send binary. Why do I want that? Because the way that subscriptions are done is they're just pattern matched to see whether the message has your pattern as a prefix. <laughs> And that's actually kind of, kind of brainless, but it's actually really nice. For one thing, a client could subscribe to client Python, and now he only gets messages that have that uh, channel name, or he could subscribe to things that say client, and he could also get client-cpp. So you get a little, you can actually kind of create a hierarchy of channels if you want to, which is really nice. Now, the other thing, you don't have to use two frames. This could actually just be the beginning of this message. I don't want to do that because then I actually have to disambiguate that. I have frames. So it's only going to pattern match on the first frame. So now I'm guaranteed that it does not matter if this happens to begin with this because the pattern match will happen exactly on one frame. It, that frame is entirely devoted to the pattern, and that's it. So it's actually really nice, okay? And what's beautiful about it is that it does everything you wanted, and the implementation is so simple. And it means that you can just, if you can, your language can mess with strings, then you can do anything you want with it. Okay, what does it look like in the watcher? Now, I didn't actually put the code for the log server because it's trivial for this simple log server. It's just grabbing them off of a pulse socket and it's broadcasting them, right? So what's a little more interesting, is slightly more interesting, is what the log watcher is doing. So he's got to create a sub, uh, a sub socket. Now, this is, the gr this is a great way to waste 30 minutes of your life. The first time you do this, forget to call set sock opt. Once again, we're, do, we're making it look like Berkeley sockets, even though it really, really, really isn't. So yes, everything we do, every option is done with set sock opt. Um, and we have to subscribe. And this is just a string I'm using as the prefix, right? Now, the guide says, and I believe I probably did it, um, what you always do the first time you do this is you create a subscription socket, you uh, go ahead and you start receiving with it, but you forgot to subscribe, which means you're subscribed to nothing. And then you wonder, where are my messages going? And the answer is they're going right where they should, straight to the bit bucket because you didn't subscribe to them. Um, on the other hand, because it's just a prefix, you can subscribe to the empty string channel. <laughs> <laughs> and you get everything. So. It's exactly what you want, okay? So what am I going to do? I'm just going to sit here. If I'm the log watcher, all I have to do is, is subscribe, 
And then I just sit here. I just receive stuff. And then I do what I want with it. Um, but I can have log watchers all over the place asking for different things. And it just works. And nicely, um, the, uh, well, just uh, if you're wondering, the message is, although you set the prefix, you set the channel subscription in the subscriber, that invisibly goes over the network to the publisher socket, which then doesn't actually send it to you. So you don't have to have all the network traffic of having every subscriber get every message and then throwing them away. So, which is kind of nice, okay? So, what's the lesson here, okay? Well, the lesson is that I prototyped that at the last minute just because I could, and I actually thought, it, after I did it, I thought, you know, that was actually a better illustration <laughs> than it would have been if I had planned out, you know, something a little more involved. Because that's what, part of what I want from something like this. There are many more sophisticated ways to use this, okay? There are ways to, to work very hard on reliable messaging and a lot of other things. But the nice thing is to start by just getting the data to flow <laughs> from all your parts so that all of your buddies can actually start writing clients and workers and publishers and subscribers. And then later you can go back in and do that, but they're not twiddling their thumbs saying, uh, where's the messaging layer, right? Okay. Um, there was one other thing that was a little bit obnoxious, and I want to mention it because, so it turns out every socket uh, I started building a table. I didn't give it to you because it wasn't finished. But I started building a table of what are all the differences between all the socket types. Because as a tutorial, they get scattered all over for when you needed them in the tutorial. Um, most of the sockets will block if their message queue is full. So let's talk for just one second about these things. So these sockets... The guide describes them, but he starts off by saying we took Berkeley sockets and exposed them to radiation from, you know, waste from a Russian nuclear power plant, and then we gave them superpowers, and they were bitten by a radioactive spider, and the prose is a little unsettling. You, if you're a techie, you're going, that's neat. What do they do? Okay. So all of the sockets have... All of them will even have one message queue. Most of them have a queue, an ingoing and outgoing queue. Some of them don't need it. But the point is that uh, you can control the size of the queue with get sock opt. <laughs> but you will care about this once you start wanting to make things reliable. Because as I said, my, what, will happen, what happens when that queue is full? The socket types have different behaviors. Most of them will block. That's why I said... If I send logging messages from my threads, they slow down to the speed of Python. Of course, I was being mean. They slowed down to the speed of the network. Python is faster than the network. So I was just being mean just because I can. Um, but the point is, a couple of them will just silently throw things away. The, d the router socket will throw things away because it's a server. It's supposed to stay up. The one disappointment I have with that is I actually want to be able to change this behavior with set sock opt. And I was going to show you how to do that. And then I'm going like, wait, I don't see that option. Turns out it doesn't seem to exist. So if you don't want that behavior, you might have to implement some flow control. But as I said, reliability will cost you some effort. But it will still be easier than doing it in raw sockets, right? Okay. But it's worth knowing. That's why they slowed down. They filled up their message queue, and then they're sitting there blocked, waiting for somebody to pull some of those log messages out so that they can continue on, right? Okay. Um, and as I said, you need something fancier. But the important thing here is my point. That's why I called the talk Connect All the Things. Um, if you run the example code, there are workers running in threads over in proc. Uh, you can change it, but the Python client by default is going over localhost. It's going over through the, uh, through the, the network stack. The, uh, the Python worker is actually going through a, a Unix socket, and none of this... You don't know, you don't care, it just works. Now, again, for the social media generation who have already tuned me out because there were way too many words here, I do want to summarize things in a more concise fashion. <laughs> 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 
I love you. I just like to tease people who are addicted to, to social media. And with that, um, I'm going to end. Oh, actually, uh, the last slide is this. Um, I've not done this before, but since I put the slides in the repo, it occurred to me that it would be nice to just have it all licensed. You can do pretty much whatever you want. So I'm sorry for putting legalese in the slides, but it is there. That's the Debian guideline. Make sure the documentation is under the same license as the code so you can rip things out. I don't think you're going to want to rip things out of my slides, but it's whatever you like. So with that, questions? Can you check out the mic up there? Be absolutely. So save Dustin for having to repeat questions. So, so if you make a a network centric uh, set of uh, processes that want to be monitored by an existing commercial monitoring process software that uses sockets to attach it to, if you have zero MQ, can a regular socket attach to it? You said it's not a Berkeley socket. But what happens when a regular socket client attaches to a zero MQ? Um, a zero MQ endpoint? Yeah, endpoint, yeah. Um, what will happen Can is it will make no sense unless you have implemented the zero MQ protocol. So that's why I said you don't use it primary, you don't really use it for existing protocols. That's not its purpose. So the point is zero MQ has a well-defined wire protocol. And you can certainly implement that. But the, what you would, I think, do in this case, if you want to get, first of all, you can use any number of, I mean, so it clearly uses Berkeley sockets underneath. Each one of those zero MQ sockets represents a whole pool of Berkeley sockets, and it's, it's polling on them night and day. You just don't have to deal with it. Um, you can certainly also have your own Berkeley sockets. You don't have to, it's, it doesn't require you to do all your networking that way if you're interfacing with something else. If you want to pass data between them, then you write a little bridge, which may not be very hard if, you've, if they already gave you an SDK for whatever it is, or I mean, in other words, if you can already just throw data onto a regular socket, um, then all you have to do is you know, use a zero MQ socket to pull, message, pull a zero MQ messages from wherever you like in your zero MQ messaging layer, and then stuff that string onto the, onto the socket. So it won't help you, but it will also not hinder you in any way. Does and that make sense? Zero MQ get sock off and make it act like a Berkeley sock? No, you can't do that. Because it will because no matter what you do, you can send a raw a string, but it will send it using its own protocol. For example, every string is counted, so there are count there are counts in that stream. You would have to know where they are. So you'd have to actually understand their protocol. And you can do it, but honestly, I would guess in almost every case it'd be easier to write a bridge. Um, data streaming systems like uh, AWS Kinesis and Kafka have this abstraction about atomically increasing numbers and ways for clients to express that they've processed a certain message in a system and they can disconnect and reconnect and then continue to process a certain point in a stream. Okay. Um, if you want to implement something like that in ZeroMQ, is that an appropriate, is ZeroMQ an appropriate technology for this kind of uh, system where you want to be able to continue processing from a given point if you have some kind of outage in a worker. So what you're saying is that the messages persist essentially? Uh, if the process goes down, the message is persisted on disk somewhere or, or in something persistent storage and then you can bring it back. Yeah, there's something persisted, but the notion is right. that there's a, an ID that determines the last thing you process, mm -hmm. so when your thing comes back up, it knows where to start right. again. Okay, so the answer is zero MQ isn't going to try to help you with that in that it tries to do one thing. Well, okay, it does a lot of things, but it all is related to having an in-memory message layer, okay? So it's not going to persist anything for you. Um, if you're doing, but if you have to do enough of the other things that it does well, it's probably, it might be easier to write that than it is to do all the reconnection and all of the, uh, the other things it does. But if that's not true, then it might not give you enough because it's not going to persist for you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, what are the major advantages of zero MQ over uh, simple Q service, uh, Azure Service Bus, uh, RabbitMQ, IBM MQ, um, or most other uh, message queues? And can you configure it for FIFO? 
for oh for FIFO. Okay. Um, so the well the advantage is it actually is in a different space. Okay. Um, it's a lower level tool, and if you want, for example, it doesn't have it doesn't have any built in notion of having a server, whereas like RabbitMQ, it's, there's a server there with a persistent queue, right? So the equivalent to that is if you wanted that. Uh, and you in and, and Rabbit and Q didn't do it for you, you would write it. Okay, in other words, it's a tool for writing those servers. Okay. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to automate the really low level code that almost everything that, that touches a Berkeley socket already does, right? I mean if you want to be it, it's a pain to have to oh I my socket somebody went down. I've got to reconnect. Oh, I need to frame these things even though I'm going over TCP because in their infinite wisdom, nobody gave us a uh, frame. Well, they did, but no one implements it. <laughs> they didn't give us a, a, a nice, framed, reliable service, right? So what it's doing is it's trying to give you enough building blocks. It's, it's, a, it's a set of Legos. It's the difference between a set of Legos and a nice metal toy car, right? It's not meant to give you a toy car. It's meant to say, do you want a toy car, or did you want a dump truck, or did you want a spaceship? We have the tools for you. If that does that kind of does that answer the question? Yeah, but the MQ suggests that it's a message queue, not just the blocks of a message queue. So that's that's kind of the nature of my question. Yes. And the second part was, uh, is it easily configurable for uh, first in first out, last in first out, like uh, SQS is? Um, well, okay. So so don't let me forget the second one. So yes, that's why I kind of I had the little what it isn't thing because with that MQ on there, you unavoidably think that it's a competitor to RabbitMQ. Just, just don't forget about the zero at the beginning. Right. The yes. zero is a hint that the, there's the zero. No yeah, MQ. the zero is a hint that it's something different. And the zero originally meant um, is it zero zero latent zero copy. And I think now they they have lots of zeros because some of them get really excited about these things. Um, but none of them are, here is a turnkey server, um, start it up in init, and then call it, right? Um, as far as FIFO, uh, I'm not sure what, you, what you're saying, but every one of those sockets will have one or both of the input and the output queued, and that is first in, first out, right? It's basically sucking in network data off of normally TCP, and then it's framing it for you. So when you ask, hey, do I have a message, it, even if it's all there but one byte, you don't have to deal with that. So the sockets are inherently FIFO. Okay? There's no out-of-band facility that I know of, so every message that you get will be in order. Is that what you were asking, or would you ask for something more, uh, more sophisticated? Yeah, that's basically what I was asking about. Okay. So, so it's inherently that way, then. Hey, Dustin. Hey, Brian. Um, so, uh, my understanding was that the creator of Zero MQ has moved on to Nano Message, and uh, is there a reason this this talk is not Nano Message? Is Zero MQ still more industrial? Or? There is a reason. First of all, if I recall right, not only did he move on to Nano Message, but then he just moved on entirely, and someone else forked it, and now has it was either Nano Message two, or I think it now might have another name. Okay, so there have been some forks, um, and I looked at this because. As with everybody who forks, they claim to have improved something. Here's the problem. Most of the forks that have happened are now defunct, okay? And those that did happen, they may be working now, but I don't know how many years they've been working, but it's a lot less. Zero MQ doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, and also, it's better documented. I mean, like I said, I really want a really nice reference as well as the guide. A lot of the other ones, I mean, literally, one of the one of them that looked quite good, the answer was mostly read the source code. You know the idea because you know what zero MQ is. Now read the source code for what I did differently. I'm like, I, yeah. So the reason is I didn't trust the other ones yet. If I were deeply enough into it, then I could make a decision. But it might. I. I this isn't going anywhere, as far as I can tell. That's that's the entire answer, really. Hey, if yeah. you go back two slides back, uh, there was a push and pull, and then there is a. It's pub and sub, right? How are the messages uh, sent across this push and pull pub? How are they sent across? Yeah. Do you mean how, like, like how, how are they ordered? Oh, yeah. So what's basically happened is that the, the pulse socket 
is going to use, uh, I think it uses some kind of fair, so some kind of fair queuing algorithm so that it won't let, for example, a very fast pusher, you know, entirely dominate the stream. So it's distributing for you. Um, I don't think that that's configurable. So if you really needed something specialized, uh, that might be a problem for you. It, I didn't see anything that it wouldn't do. It, it didn't do that I that I would that I knew I'd want. But it's going to sort of it's going to to try to keep them all working without letting one dominate. If is that is that does that answer the question? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there is no buffering in any of these places, right? Uh, no, no, there is. Uh, there's. The, uh, the push socket, no, suppose the, the server goes down. Well, then he's filling up his yeah, outgoing queue, except right? Except the source. Except the source. Except the source, and there's no it, buffering. Well, there's there. buffering here, because this is another socket. So it's got an incoming buffer. If your server is not pulling them off there fast enough, he's got his own, his own queue to fill up. Uh, so that most of, the pl most of the steps in this all have buffering on them. Okay. And what it will do is it will push it as far as it can go, and then it will start filling up the queue, this is kind of, it'll start filling up the queue that the, where the blockage is, if that makes sense. And while it doesn't persist them on disk, as long as the program continues to run, <coughs> it'll sit there until it figure, till it's able to deliver it if it can. So it tries to be robust, but it doesn't persist on its own. Okay. Can I assume that uh, if I need high throughput or low latency use case applications, uh, zero on queues uh, is uh, one possible Okay, way to so do it. they claim so. I did not, as you saw, my, uh, my uh, benchmarking was extremely minimal at best. I really just wanted to know how it competed with something that I knew was fast. Um, they claim that it is, in fact, high performance, and that is likely to be true, certainly for the network things that it's really designed to do. I would, however, benchmark that, especially if you already know what your goals are. I would just write something and just stuff messages through it and see if it actually is doing what you want because I don't have any numbers for it. They, I can tell you what they claim, but they also say that they used, that the uh, sockets were bitten by a radioactive spider. So, <laughs> uh, I just wonder if I could answer the question before about uh, the difference between 0MQ and RabbitMQ. Oh, yeah, okay. To me, I don't, uh, don't ever think about them the same thing. I believe uh, RabbitMQ and a lot of them use uh, AMQP as their actual okay. protocol level. Oh, it does. I would okay. more relate that to what this or to what uh, Zero MQ is doing. It's really just a library for using a network socket, which provides some cool functionality and a cool patterns of use. Otherwise, it really doesn't do much. I would also, in my understanding, I could be wrong, but uh, in my understanding, generally, you don't want Zero MQ to do any type of queuing. That's not its job. It's there to provide a buffer just as a maybe a network queue on a switch would yes. do. It buffers a little bit just so we can get traffic flowing. But if you're queuing, you've probably got a problem. Yeah. Something's backing up. Yeah. And then uh, you should actually have a program like Kafka or something yeah. else in between there, which would be handling your yeah. temporary storage of messages yeah. or something like that. No, I agree with that. I mean, when I say it's his queuing, that's equivalent, that's roughly like saying a Berkeley socket does have a buffer inside there so that you're not hitting the network on every call to receive, right? But as you say, if, you, if you're intentionally queuing, um, wow, well, now I'm the voice of God again because I adjusted it, um, then it's not, that's not what it's meant to do. You can't get at the queues in this. You can't do anything to them except set their, their maximum size. So if you need RabbitMQ, then this is not doing that. It could have been written to use this as its transport layer. But that's, yeah, I mean, I t entirely agree. They're not, they're not filling the same space at all. Um, and you made another point that I like. Oh, if RabbitMQ is using a AQMP, it's, I won't say much about that because I don't know much about it, but I will say this. IMATX, the company who backs this, was, <laughs> I think, think they developed AMQP and eventually abandoned it because they said this leads to too much, it's too heavyweight, we don't want to be required to have a central server. So you don't have to, you can write a central server with this, but there are plenty of tools to make it completely distributed. So in their mind, it does compete with AMQP, but it's a very, very different animal, okay? And according to them, faster. <laughs> Hi, I have a question saying that 
Uh, I saw you use uh, you get multi I mean receive multi parts or something similar yeah. in your code and send multi part and modify it w using an index member. I'm asking, is there an abstraction layer available for like packing up like each message is each message? Or for example, in in in, in, in another case, for example, I'm using uh, a C program and a Python program using Uni Unix domain socket to, to con connect between them. When this, because this, the speed variance is really really huge, so what would, what would happen like like for example, if I re only receive something in Python, I just receive like six parts or nine parts. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, Are you asking? Is this about primarily how to use the interface? How do you, you get you off you the frames? You said you yeah, but what if like the message piles up and it can, is it possible that when I use it, I just get more frames than I want? No. Never, because the frames are always part of a message, and you get complete messages. Messages are all or nothing. So if the sender sends you nine frames, you will either get nine complete frames or nothing. Okay? Yeah, but I mean, like, for example, the minimal frame for an envelope is three, right? You could make your own envelopes. You don't have to use the delimiter. They do, and they have reasons for doing it. You wouldn't technically, I mean, you're not required to do it. You can use the frames any way you like, if yeah. that is answering something. Yeah, but is, is it possible, like, using the way you, you demonstrate it, that I will receive, like, two messages at the same time? No. Okay. No. Perfect. It's always, again, it, th that's, that is one of the, better, the best guarantees of it, especially if you've done your own framing on TCP and you wrote the same code a bunch of times, or you said, screw it, and used a, a uh, uh, serialization library. It they always come in a bundle. And it's not all or nothing on the frame level, it's all or nothing on the message level. So you will always get, okay, well let me, let me qualify that. That's the way 0MQ works. Now the interface, like the C++ interface, you can pull the frames off one at a time. Um, and I don't like that, and if I'd had a little more time, I would have actually written the equivalent of the Python interface for C++. It would be very easy. And the nice thing about the Python one is you can just say, give me all the frames. Doesn't matter how many are there, you'll get the next message, right? If that makes sense. Hi. Yeah. Can you discuss options for transport security? For transport security? Uh, what I can mostly tell you is that they do have a security system now built in. I have not tried to use it. Um, they did mention the person who wrote, I think, some el or wrote some elliptic curve uh, code for them. So it may be well done, okay, but I have not tried to use it, so I can't tell you much. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, there is, in my experience, m much of the time people do the all-purpose uh, thing and just send whatever they like over a uh, SSH, uh, SSL tunnel. <laughs> so you always have that option, but it does supposedly now have a built-in uh, security system. Might uh, look at Salt actually uses ZeroMQ for all of its command dispatch, uh, and it, it they those guys work really hard on getting some transport security uh, on top of it. And you can take a look at what they've done. They're, they've had it audited pretty extensively, as you can imagine. No one likes having your infrastructure orchestration layer be a compromise. So. Last I looked was like two years ago or something, and somebody had actually forked uh, the zero MQ and created a SASL in the implementation for authentication, et cetera. Hmm. It does seem to attract forks. <laughs> so uh, we're at the uh, end of the hour, so I'm going to end the questions, even though this is going great. If you guys want to bug Dustin uh, after it's over, that, that's fine, one on one. Absolutely. But let's thank him. Thanks and very let much. Him get out of the room if you want. Thanks a lot, Dustin. What's that? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know what you were pointing at because I was not thinking very well. I'm just running on coffee. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the developer track. Uh, at this point this afternoon, we're going to be talking about Lost in Userland with Will here, going to be presenting. Uh, we're going to get started real quick here. I'll let him take off, and then we'll do Q&A at the end. Uh, I'll just sit off in the corner there, but when Q&A comes, tell me to grab, to point in my direction to grab a mic. All right. Well, without any further ado, let's all find out about the joys of Core Utils. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Rosecrans, and thank you all for uh, coming to find out how to get lost in userland. Uh, Assuming I can make a computer work. All right. So my name is Will Rosecrans, and I work on the Edgecast Content Delivery Network at Verizon Digital Media. Uh, basically, that is a very large network where if you have bits and you have clients, we will send the bits to the clients. Uh, we have over 100 points of presence around the world. We serve terabits of traffic. Uh, zillions of connections, a number that is always growing and not worth remembering exactly. Um, we serve lots and lots of sites that you're familiar with and lots and lots of video sites, cat GIFs mainly, and then uh, altogether it adds up to a non-trivial percentage of the total traffic on the internet. So we are very concerned with performance and that's sort of a key part of my job. And uh, Basically, the summary of all of that is cat GIFs. Uh, we do also serve edgecats.net in addition to edgecastcdn.net. If you ever need like an edge cat supply, uh, it will give you a random cat GIF every time you go there. Uh, so more specifically, I am tech lead on the HTTP platform team. We are responsible for building and releasing our core HTTP server software, which is called Sailfish. Every time we release it, there's a really involved process of canary deployment where we're constantly looking into any possible performance regressions, things like that. So performance is a key part of my job and part of everybody else's job there. And uh, generally speaking, we have this very large distributed system, lots of nodes around the world uh, running Linux. So Linux performance is something I'm really interested in. And we also have a software lifecycling community internally. There's lots of different communities that people have started that are kind of separate from the management hierarchy. One is the board game community. Some of them are more or less serious. This one is called the Long March Forward, and I created it with another colleague named Marcus Hildum. And we do things like coordinating, coordinating OS upgrades on all of the systems that we have deployed in production. And we are also really excited about end of life -ing any sort of system or any code. Anytime somebody deletes a substantial feature or chunk of code or shuts down systems that are no longer in use, we award them with what we call the Darwin Award. Uh, because we realize that management is always really excited about pushing, this is the new thing that we're going to build and celebrating. We built this thing, and there's almost never a moment to really celebrate. We destroyed this thing that has caused massive amount of maintenance overhead over the years and wasn't really that profitable and didn't help us that much. Uh, so we kind of took an initiative to celebrate the thing that I think a lot of engineers are actually more excited <laughs> about sometimes because the thing that has been dragging them down and that thorn in the side that they've had for years, uh, it almost never gets kind of celebrated. And uh, the third bullet point is that I have very boring hobbies. So I decided to write my own Unix user land because uh, the Unix user land is this piece of legacy software that has been more or less consistent in its user interface since the 1970s. And I'm really interested in performance and I have this theory that every large corporation has a directory that new guys are told not to run LS in. Uh, I used to work in visual effects and we had internal pipeline utilities that would dump lots and lots of frames of animation into a particular directory. Uh, previously, I've worked in places where everything was on a really slow NFS server and it wasn't that many things, but because it was coming over a network, it was really slow to run LS in. And because I work at a content delivery network, uh, we do storage as a service for other people who decide how they want to organize their data. So we can't be blamed for that directory and I can actually admit to it. Uh, so I was really fascinated in why is LS so slow in these big directories that have millions of files in them? And is there any low hanging fruit in terms of performance? Is there something I can learn from kind of trying to implement my own LS and some other related utilities? Uh, so efficiency was something I was curious about. Uh, how close could I get? Could I approach the efficiency of the LS in GNU core utils? Could I maybe even exceed it? Uh, C++ is a language I'm pretty comfortable with. 
It's reasonably low level. It's kind of like C, which Linux kernel is written in, GNU core utils is written in, and all of that kind of dates to the late 80s or early 90s before C++ was as common as it, as it is now. So if you imagine a next generation GNU project that had been started in the late 90s instead of the late 80s, uh, it probably would have been in C++. So I did that since it's native code, pretty similar to regular core utils. Uh, I'm very lazy, so I only worked on the easiest utilities to implement because as just kind of a hobby project on the weekends, if you can write one in like a day, it gives you instant gratification, which makes it a really fun project. Uh, so I created wutils. Uh, my name is Will, but I named it Worst Utils because that helped me justify uh, not trying to match every feature in GNU. Uh, and then uh, I started doing a bunch of research on the history of some of these utilities and sort of fell down a rabbit hole that I found interesting. So we have this concept of a Unix user land. I need to define Unix and I need to define user land in order to explain what that is. Uh, I'm using a very expansive definition of Unix in this context that includes things like Linux and Minix that don't share code with classic Unix. Uh, reasonable people will disagree with that definition of Unix, but it turns out there is a lot of legacy even though the Linux kernel does not directly share source code with classic Unix. Um, the current version of Linux, even if you build the Linux kernel 5 that just came out uh, on a brand new system today, there is legacy that dates back to really old Unix in terms of design influence and a lot of the supporting utilities. User land, uh, simple utilities are part of it, mostly for historical reasons. Some simple languages like awk are part of it, but languages like Python and Ruby are not because they're newer and they're bigger and much more complex. You don't go to like awkpy to awkpip install modules for awk. So uh, the user land is fairly constrained and simple. And then you have all of this other complex stuff like GUIs, big languages, uh, the init system, which obviously init systems are so simple and boring that nobody would ever bother to like reinvent a new init system that's more complicated and significantly different, different than the legacy 1970s version. I assume. Uh, that's the best joke of this whole talk, and it's all downhill from here. <laughs> um, and in it, uh, the code runs in user space. It's not kernel mode, but it's part of the OS because a user isn't directly interfacing it with it. Uh, things like CP and LS are the user experience or the user interface of a classic non-GUI Unix system. So that's what I was focused on. But like I said, I'm super lazy and I wanted instant gratification. So I just focused on easy stuff. I didn't write languages. I, I didn't write a C compiler. There's people who are way better at that. So I wrote stuff like cat, which shouldn't be interesting, but it kind of turns out that it is. Uh, so I started with false and true, um, which in C, are numerically in that order rather than true and false, because in C, false is zero and true is one. In shell, true is zero and false is one. Uh, the shell and Unix, of course, were created basically the exact same time, but the shell predates C. So they didn't agree with each other for various reasons that made sense to people at the time. And this is a piece of legacy that is completely insane and we just accept. Uh, I just really wanted to point it out because we get used to some of these quirks that a new person approaching the system would be like, but those are literally the exact opposite. False is true and true is false. And it's a very postmodern approach to truthiness. Uh, so anytime that you want to implement your own version of utility, check the documentation. Some of it's good, some of it's terrible. Uh, GNU true is documented as do nothing successfully. Uh, and then return a status code indicating success, which is zero, and then false is do nothing unsuccessfully. Pretty straightforward. So uh, let's evaluate the really early implementation of true. This is the complete implementation of true. Uh, they said that I shouldn't have a lot of code on the slides, but I think you can all grasp this. Uh, it was a shell script that was zero bytes, and because it had no commands in it, none of those commands could fail, and therefore, it returned success, which is true. Um, which you really have to admire the simplicity. You had to spin up the shell interpreter in order to do it. So it took a little RAM that was probably unnecessary. But as an elegant uh, solution, you have to admire it. Uh, then lawyers got involved. So by 1984, this is the implementation of true. Uh, this is the complete implementation of true, circa 1984. It is all copyright text and some source control <laughs> notes. Uh, 
Fun fact, uh, this is less than 512 bytes of copyright notice. So on a 512 byte block file system, which was in use at the time, and the file systems were still mostly implemented in like assembly, so they didn't have really complicated systems for merging inodes together and stuff. Uh, they got this metadata completely for free. It took no extra space. So on some level, this was also a, a, a sort of admirable engineering accomplishment to include all this duplicated data between all the scripts, but in some of them you just got it for free because it was still less than 512 bytes. But GNU uh, in the 80s, they looked at classic Unix and they were like, we can do better, we can be more efficient, spinning up an interpreter is insane. So the GNU true, uh, the current true dates back to 1999 if you check it in GitHub, it's been through <laughs> a surprising number of iterations. Uh, and this is a 31 kilobyte binary, which is about 100 times the size of the shell script that had 300 bytes. And uh, if you note in the comment, uh, true will occasionally return exit failure in the case where writes fail. So GNU, uh, totally unprecedented new feature in true. It was a true that sometimes returns false <laughs> because they added dash dash help. Uh, and if for some reason it failed to write the help output, it would return false. And, and I was really impressed by this sort of new feature, this amazing new approach. So in, in my version of true and false, I was like, I can take this to the next level and make a false that sometimes returns true. <laughs> because if they get to take credit for failing at printing help for a utility that has no features, then I get to take credit for successfully printing the help for a utility that has no features. So if you do dash dash help or dash dash version, uh, it will print out the help text and then I think rightfully claim success. Uh, so uh, having learned from you know, that history, I, I was inspired to create even more features. Uh, and then down at the bottom, there's if exit failure is true, return exit failure. So bin false makes a point of returning true. Uh, because C and shell don't agree on the definitions. Um, and then uh, if you download the slide deck, I've included a bunch of links to things. Uh, there's links to the original source and things like that uh, that you can check out on your own time. Uh, so a couple of other utilities, obviously true and false, pretty minimal. I decided to write my own cat and uh, I, I looked briefly at doing my own DD. I was really interested in the uh, history there, I, I, I didn't actually release a DD with this talk, because uh, it turns out DD doesn't do anything like I thought it did. Uh, so cat, of course, concatenate files and print it to standard output. Uh, there is a famous page called useless use of cat, where if you cat a file and then pipe it to something and only use one file, uh, one of your colleagues will, during code review, tell you you're an idiot because cat is only for concatenating multiple files. Um, of course, they could have just made cat a shell built in and then it wouldn't really matter and the less than, greater than syntax for redirecting a single file wouldn't be more efficient. But in 40 years, nobody has ever bothered. Uh, and then DD, a lot of people learn this as the disk duplicator. When I was first learning uh, Linux and Unix, that's what the utility was explained to me. If you download an ISO image off the internet for like a CD-ROM, uh, you can copy that onto a disk, uh, take an image of a, like a USB flash drive, put it into a file, things like that. Uh, but if you look at the ma man page for DD, it's convert and copy a file. And in the man page for DD, aside from the name DD, convert is the very first word. And that's an important nuance that I think a lot of people don't really notice. So if you look at the whole man page, uh, copy file, converting and formatting according to rules. And most of us don't really use DD for that. Um, and if you scroll down in the man page, the conversion is ASCII and EBCDIC. And as it turns out, the name DD does not stand for disk duplicator or anything like that. The original name comes from JCL, an IBM language on mainframes, and it's for data definitions in JCL because the IBM mainframe guys who were collaborating with the Unix guys needed to trade tapes and stuff sometimes, and in order to be compatible with an IBM system, you needed to use DD to convert the text between different character sets and then write out Nibsidic uh, tape for your IBM using colleagues. And obviously, we don't use a lot of EBCDIC. It still exists. It's probably not super important day-to-day -to, -day to anybody in this room, 
the thing I want to flag about this is that there's this legacy utility that had a very specific use case in the 1970s that nobody intended to use for backing up USB flash drives because USB wouldn't exist for decades that we still use because it turned out to be kind of useful for something it wasn't intended to. And so there's this enormous amount of legacy stuff with character set conversion and this utility that we never use for character set conversion that is still maintained and could still go wrong and stuff. And we're going to revisit how deep a rabbit hole of weird legacy backwards compatibility we can find in the modern stack. Uh, so I just sort of wanted to flag that as part of what is going to be the theme. Uh, cat. Uh, doesn't just concatenate files, whatever it claims, it also has a bunch of conversion and processing stuff. The most interesting thing that I found in the man page when I actually sat down and read the man page for cat is that it'll do line numbers, which most people never bother to read the man page for cat, so they forget that it has all of these extra flags. But that guy in your code review who says cat is only for concatenating multiple files, uh, doesn't use it for line numbers, which is a totally documented valid feature. And you should give them a little guff for that during your next code review. Uh, I, all right, I also found an uh, article on history of cat that goes into a lot more details, and then the useless use of cat file, my cat, an original cat written in assembly because all of the original utilities were written in assembly before the C compiler was stable and they had to do ports. Uh, so the next utility that I wanted to work on was LS. Pretty simple, one of the inspirations for why does this take so long? Uh, getting a little more complex than cat. I didn't focus on implementing every last feature of LS. I uh, wanted to start with just listing files and then the ability to maybe do a long listing where you have to make it actually stat the file to see features about it rather than just looking up the name. I didn't implement all the sort features and stuff like that. LS is thousands of lines long when you actually pick it apart and it's very complicated and doing all of it is uh, surprisingly difficult. But uh, All right, so the WUtils philosophy is to just by start by doing the dumbest, simplest thing and then see what happens because, like I said, very lazy. So uh, I'm using C++, you can use uh, Boost or uh, in C++17, uh, there's a library from Boost for file system access that is part of the core language now, almost. They changed some of the spellings on things just to make it difficult. But it looks like this in either Boost or C++17. Give me a directory iterator for a path, then iterate over the directory, and uh, I, I wanna print it out. Um, it's pretty straightforward. This is for the default invocation of LS, basically equivalent to thousands of lines of C in the GNU Core Utils version. Uh, one thing I will flag, uh, C out has a really bad reputation for performance, uh, but I didn't bother to use printf. Turns out the main reason that C out has a really bad reputation for performance is because it has legacy interlocks for compatibility with printfs because they each hold their own separate buffers. If you disable the backwards compatibility with C so that printf and C out don't intermingle their output by accident, uh, turning off that locking makes the performance just as good as printing out in C. It's fine. Uh, again, there's this legacy that is there by default that if you throw it away, then everything just suddenly starts working faster and it's great. Um, so, uh, next step, benchmark it, figure out like how much slower is this, how, because like obviously going through boost, there's this abstraction layer on top of POSIX, LS is talking directly to low level system APIs. So there's gonna be some cost to using this higher level API. Uh, so timing a directory that has a million files in it just to see how long it takes to run LS. Um, GNU LS uh, is invoked as regular ls without ls dash dash color equals auto. That slows it down a lot because it has to stat every file. So if you want, you know, turbocharge your ls uh, without having to build your own, just unalias ls in the shell uh, and it goes a lot faster. So that took four seconds and then mine using this complicated abstraction layer that's in C++, object oriented, simpler API, but uh, much bigger, uh, 1.4 seconds. It was much, much faster. It was almost four times as fast by doing the dumbest, simplest thing. Uh, so I was like, well, that was disappointing. <laughs> I thought I was gonna have to learn a lot about LS in order to beat it, but that was when I sort of started to learn that a lot of this legacy stuff is not optimal on modern systems, and if you just 
Start by doing the simplest, dumbest thing in a modern system that is designed for modern systems. It just goes faster pretty much for free, and you get these negative cost abstraction layers that, yeah, they're big and they're a bunch of code, and it's a pain to link boost to your application. You have to add include path, but the benefits versus writing 5,000 lines of C from using this abstraction layer are that you wind up with a lot less code, you have a lot less maintenance cost, you have a lot fewer places for bugs, oh, and it just happens to go four times as fast for free. So, great. Uh, so, next step. Make it a little more complicated. I want to add color output to my LS. This seems like, you know, at that point I'm in the big leagues for LS implementations. Uh, and there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, you can blast out ANSI characters. There's these control codes uh, that you can do. Uh, you can check if is a TTY standard out, because uh, you only want to do it if it's interactive, not if you're piping to something. Um, but like, that won't work on Windows. Uh, you can check the term environment variable, which will say which terminal you're using to make some judgments about how to do color and whether or not to do color. And then, like, there's an official library, the TermCap library and a utility called tput that uses it, so you can use that. And then the requirements that I wanted to do was to do color in a correct, portable way. Um, my false works fine on Windows. Uh, there's not a lot of complexity there. So if I can make a totally portable thing that is using just core language features in C++, then ideally it would be a portable thing that'll work on any OS, even if I use something new besides Linux, some other implementation of POSIX. So blasting out ANSI. The core problem with this is little bobby tables. Uh, you're doing in-band signaling. Uh, a terminal intermixes the actual content with the color stuff, and that's kind of grody. Using something like HTML, it's separated out into like CSS, where you can make judgments about colors. And it's not just in band. Uh, there is a standard. Unfortunately, there are several standards. Uh, another XKCD reference. Uh, and the way that color handling is defined it changes between all the revisions of the standard because as systems evolved uh, since 1979, I think the first ANSI color standard was. Uh, systems became able to display more than eight colors, so they had to make some changes. Um, and even if there is a standard, a lot of old terminals had color standards that were common enough to be de facto standards that aren't compatible with the ANSI standards. Uh, Windows support, uh, Windows 10 theoretically does support ANSI colors, but only in like the latest revision of Windows, and if the terminal is running in a certain way, and like not PowerShell, which does colors differently, that's not great. Uh, terminal emulator support even on Linux is super inconsistent, and uh, you can leave the wrong colors because there's this stateful thing where you print out a control code saying become red, and the text printed from that point on is red, and then your application ends, and the terminal doesn't know that your application ended because it just sees a stream of incoming text, and it was never told, return to the default color. So then everything printed after that just remains red because there is this implicit state. It is only stored in the terminal or terminal emulator in the modern world, and uh, you cannot query that state to find out what the color is supposed to be or what it has been changed to, at least not in a consistent way. So. Um, maybe blast out ANSI. Uh, if you check is a TTY, you can avoid breaking some things, and then, like, TTYs really don't exist on Windows, only kind of, sort of, PTYs kind of do. And then, uh, what is a TTY? Turns out that is a TTY, it's a teletype. Checking the term variable, uh, this is something a lot of applications do, and it's why so many command line utilities break weirdly when you use a different terminal emulator, and some, like, oh, it doesn't give you color out? It gives me color output on my system. Oh, are you using a slightly different revision? Oh, you set it to xterm 256 color instead of xterm color. Uh, Linux, uh, rather than xterm, things like that. Uh, there's also a separate color term variable, separate from the term variable, that you can use to decide if you want to do color. So, uh, you cannot make rational judgments about how to output color based on those variables. It is a, not merely a very difficult thing, it is impossible, partly because modern terminals like console or GNOME terminal that you're likely to be using just claim to be X term because everybody just gave up on using m newer versions of the term variable because it didn't work anyway, so why bother uh, continuing with it? Um, I've been writing this in C++, like for file system access, there was this convenient library boost that did file system stuff and I could write like two lines of code and it worked great. Uh, is there a great library for C++ that will just sort of handle this and who cares how it works? No, 
No, not at all. Uh, there's some that claim to. There's some that kind of seem to under some circumstances. One of the ones that I kind of like the API for that I found on GitHub that shall rename, remain blameless, blameless uh, use term cap, but it only looked in one directory, but not all the directories. So it understood uh, x term dash color as your term environment variable, but if your environment variable was set to x term or x term dash 256 color, it would just fail horribly and think it wasn't allowed to do color output, uh, despite the fact that x term 256 color loves color output even more than x term color, uh, because there's this legacy of files being divided in different directories, and if you try and roll your own thing to parse all of it out, you're, you're going to screw it up because it's massively complicated. Um, so you use term cap. Uh, well, it's not portable. It's not something that really exists on Windows, but it exists on Linux. It's pretty stable. It's mature. Um, you can use a utility called tput that uses this term cap library. Um, it's a demonstration of the tput set f2 uh, uh, that makes green text set f5 that makes magenta text and then set f3 according to the documentation outputs yellow text that's not yellow though <laughs> so what is documented has very little relationship to what actually happens here's a wikipedia guide to color keys in certain ANSI APIs and what they tend to come out as with certain things. So it's a real crapshoot like what color you're actually going to output when you try and output a particular color. Because th th this table goes off the screen further. That's not even a full screenshot. And that just says Ubuntu as one of the columns. There's a lot of terminal emulators on Ubuntu and I don't even know which one they're claiming that is for. Uh, so. I mentioned this term cap database. Uh, that's a thing. What's, what's that? Uh, thousands of files referencing different terminals uh, that you will never use, that you've never seen, that you will never encounter. None of your users will ever SSH to your machines using. Uh, I found almost 3,000 files in user shared term info. Uh, but remember how I said there was that library that failed when you set it to X term? That big path with thousands of files isn't big enough to cover X term, which is a reasonably common version because everything claims to be an X term, even if it's not. Uh, tons of legacy. Uh, so one of the things that you can do using the information from this term cap database, uh, you can use STTY, which is a related thing for setting your teletype configuration settings. Uh, you can put GNOME terminal or console into uppercase only mode as a legacy compatibility mode to terminals that did not support lowercase. So that works fine. Color doesn't work yet. Um, legacy hardware that you won't use. And uh, I, I sort of fell down a rabbit hole trying to understand how far does this legacy rabbit hole go. <laughs> this is a photo of Buffalo Bill, who became famous uh, during the 1800s for his Wild West show. Um, OK, don't worry. There is not an entry in the term cap database that goes back to the 1800s. Um, but it goes back pretty far. Uh, it goes back to 1963. Now, those of you who are Unix historians will note that zero started in 1970. You can only represent 1963 with a signed time value because this is from before Unix existed, and obviously decades before Linux existed. Uh, but when Unix was first being developed, uh, the guys who were working on it got the crappy old terminals that were hand-me-downs from the more important work. Uh, so they got the very first ASCII terminals that only supported uppercase. Consequently, like Unix v6 boots by default into only uppercase mode, and in GNOME terminal, you can still flip it to uppercase only mode for compatibility with a 1963 terminal. Uh, if you set term equals TTY 33, that still works. The term cap database will look up the valid control codes for using it. And if you had this terminal connected to a machine and SSH'd to any Linux box in the cloud that you provisioned five minutes ago, it will still work and have valid control codes for talking to this TTY model 33. Uh, the ASCII standard, originally created in 1963, did not get upper, uh, uppercase and lowercase differentiated until 1968. So, uh, this was the beta version of ASCII uh, that we still have backwards compatible support for. And this is why color is hard. Um, so the 1968 version of ASCII, it got adopted as uh, standards get 
lots of names. It's got a CCIT, CCCIT version number and things like that. Uh, one of the names for this spec is ITA5. Uh, that was when they added the lowercase. Uh, to flip your GNOME terminal, uh, set STTY L case. And just to point this out, if you run LS, you get this mojibake gibberish stuff with characters it doesn't recognize. That's not a problem with uppercase versus lowercase. That's a problem with color. If you unalias ls so it's not trying to output color, the uppercase output works fine. <laughs> so <laughs> in 2019, we have perfect support for uppercase only terminals, but outputting color will put the uh, gibberish that's all misaligned and has weird characters in it. Uh, so that's neat and 100% not useful to anybody. Uh, so I mentioned that it was ITA5 is the adopted version of ASCII. There were ITA versions one through four that came before ASCII. Uh, the ASCII is a seven bit code, uh, which causes all sorts of problems with needing to like UU encode to go through uh, not eight bit clean systems with old protocols. Uh, it is a seven bit code because the code that preceded it, the old versions were five bit codes. And that terminal there is a World War II era system using ITA2, which is a precursor to ASCII that evolved in a very linear line to ASCII. Uh, it is made by the Teletype Corporation, the same as that TTY33 that we maintain backwards compatibility for in Linux to this day. It ran at 45.5 baud, uh, which is impressively fast for, uh, for World War II, given that you know a home user would still be using 300 baud modem in the 80s. And uh, I found a video on YouTube where somebody had made a USB adapter to go from USB to a <laughs> World War II era TTY-19 uh, because the serial protocol is so consistent between these really early systems. The serial ports used for modern computers were directly inspired by these clocked serial protocols that used a single wire, wire for data exactly the same as RS-232. Uh, this dates back to before we really talked about these things in binary terms. So instead of one, you have mark as a signal because you didn't plug it into a computer and you weren't going to do math with it yet because nobody had a, math, a computer that worked with a terminal interactively. Uh, and with uh, passive components, you don't need a microcontroller or anything to do the character set conversion. If you set your Linux box to uppercase only mode, uh, you can build a very dumb adapter that does not require a processor, does not require any CPU power to convert between the character sets and still use this as a terminal on a modern system. Uh, this predates the information age. This predates stored program computing. Uh, this predates uh, Shannon's uh, limits for signal processing. <laughs> And it still works fine. I've seen it happen on YouTube. Uh, so ITA1 is the ultimate original version of this ITA code series of character sets that we can trace ASCII back to with some compatibility. Um, carriage return and line feed only originated in 1901, but uh, the code was originally developed in 1870 uh, by a man named Monsieur Baudot, he was French, uh, and his name is where we get the word baud from because he invented this clocked serial communication almost exactly to RS-232 uh, that we would use today uh, and the number of bits per second that it would use uh, was something that he invented. Prior systems didn't have that kind of consistent clock the way we would use today on a serial communication system. Uh, fun facts, uh, ITA1 had a bell symbol. So if you've ever wondered, gee, why does ASCII have letter ding? It's because on the original international telegraph alphabet, they had a ding that you could ring a bell so a guy could come into the room to see a message get printed on a paper tape by one of the really early typing systems. Uh, it also has a null character. Uh, you'll note the keyboard. The keys are helpfully labeled in the super logical order 45123 because uh, you use the three keys there with your right hand, two keys with your left hand, and then you just had to chord binary. You had to memorize the binary code for everything and just know the combinations. And null was if you didn't have any keys pressed. The original interpretation of null was I'm, I'm not sending anything. If you didn't have any keys pressed, it wouldn't send any high voltage signals down the line and it would just be waiting at low voltage. That's not something that is a useful representation in ASCII, but the null character in ASCII is still all zeros so that you can send nothing down a serial line and just leave it as low voltage. 
Uh, that's where this comes from. Um, and because you could input totally arbitrary binary sequences on the original version of the 1870s keyboard, while the character set didn't officially define carriage return or new line or anything like that, you could enter the codes from the later 1901 revision of the spec on the 1870 keyboard. So if you connected this through an adapter that did voltage conversion and character set conversion, you could enter a command like ls and then enter the code for new line and this would still work with a modern system if you set TTY33 as your term variable while you were SSHing. So uh, yeah, I just took you back to 1870 for uh, what you can get to work with term cap more or less with some passive electronics but not needing to write any drivers, use a microcontroller or do any really exotic things because of the backwards compatibility support that's still there. Uh, and this picture of Buffalo Bill that I found on Wikipedia is undated. It's fairly clear, so it's plausible that it was from the 20th century, and this picture of Buffalo Bill is actually decades newer than the oldest thing that you could use as a terminal on a modern Linux box. This is why my LS implementation does not support color. It's impossible. Even if you use LS uh, with weird modes like I showed, you just get weird gibberish in your terminal. There is no good way to do it. We have failed as a people uh, with centuries to work on the problem. Literally, it goes back to the 1800s. Uh, all right, so uh, that is my whirlwind tour of LS. One of the other utilities that I wanted to work on was CP. Right? You want to copy a file, that's a pretty simple thing to do. Uh, so. The uh, standard file system is the API that I use for my LS implementation. Uh, works great, I tested that. Um, there is a method file system copy underscore file. Works great, totally follows the WUtils philosophy of do the simplest thing because this is just a weekend hobby project for fun. Uh, but I already told you just use standard file system or boost file system to do things with the file system if you're going to do it. So repeating that for CP is like, it's not fun, it's cheating. So uh, there is a lower level interface that is only Linux specific and it's a lot more interesting um, called send file, uh, which the C++ standard file system method and send file, which is a Linux specific API, invert the order of source and dest. Uh, because in all the years that we've had Unix, we've never agreed which order the source and the destination go in when you're copying files, depending on what you're doing. So that's fun. Um, also, just kind of a random fact, one of the things that you send is the size of the file to that function. Uh, the size of the file is an off T type rather than a size T. It's not an offset. Uh, so everything is backwards and all the types are wrong. But it goes fast and it's an interesting thing and it gives me an excuse to kind of talk about some storage stuff. So if you time uh, my really simple versions that are each one line long, uh, with send file you have to open the file yourself and then send file handles to the send file API. With the standard file system API you just send file names so it's a little simpler. There's a couple extra lines in the uh, send file version that are trimmed from the slide. Um, second and a half to copy a gigabyte file with new CP and then uh, half or two thirds, uh, 0 0.8 seconds using the really simple dumb ways that are not thousands of lines long. Uh, and fun quirk I noticed during the testing, GNU CP takes a lot longer uh, if the file already exists. Um, so the less important the work is, the longer it takes because you've already copied the file and you're doing it over and over while you're testing your thing to prepare for a talk, uh, it just starts slowing down if you don't delete it yourself between the runs. Uh, that, I don't 100% understand why, but GNU CP has a lot of different modes for compatibility with different scenarios, and it will do things in extents if you have sparse files and things, and the existence of the file that you're copying over, uh, it's not just the amount of time to remove the file and then copy over it, it overthinks it and makes bad choices. Um, so, how does storage work? Wh what's going on with this copy? Uh, you've seen that I am in the software lifecycling community where I have an interest in legacy, uh, I have an interest in performance. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a complete history of storage that is 100% as in-depth as my history of terminals. Uh, 
There is rust that gets dizzy and not. This is my complete history of storage devices. And as a first order approximation, when you're trying to write performant code, this is 99.99% .99 of everything that you need to know. Um, hard drives, there is a magnetic domain. It goes in a circle and the iron oxide gets dizzy with tapes. Uh, there's iron oxide on a tape and it goes in a circle on a different axis and seeking to your data takes a lot longer. Historically, there was drum memory, which uh, rather than being a disc that went in a circle, it was a cylinder and it went in a circle and the rest got dizzy and it takes a long time for it to come around to the other side of the circle because it's a mechanical device. Everything else, uh, SSDs that use NAND flash, NOR flash, 3D crosspoint, battery backed RAM, basically all the same thing from a programming perspective because there is not a physical device going in a circle that you have to wait for it to come back around because if you're anything like me, you are unlucky. And that means that the data that you want is at the wrong point in the circle and you're going to have to wait a very long time for it to come around. When it's in chips, it's fine. So uh, what does that mean for performance terms if you're trying to actually take away something useful other than Buffalo Bill pictures from this talk? Well. For dizzy rust, uh, find busy work in your software. Uh, regardless of whether it's tape or disk, uh, they're different by orders of magnitude, but it's fundamentally the same thing. When you issue a read, you're telling the kernel, go do this, and then if you wait for it doing nothing, you're going to have to wait for a little piece of rust to work its way around, and maybe multiple times if there's a bunch of indirection in the file system and things like that. And if you dispatch that into some sort of a background process, you can find some other work to do. Like if you're looking for copying multiple files, you can background the read of the first file and go looking for the second file, things like that, depending on the exact application. What busy work you can find while you're doing an asynchronous read will vary. But generally speaking, if your rest gets dizzy, find busy work because you're gonna have to wait for it. Uh, and use big buffers, use lots and lots of memory. The memory is faster than the disk. So if you can dedicate some RAM to things like page cache, it's gonna work a lot better. And uh, copying between buffers is a lot faster than copying out to disk. So even if you're wasting a bunch of RAM and you're wasting a bunch of CPU cycles copying between buffers in RAM, like who cares? If you can avoid some disk because you're ordering things to be more efficient, totally worth it. For other, avoid busy work. Uh, get to it. You do not have to wait for a piece of rust to go around a circle and complete a rotation. So while yes, there is latency on SSDs, uh, it's really interesting how much there is, depends on the controller, depends on the connection, whether it's SATA or SAS or NVMe, things like that. All super important when you're getting super into the weeds, but generally speaking, it's going to be so fast that if you are spinning up a background thread just for a single read job, the cost of spinning up a new thread is going to exceed the value of the interlocks and waiting for it and doing this and doing that and going, oh, are you done? Am I done? Because it will be done and then you will just have all of this overhead of spinning up a thread, creating a new buffer and coordinating locking between all of it. So just do it and then crucially avoid copies. And that explains why send file is so much faster than GNU CP. Because send file is not implemented in the C standard library. It is actually implemented in the kernel. The way GNU CP works, you say, kernel, please give me the data in this file. And the kernel reads the file. Ideally, it's already in page cache. Maybe it has to go to the disk. You don't actually care, but it gets into page cache. It gets copied from page cache into your address space. You go, great. And then you probably copy it into another buffer in your address space. And then you go, kernel, here's that thing you gave me. You can have it back, but put it in a different file now. So you've got three copies that it goes through where you round trip it from page cache to your application to a destination buffer back to kernel. On the other hand, with send file, because you're saying, kernel, I don't want any of this. You deal with it. The kernel copies from one place in the page cache to another place in the page cache, and then it gets flushed out to disk. There's only one copy. That's a third as many copies. I'm bad at math, but a third is less. As a result, it goes a lot faster. And whenever you're dealing with non-mechanical storage, you always want to avoid copies because while your SSD is much slower than your memory bus, you ideally want to use your memory bus for other things than just a bunch of unnecessary copies, particularly if you're using NUMA systems, which you may not be on your development workstation or your laptop, but 
Secretly, you will be on your machine in the cloud when you ship code to run somewhere in Amazon. They're big systems with multiple CPUs, so you may wind up having to copy data between physical nodes in a NUMA system. Uh, and if you just do anything to avoid those copies, then they're free. Because anything you don't do doesn't take any time to execute. No, yeah, that's... It got bored. I talked too long. <laughs> Uh, all right, so takeaways. Uh, you've learned a lot about Buffalo Bill. Uh, he lived until 1917, uh, which it turns out is long enough that he was aware of the first tank battles in 1916 during World War I, and people drove, drove Model T Fords to his funeral. Um, and he makes an interesting metaphor. Uh, it was kind of silly to put a picture of him in the presentation because he has nothing to do with this. But he is a guy that we conceptually imagine being purely in this period of the Old West, uh, as if he just stopped existing when the 20th century happened. And he actually lived well into World War I. He was aware of aerial combat with fighter planes happening in the European theater. He was aware of tank battles. He was aware of all of this stuff that we don't think of somebody from the Wild West in the 1800s knowing about. And uh, that serves as a good <laughs> metaphor for the fact that backwards compatibility is a nightmare of Love Lovecraftian knot that takes you back to the Stone Age if you keep following the thread and will haunt you forever. Uh, because literally, in 1870, there were still parts of the United States that... Uh, had Indian tribes that were unconquered and they were literally Stone Age people because they didn't have large infrastructure for spelting iron or making bronze. So when I took you back to the 1870s in parts of California, I literally technically took you back to the Stone Age. Um, so in-band signaling is always wrong. I always want to emphasize that it is the reason for SQL injection. It is the reason that color is hard in terminals. It is the reason that there are exploits in SCP protocol. Unfortunately, the bullet point right after that is that in-band signaling is inevitable because we need to maintain backwards compatibility with these legacy systems. And if we have a signal, we will use it. So one of the takeaways is if you are going to be doing in-band signaling that could potentially be mixed in with your actual data be thoughtful about how you use your metadata because, like the metaphor of Buffalo Bill, it will be around way longer than you think. And like DD, it will be used for things you did not expect. And you will make someone's life terrible. All right, uh, in-band signaling is inevitable. Uh, the cheapest code to maintain is also the fastest code to run, is also not code. Anytime that you can delete some complicated legacy system, some complicated legacy infrastructure, uh, delete a bunch of code from your application, uh, that can no longer make your test suite fail. That can no longer get stuck waiting for I.O. That can no longer be the cause of a vulnerability because you're doing in-band signaling. Uh, on and on, uh, whenever you can use a really simple solution, that will always be better. Um, don't be afraid of code that runs on a computer. For a lot of this stuff, writing C++, even though that's theoretically a super low-level language that's very scary, uh, you can use super high-level APIs that aren't that bad to use in practice, and you can have very compact code if you're not chasing hyper-specific APIs and super-specific uh, things and trying to handle every edge case in C++. A lot of times, just running code on a computer is pretty easy and pretty efficient. And then, uh, yeah, just when in doubt, prefer simple solutions. All right, so that is my talk. That is my tour through uh, the weird history of uh, some things that I learned uh, while I was implementing my own user land. And uh, you've been exposed to more legacy than you ever needed or wanted to. So uh, are there any questions? So on your journey, do you ever look at, on your wild, wild journey, do you ever look at BusyBox? Uh, yes, I, I'm aware of it, and it's super cool on embedded systems. I didn't specifically dig into the history of it or benchmark my stuff against it. But uh, yeah, GNU Core Utils is definitely not the only available implementation of any of this user land stuff. Um, BusyBox works great, probably uh, better than GNU in some cases because it is more recent as well. Um, how do you disable the C out printf 
the legacy support and why isn't that a default? Ah, because legacy. Um, when C++ was first becoming popular, everybody had legacy code bases in C and if you started using this cool new C++ library but you got gibberish, it would theoretically result in sort of like if you had two threads outputting to the same pipe, you would get intermingled output from the C out buffer and the printf buffer. Um, so nobody would have adopted C++ at the time if they had done that. And now we're stuck with it probably forever maybe. Uh, how do you disable it? Uh, there is a link in the slide deck. Uh, if you, uh, I, I've got a link to the slide deck on my website. Uh, if you go to willrosecrans.com, uh, it's up there. Uh, in, I, I clicked through a couple of slides that had just links uh, on the slides and one of them is a uh, link to that and you can see me use it in the WTILS repository which is also a link from my website. Um, it's like two lines of codes, it's actually really simple, you just don't do this and then it doesn't, it goes faster, it's great. Uh, so, so DD copies files and CP copies files too, Wh why do we need to? Uh, because DD converts and formats files and incidentally happens to uh, copy them. Uh, the reason that DD is sort of really still popular is that, so IBM mainframes uh, mainly used fixed record sizes for all of their data formats. So DD has a bunch of settings for reading a certain number of bytes and block sizes and offsets and things for doing all of its manipulations with its character set conversion, assuming that you need to convert to only uppercase EBCDIC. Uh, that's an interesting latent legacy that dates back to IBM's use of punch cards where you would allocate a certain number of rows on the punch card and then when they moved to electronic systems they sort of adopted that for their default data format uh, with fixed record lengths. As a result, when you were trying to interface with hardware, you could say read from this device file because in Unix everything is a file and read exactly one megabyte and that ability to set alignments, block sizes, uh, buffer sizes, things like that, doesn't exist in CP. Could, nobody ever added it because we had DD uh, long after we stopped using it for converting between uppercase and lowercase uh, and it was useful. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, how you're able to uh, write programs with more efficient uh, C++ libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, was it, is it uh, don't those libraries, don't some of those libraries also have a lot of legacy code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so something like the Boost file system library, Boost itself is massive. Uh, it's a ton of different libraries. Some of the libraries in Boost haven't been touched since C++ 11 and if you try and use like Boost graph library, you're gonna party like it's 1999, man. It's great fun. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. So this is a crazy project, uh, if, you, if no one's told you directly, and you mentioned that you reduced the scope to be able to get enough here to show us uh, at, at the top of the presentation. So are you done? Do you have more plans? Uh, what's next? Um, not done. It's a fun thing to tinker with now and then. Uh, at some point I would very much like to write my own shell or something like that. It's a big project to try and tackle all of what makes up user land. But you know, if you pick at it one by one on a weekend uh, over time, uh, I'm sure I will wind up adding more to it. Um, I probably won't bother to write a C compiler because the GCC guys have been working on that for decades and they're still not done. There was a question back here somewhere. Oh, nope, I guess we're done. Well, thank you very much, Will. That was very entertaining and uh, informative. Thank you all. And if you stick around for half an hour, you'll get the next round of talks, which I believe is about fast string processing with HTTP.
Hi, everyone. Okay, I think we have a quorum here, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the developer track here at Scale. 
uh, this afternoon. We have Femmes talking to us. Uh, Femmes talking to us about uh, working in serverless and GraphQL to build reliable and scalable apps. Uh, I will take Q and A at the end. Bring around the mic so everybody gets a chance to be heard. Uh, but beyond that, let's take it away, Tommy. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, let me just set up my mic. Can can everyone hear me? All right, cool. Um, uh, great to be here. Uh, this is my first scale, uh, and uh, I was looking at the schedule today, and I saw I saw that there's something called game night. I'm going to be here at every scale now. That's that's game night. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about building. Um, applications that are kind of resilient and scalable out of the box, um, exploiting GraphQL and serverless as a way to kind of architect such applications easily. Um, it's a fairly simple idea. It's just kind of a neat way of putting things together. Um, before I get started, just to quickly sample the audience, um, how many of us are front-end developers? How many of us are back-end developers? <laughs> how many of us are... Um, not de application developers, but more on the DevOps and the sysadmin side of things. All right, y'all are gonna have a rough time. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, all right. So I'll start off with a quick intro. Okay, wait, no, wait. I forgot to ask. Um, how many of you have heard of GraphQL? All right. How many of you have used GraphQL already? Cool. All right. This will be a good intro. And how many of you have uh, used serverless uh, functions as a service? All right. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so quick intro um, about myself. Uh, I am Tanmay. I am. Uh, I created a open source project called Hasura, um, and we created a company around that uh, a while back, which is Hasura.io. We're a fairly young open source project, but fairly um, rapidly growing. Um, and um, and and we work in this kind of GraphQL and um, quote unquote serverless space. So um, to kind of motivate the the problem that we have, uh, in a way, is if you if you think about putting together an application on the putting together a full application, right? The traditional architecture that you might have, um, which is probably what you won't have at scale, but what you might have initially when you start doing things and when you move from like monolith to services, is that you have a front end app, and this talks to an API, and the API kind of talks to multiple other services, right? So the API, for example, talks to a database or the API talks to a payment service, or uh, you know, in a, I'm, I'm talking about like a food delivery app. Um, it talks to maybe a restaurant service to, um, to figure out if the restaurant is open or can take delivery, can take orders or not. Um, and then maybe to a delivery service that has complicated business logic for figuring out how we should actually assign the delivery person um, and do the delivery, right? So, so this is kind of like, this is what you might have. Um, and, and, and this will start becoming a problem very quickly, and you will start missing, or at least, I would start missing the monolith um, as soon as, because you're kind of creating more services. So obviously you need to start worrying about, um, it's, it's not really scalable, uh, it's not really as scalable as you thought it would be, right? You have to worry about scaling each of these services independently, or the scalability of your API server actually depends on the scalability of these other services. So it's not like you've got API being scalable for free. Um, if you think about it being resilient, uh, that also became more of a challenge than when you just had a monolith. Uh, you now are dependent on every single network link. Let's say, for example, the restaurant microservice fails. Um, do you roll back the payment? Do you, you can't, you can't, you can't undo, you can undo a database transaction, what, but you can't undo an API call, right? Uh, and, and, and so kind of building in that resilience after you have the setup, uh, when you realize that there are arbitrary network failures, is, is a bit of a pain, right? Um, and also, microservices are a little bit 2015 now. So, so maybe we can maybe we can do something new, right? Uh, so so one of the first things when people start to think about um, making things more scalable or more resilient is uh, to kind of async as many things as you can, right? So that at least failures that happen are not synchronous. Um, and and you you when you do this, that the expression on the on the things face is exactly the expression that you end up with because asyncing all the things is not is not fun. Um, but if you async stuff, this is kind of what things might look like, right? You have an app. The app talks to an API. Um, now, the API kind of talks to, I'm calling it a database, but it's basically your state, right? Um, and does some operations on the state, um, which atomically kind of creates events uh, that are captured. And then these events get delivered to services. Um, and then these services asynchronously process stuff. 
um, and maybe write back to a stateful layer, right? So they don't, again, don't have to write back to the same database, but state, right? So, so they kind of, events get triggered, things happen, you write back to state, right? So, um, and so instead of kind of synchronously talking to multiple services, uh, you asynchronously talk to other services, right? Um, and this is the kind of, this is the first step towards setting up an async architecture. And this is nice because, because you have a persistent kind of event system um, and you're persisting your state, you're getting resiliency kind of, um, you're, you're building in resiliency into your system because if something fails, if there's a network transient failure or a, um, or, or a hard failure, then you basically have, as long as you've captured events, you can, uh, you can theoretically kind of redo things again, right? Uh, and, and, and that's kind of the first step. So uh, in, in that light, and, and there, there's, there, is, there are still problems with this, and we'll come back to that later. But in, in that light, if we think about, before I trip on this, um, if you think about serverless, or when I say serverless, I, I mean functions as a service. Um, I don't mean the CNCF definition of serverless, which is a little bit complicated. But um, the, the simpler definition of serverless, which is just the functions as a service piece, is, um, and let's take a look at what that is for those of you who have not used serverless or functions as a service. Um, you write a small function, uh, typically in a language like Node.js. Um, this is where most of the serverless action is. Uh, and so you write like a small function. This function, uh, when it runs, responds with a JSON that contains hello world, right? Uh, that's it. I just write the function. I don't do anything else. Uh, and then um, you have a cloud vendor or a serverless vendor or your on-prem vendor. You have some tooling. Um, you use that tool to say, deploy this function, call it hello world, and trigger this function every time there's an HTTP call. So attach it to an HTTP endpoint. Uh, and so as soon as you run that command, what you get is you get an HTTP endpoint. Every time you call that HTTP endpoint, an event will be triggered by your vendor, the, or the cloud vendor, which will then kind of trigger this serverless function. Uh, it'll provision the resources to kind of create this function um, and, uh, and, and run this function, and then take the response and then send it back to you, right? So as soon as you do this, you can curl that endpoint and you get a response back, right? Um, this, is, this is the serverless experience. Uh, this is scalable, uh, quote unquote, because you don't have to deal uh, and, and you don't actually get to deal with anything. You don't, uh, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about what happens when there are a thousand invocations of the function. Because when there are a thousand invocations of the function, um, there are a thousand instances of these functions that run, right? But this kind of scalability that you get where you don't have to do any of the underlying operations of kind of maintaining an API server because it's just a function, or the freedom that you get when you don't have underlying VMs to manage for those servers, for those servers or containers to manage. Um, and when you don't have to worry about this, you kind of think that um, it's freedom where you just get to write code and you just get to deploy. Um, but this is, this, is not really, this is not really freedom. This is, it's, it's weird because it's, you're forcing the developer that's writing code to not do things that they would have done when they were writing a traditional API server, right? So you can't do global variables. You can't think about what happens when there are concurrent requests to the same function. There is no, you, you cannot, there is no state. There is, there is no mechanism for you to actually capture state across invocations of the same function. Um, and so when you take that out of the function, obviously that function is scalable. So it's not, it's not, it's not magical, it's not even special. Um, it's just the fact that there's a little piece of code that runs, and each piece of code runs independently, um, and that's it. But in a sense, it's freeing if you have an architecture around it, um, because you kind of get to scale for free, which means that you're not really thinking about, I guess the font sizes might be a little bit small, um, but you get to scale for free because you don't actually have to worry about uh, managing infrastructure, you don't have to worry about um, monitoring infrastructure to, to figure out how to scale stuff. Um, and, um, and, and as a developer, you get almost end-to-end -end ownership of, of the entire life cycle of your business logic, right? You write the code, you deploy the code, the code will work, the code will scale forever. If something, um, if something happens, I own the code, I change the code, I redeploy it, um, I still get complete ownership, uh, and, uh, and, and because there is no ops, things are happening for free. Uh, I, I'm using a lot of air quotes because all of this comes at a cost. Um, where this mental model is weird, right? So it's kind of like the way I think of the way I think of serverless functions is that it's kind of like nano services. The reason why we move from a monolith to microservice, um, for me, the way I think about this is that it's not just about it's with monoliths. 
monolith scale, Facebook, uh, and hence nobody can argue with that, right? But um, but it's it's that ownership doesn't scale, right? And that's the reason why you chunk out into so into having different microservices that the management or the 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 ownership that you have of this entire code base across a large org will not scale. And so it's easier to think of ownership when you break it up into services, right? Um, and if you perhaps take that line of thought to an extreme, you, you get serverless functions where it's complete, like it's hyper ownership. Um, and this developer doesn't need to talk to anybody else uh, and just does their own work inside a little block of code, uh, manages, and manages it end to end entirely, right? So, um, and so you sort of get freedom uh, and you sort of get scalability, right? And for the purpose of this talk, we'll call this being scalable. Uh, we'll, we'll, come back to this. we'll come back to more aspects later. Um, resiliency around this is also very interesting because of the model, the model that a serverless function has is that when the serverless function is running, it's not, it's not something that is running already that is kind of auto-scaling up and down. The thing doesn't exist, and it is called into existence when there's an event, right? The, the idea of it being event-driven is is built into um, is built into the paradigm, right? And um, I mean, for better or worse. And and what that allows us to do is is think about making our serverless functions resilient um, fairly easily. Because if you think about it, um, each function think of each function as just being ephemeral because it is, uh, and and it doesn't have any knowledge of state, right? And if it doesn't have any knowledge of state, you have to trigger them when certain things happen. So you trigger them on events. So technically, if you can replay events, or you can retry them, or whenever failures happen, or whenever there's a back off, or whatever you want to do, you should be able to build in um, at least a certain amount of resiliency uh, whenever there are transient failures, right? It comes at the cost of you having to think about your serverless function being idempotent, uh, which means that if I try it multiple times, things should still work, which is a problem, but which is kind of sort of what you already, which you have to do when you have an event-driven system anyway, right? Um, and, and, and the tooling is getting better to, to not have to worry about this so much. But, but in a sense, because each function by itself can't do much, and each function is triggered on an event, if you can persist events and replay events, you should be able to move towards it being resilient. And, and a combination of it being resilient and it being scalable by the cloud vendor. So as a developer now, I don't have to care about the ops of anything, right? Technically, it should just always keep working. Um, and I can ignore all kinds of transient failures. Um, and so, and so, so when you think about, so when you think about writing your code in serverless functions, you're getting some sort of resiliency and scalability out of the box, right? You're not, you're not explicitly thinking about it. Uh, you're not explicitly adding it to your application after you've built the application. So let's take a food ordering app as an example, right? Um, if this is our state, this is our model that is there somewhere in the state, right? It's not, it's not necessarily a table that has multiple columns. It's it's the abstract data model that we have in our state, right? Um, and so this order, this order object, has um, is created by a particular user, has a validation state. Once the order is validated, it has a payment state. Um, once it's paid for, you know, it's approved. You check whether the restaurant is open or whatever, or maybe you check that before. Doesn't matter. Um, and then you check if you want to assign a delivery agent to it, and you assign the agent to it, right? So this this order object is going through various states. Um, and if you think about, um, and if you think about doing all of this business logic with serverless functions, the, the way you might want to think about it is that you think about your entire business logic as state machine, right? So you have a new order, um, and where all of these kind of validation state, paid state, approval state, um, delivery person state is all false. Then you run a serverless function uh, that does the order validation, and so the state changes to validated equal to true, and maybe some other stuff. Um, again, apologies for the font size, but um, if you can just make out that the blue is changing to red, that's kind of one state change, right? And similarly, you can kind of keep going through state changes. So the next serverless function comes in, does your payment stuff, or validates that the payment is done, does the approval stuff, um, runs some machine learning algorithm to figure out who the right delivery person for, for you is um, based on your rating, um, based on your entire life history, uh, and, then, and then kind of assigns a delivery person to you based on their entire life history. Uh, and then, and then you kind of move to this final state where the order is being uh, is being processed and is actually being sent to you, right? So, so, so that's kind of 
so, so if you have your state and you have a mechanism to trigger serverless functions whenever there are state changes, um, and your serverless functions will drive those state changes, right? Um, so that's kind of one way to think about running your business logic with serverless functions um, for, your, for, your, for your application logic, right? The, the cost of setting up the system is that you get to write code inside serverless functions easily, but the cost is that you need to build a generic event system that captures events well, that delivers events well, right? Um, and if you have this generic event system, either you might have it or you might use a tool like Hasura, what? But you might also, but, but you can set it up yourself, you can do a bunch of things, um, the cloud vendors are doing this tooling, right? Um, and, and so if you have like a good eventing system, um, which is generic, uh, and a good event capture system, which is generic or which works for your use case, um, you should be able to start moving stuff to serverless functions fairly easily, right? There is, there is another cost to this, um, which we'll come to, uh, but at a high level, just to kind of make this clear for, to, to kind of just draw, put the two architectures side by side, you had the kind of earlier architecture where there were service level dependencies uh, between your API service and other microservices, and now you've taken the back portion of it. We, we're still not talking about the front end app yet, and that's where the problem is. Um, but you've taken that kind of back end portion of it and converted it to an event driven system where things or your APIs or your services are triggered asynchronously whenever events happen, right? The problem is that whenever stuff happens on the back end, right? How does the front end, how does a front end app know what, is, what has happened, right? And this has historically always been the problem with doing stuff asynchronously. Um, and you can replace front end app with any client, right? The, it's, it's great, it's great to say that we're making things asynchronous, but it's very painful for the end user or the developer that's building the experience for the end user to consume asynchronous information. Because finally, on my application, I need to see the state changes that happen as well, or maybe some representation or abstraction of the state changes that need to happen on my app, right? Um, and so when stuff is happening asynchronously on the back end, how do, I, how do I get that info on the app, right? Because the app is designed to make an API call, the API call does 10 things, and I get a response, and then I just show that response, right? But now, I did an action that forked off a bunch of things. When am I gonna get the API response? How am I gonna show that final thing on the app, right? Um, and it's, it's painful. And which kind of leads us into talking a little bit about GraphQL. So, so that, that final piece, uh, we're, going to, we're going to try to see, um, or we're gonna see how GraphQL is going to be helpful. So before we do that, we need to understand uh, or take a little bit of a mm, introduction into what GraphQL is, right? So uh, back in the day, from my point of view, uh, we were all using REST APIs, right? Um, and so this is maybe what a REST API looked like. Forget everything I said about the backend, and now let's come to the app and the API. Ignore what the API does. So let's say I'm building a user profile page on my app. If I'm building a user profile page on my app, and I make an API call to fetch the user info, uh, let's say I fetch the ID and the name. So I do slash API slash user, ID equals one. I get a re JSON response that says um, ID is one, name is Elmo. I render this on my, on my page, it's great. But then tomorrow I realize that we want to make the user profile page a little bit richer. Um, so let's add, let's add more information here. I also want to show the last, the last known address for this user on their profile page. So then I make another API call um, to fetch um, slash address user ID equals one. So I'm making two API calls, and then I get that information and I show it on my app. And this is not ideal, because um, in, this, in this toy example, I was making two API calls, but in a, in a more serious example, you might be making five or six API calls, right? Um, and, and as a room full of backend developers, you all are not very empathetic to front-end developers, uh, right? Because this might sound like it's not a problem, but this is a huge problem for a front-end developer, because writing, API calls, um, and, and the, the last portion of the front-end app that you want to work on is the bit that does the API calling, right? Because that's just always the worst. You make an API call, the response comes, something happens on the UI. You make 10 API calls, like 10 things happen on the UI independently. It's just, it's just, it's just the world's most painful experience to build when you have to make multiple API calls, right? Um, and I don't know if you have this experience, but it's also super irritating when you load up a page, and it loads up really quickly, but then there's an API call that happens in the background, you click on this button, but the button shifted, and it's replaced by another button, which is, which is a destructive action, right? 
Um, and every time that happens to me, I just get so, I, get, I feel like punching my screen. Um, and so what you do is that as a front-end developer, you go talk to your back-end developer, hopefully your, your friends, um, and you say, can you, can you give me one API call? Right? Don't do two API calls. Just give me one API call and give me all of the info in that API call. Uh, and then the back-end developer's like, really? No, you already have it. I mean, what? Just call two functions. I don't want to do this work. I have other more important work to do. Uh, but then, like, you know, the, you, you, you kind of convince the back-end developer. The back-end developer goes on leave for a few weeks, comes back, whatever. Maybe a month later, you have one API endpoint that gives you all of this information, right? Um, and, and you're happy because now you're just making one API call for your entire page. And this is great till you realize that, um, till you realize that you want to fetch different amounts of data for a mobile site and different amounts of data for the desktop site. On desktop, I want to show you your user profile. I want to show you the last 10 addresses. I want to show you the last 10 orders. But on the mobile site, I just want to show you the user profile, one order, uh, maybe the last five orders and just one address. And then as soon as you do that, uh, you again have to go to your backend developer and say, yeah, I'm, I'm making this API call and I'm fetching like 500 KB of data every time, which is fine when you're on this great Wi-Fi connection but it's terrible on mobile and just speeds are slow, can you add another parameter called like fields? And I'll give you a comma separated list of the, like the actual fields that I want. So I'll do like, I'll say user info, ID equals one, and fields equals ID comma name comma address comma whatever, right? And then you kind of come up with this syntax yourself uh, and then you decide how to parse the commas and then you're not allowed to have commas in your names which you don't anyway probably. Uh, but, but whatever, right? Like, it's a thing. It's a thing that you've now built with you and the backend developer, uh, uh, and, and, and now you've, you've done this, right? Which is just, just a nightmare process. So what the good people at Facebook did is they said, let's not do any of this. Let's reinvent everything and call it GraphQL. And what we'll do with GraphQL is we'll not have multiple API endpoints. We'll just have one API endpoint, and this will be a post API endpoint and it'll, it's typically a slash GraphQL endpoint, and we'll post queries to it. There's no get, post, put, patch, delete. I mean, and you, I've, I've not seen too much, too much put, patch, delete anyway. I've only seen get and post mostly. But, so kudos to you if you're using put, patch, delete. But, um, but, we, but we, you, you do away with all of those methods. You just have one method, which is post. You post the query to it, um, and in this query, you describe the shape of the data that you want, right? So instead of kind of hacking around with the query params and coming up with your own syntax to represent what slice of data you want um, or what joins you want to do across various API models, um, you, you just kind of make this query where if you can see on the left in this GIF, if I query for user ID, the JSON just contains ID one. If I query for user ID and name, I get user ID and name. So this language on the left is called GraphQL, right? And if you look at GraphQL, it's basically like JSON with the values removed and the quotes removed, right? It's kind of, it's the, it's the skeleton of the response that you want. And this is why front-end developers love it, because it's just so easy to see what you, know, what you want to do and what this query means. Um, and the back-end developers hate it, because now they have to um, you know, build a GraphQL parser and whatnot. Um, because you need to parse this query. This is a new language, so you need to parse this query, figure out what to do. But there's great tooling around it, so you don't really have an excuse. But um, or you can use Hustler again, but no, I'm just joking. But so, so you can do, so you can kind of build your own GraphQL server, and your GraphQL server will parse this GraphQL query. It will do the same thing that you did always with the API call, uh, but the contract is that your server will now return a response that has the same shape as what was requested by the user, right? Um, and this is GraphQL, uh, or, or this is one core part of GraphQL that makes GraphQL awesome, right? Uh, and, and get REST calls, are replaced by this notion of GraphQL queries, and post, put, delete, patch, rest calls are replaced by this notion of what is called a mutation, right? Um, and they both look fairly similar. So, so that's what GraphQL does, right? Mm, but GraphQL also does something else, and that's the bit that's super interesting to us. Let's say on the back end, I have this order object, which is changing. Um, hopefully you can notice that like there are two colors that come in, and this is a table, so this is an order object table, um, and I have and I have the status of this order is changing because asynchronously something goes and updates this order table, this value, this order row, right? Um, as as an example, right? So 
there is an order that was created after some time the payment suddenly just turns to true or uh, because something happened asynchronously or the fact that it's dispatched suddenly turns to true because it was actually dispatched as an order right um, so this object mutated on the back uh, asynchronously now when this happened what i want to do on the front end is build an experience that shows you on your app uh, when you have the order page open that shows you payment tick um, delivery tick right um, even if i close the page and come back to it you know wherever i left off uh, you know, whatever happened in the middle um, i just kind it, it does it shouldn't matter um, and i should be able to kind of show you the latest state um, the way i need to right so i'm consuming this information asynchronously from the back end um, and whenever this changes i should be able to build the ui for doing that so before graphql what you would have done with a typical api is the first option was that you would have done polling the only thing worse than making multiple api calls for a front end developer is to poll for the same api call multiple times um, that's possibly the only thing that's that's worse than just doing multiple api calls so this is uh, a fairly straightforward idea i will just keep refetching the order object every x seconds and i will pretend that this is real time uh, because i how's how's the end user ever going to know right uh, and and so it doesn't matter and surprisingly it actually works fairly well in most cases uh, it just is bad because a it destroys your soul a little bit every time you set up polling on the front end app and you set up a cleaner because you can't keep polling even when the person navigates away from that page right otherwise you'll be polling for everything um and it also feels bad because um on on mobile you're you're eating up a little bit of extra network you're eating up extra battery every time you do polling right so that's one the second option is web sockets and the reason why web sockets is not fun is because you move straight from like yuck to nightmare um there's this, there's no middle ground because web sockets is just the world's uh is very is very bad uh and it's 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 uh, it's been a part of the http spec now for a while but it's it's incredible how uh the lack of documentation of the spec and how browsers deal with web sockets is astounding um like the the way browsers deal with web socket connections on cores requests is very different um browsers will not send custom http headers uh over cores no matter what you do but it will work if you're on an android app it won't work if you're running it in a browser there's all kinds of crazy things that hap that's happening and you don't want to deal with web sockets right so um what graphql says is that you know what we'll we'll come up with a spec for doing this real time business as as a part of the graphql spec itself we had queries for fetching data we had mutations for mutating data and we'll have subscriptions for watching data right or for watching on events or listening to events so it's almost as if like there was a new rest verb called watch um and that's called a graphql subscription right uh and so with graphql if you remember that order object um subscribing to it is as simple as let me load that yeah so if you can see the bit on the right here um you open up a subscription and you say i want to subscribe to an order where the id is 57 and the shape of the event should contain the payment info the latest payment info the latest dispatched info every time this changes send me send this event to me or send this if uh, every time there's an event so either you can have a live query type thing or you can have a event type thing whatever you prefer but every time this changes send it to me as a front end developer this is all that i do i i don't i don't deal with web sockets underneath it it, it uses web sockets um because graphql clients use web sockets underneath it and if you're building a graphql server you still have to write a web socket server so best of luck for that but um but at least as a front end developer i don't have to do anything to consume real time information i just have to write a graphql query and replace the query keyword with a subscription and i'm done right uh, i don't i don't have to do anything else uh, which is which is amazing because now i can kind of consume information that's happening asynchronously fairly easily right so if you kind of put this idea together with what we thought about when we did like event driven serverless uh your app now talks to a graphql api the instead of a rest api the graphql api is closely linked with an eventing system and has synchronous logic whatever logic you need to be that you think is synchronous kind of goes in inside this api um it talks to your state your stateful layer um and and that's your graphql query that you're running from the app right when it talks to your stateful layer eventing happens and that triggers um serverless functions to to kind of do stuff um and so you're doing your 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 processing stuff um in this case payment and restaurant and and delivery and what not and um, and then whenever that happens your app can open up a graphql subscription to say i've created an order now i subscribe to this order 
and then you chill, right? And then whatever happens, whenever it happens, however many failures happen, whether it happens in the next few mi milliseconds, whether it happens the next day, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, everything just keeps working. Um, that's kind of what the system looks like. Um, what you can do is, uh, the, the cost of the system is, as is fairly apparent, is that you have to build a real-time GraphQL server, you have to build an eventing mechanism, um, and, and then you have to convince your backend developers to move to serverless. Best of luck with all of the three. Uh, but um, but the, the kind of the other way of looking at this, and, and the reason why I'm talking about this also here, um, is that's kind of what we've been building, is that orange box can be replaced by an open source component called Hasura, which is, which is what we build, uh, which gives you a real-time GraphQL API and an eventing system on top of Postgres, um, which kind of helps you set up this kind of architecture out of the box, right? And, um, and in fact, this pattern is something that we're learning from, have seen from our users, um, and that's kind of where the inspiration of this talk comes from as well. So um, what I'm going to do next is do, a, uh, do two demos. One demo for you to kind of look at what an application that is built like this looks like. Um, and the second demo of time permits a demo of actually um, setting this up uh, with, with Hasura as well. So um, kind of a little bit of a prayer to the demo gods now for all of this to work. Um, if you guys have phones, um, if you all have phones, please, please do take out your phones and scan this QR code or um, head to this URL. Um, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh -huh. So I'm just keeping this. It's called, um, for those of you who want to type it in, it's bit.ly slash three-factor hyphen app. Um, and if you can just scan the QR code, you can scan the QR code. All right, so let me open this up. So this is kind of what you should, um, what you should land up on. Uh, and this is the food delivery app that we've been talking about, right? So I'm going to place an order as uh, TG scale 17x, right? Um, and so now what happened is, um, so this is a React app. Uh, the React app is speaking to a GraphQL API to fetch your past orders. I don't have any past orders. I'm going to place a new order. Um, then it fetches like the menu items, and I order a donut and haggis. So it's the best combo. It's a new thing. Um, and 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 then I subscribe to the order, and the order validation is a AWS Lambda. It happens asynchronously. Now it's blocked on the user. The payment is a synchronous function because I need to talk to the Stripe API. Uh, does Stripe payment gets processed? updates the database and says, payment is done. I get that kind of tick asynchronously. Then the next Lambda kicks in. Actually, it's on Google Cloud Functions. Uh, and then the next thing kicks in, uh, which is a delivery assignment thing, which is again on Google Cloud Functions, right? Uh, and um, as we can see on this uh, chart that I have also built, is that you will see these state changes happen as you folks are placing orders, right? So the red line represents the total number of orders placed. The brown line below that, so that, that let me, uh, the line below that represents people who've paid for that order or the orders that have gotten validated. Once the order gets validated, the green lines represent people paying for their orders. You can notice that people don't like paying for their orders, um, which is why it's substantially lagging. But as soon as people pay for their orders, that state changes, triggers the next serverless function, which goes and does the state change for assigning or uh, approving whether the restaurant is open and whatnot or can't take your order, and then triggers the delivery function, right? So, so that's kind of how, how it works. When I don't do this demo to you, I pay nothing for this business logic to be running. Um, and then when I do do this demo to you, um, you can do, I mean, you can, we can have like thousands of orders get placed at the same time, and I don't have to worry about it, right? Um, I don't have to worry about scaling it, right? In a sense, in a sense, it's still a toy demo. Um, the, the other portion that I'm gonna show you is uh, kind of simulating what it looks like if this was, um, if we had a failure, right? So if you can see the screen, um, I am going and placing an order for um, dosa and idli, which are two South Indian food items, which are delicious. And then um, as soon as I did that, I placed 1,000 orders in one shot. So I have a UI button that places 1,000 orders. And then after placing the 1,000 orders, these, the validations start kicking in, right? So more and more of these orders are getting validated. Um, and now to kind of simulate failure, what, what I'm going to do is once these orders get validated, Um, I'm going to hit 
pay for all of these orders. And, and so I paid for all 1,000 of them in one shot. So you noticed a full state transition where all of them got paid. And then I go to AWS and I throttle, and I throttle the function. Um, and, and this is kind of like a network failure, right? Um, the LAN cable got disconnected in the data center. Uh, and so you notice that like 500 or whatever got processed, and then it just flattened out, right? And this is, this is not a failure of the delivery assignment function. It's a failure of the, um, of, of the order validation of the restaurant approval function, which is the third step, not the fourth step. So third step is failed. And so we're kind of flattened out on the third step. Um, and we're panicking, and I'm calling up like various people, and now they're like re looking at cables. Um, they're still looking at cables, right? Uh, and now they kind of figure out that there's a network failure, so let's reconnect those cables, which is me going to AWS and unthrottling it, um, and saying unlimited, whatever, don't throttle this anymore. And so as soon as I kind of remove that throttle, um, and AWS is back, these continue from where they left off, right? Uh, and, and, and this was having this experience for everybody in the organization, including my application developers, uh, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to think about it more than I usually would, um, just, just by building in this style. Um, I, I just wrote my application the first time in this weird three-factor asynchronous way. Um, and, um, and whether there were failures or not, uh, or whether there were thousands of orders or not, things keep working. So that is not my order history. Uh, sorry, viewing history, right? <laughs> cool. All right. So, um, so that's kind of what uh, that's kind of what um, an application that's kind of built of this built like this looks like. I have a little bit more time, so I'm going to spend the next five minutes and show you a live demo of how um, Hasura itself works um, and and kind of fits into this helps you build in this pattern. So let me pray to the gods again because this is a Live demo from scratch. All right, so um, so Hasura is kind of a simple Docker service. What we do, um, it's an it's an open source engine. Uh, what we do is we uh, you you take the Docker container, you point it to a Postgres database, and it generates uh, it generates your real time GraphQL API for you, uh, and um, and then it does eventing as well, right? So I'm going to deploy this on Heroku. Uh, I'm I'm sure all of you are familiar with Heroku. So I'm not. But as soon as I go here, let me call this the scale 17x demo. Right. So what I'm doing right now when I click on this deploy is that I'm asking Heroku to provision the Hasura container for us and a free Postgres database. Heroku does this for free, uh, bless their hearts, uh, and um, kind of allows us to, to run this container and to run a free instance of Postgres. Um, it, takes about, it takes a few seconds to deploy. It's a tiny Docker image, about 20 MB Docker image. Um, and that's kind of what the UI looks like, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into, and we'll kind of look at a few GraphQL queries to understand it as well. So um, that's your GraphQL app endpoint. So mobile and web apps that you're building will connect to that endpoint. We'll make post requests to this endpoint, and we'll try out a few GraphQL queries here, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a table in my database just for trying things out. So I create a profile table that has an ID and a name. And um, there's, let's add a uh, Tanmay, let's add, just creating some random names here. Um, and so as, so as I do standard database stuff, I'm just creating, the aspect ratio is a little bit screwed up, but um, I'm j I've just created a table and I've gotten two rows inside it. And what Hasura gives us is a GraphQL API, so I can query a profile, you know, ID, name, Autocomplete my way through it, and I get that JSON response, right? Um, and so what we're doing internally is we're a compiler, so we compile GraphQL into SQL queries. We add right access control rules and whatnot. I'm not using any access control right now, so any of you can go and destroy my entire database. Don't do that. But um, but but this is kind of what a GraphQL query looks like. Um, and to kind of show you a few more examples of what we can do with GraphQL, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just import an existing database so that we have a we have slightly more models to play around with. So um, that's my database URL. And a all right. So 
That's me connecting to Postgres directly. And that's the table that I have in Postgres. I'd done this via the UI, so the table's already here. Um, I also have a database dump. I'm just going to import that into my database, right? So, um, so now this is kind of creating all of those tables, and now it's starting to import data, right? So as this happens, if I go back to um, the Hasra UI, it'll tell us that there are these tables. These are not exposed over GraphQL. So I'm going to expose them over GraphQL. There are foreign keys. These foreign keys are GraphQL, are hints of GraphQL relationships. Um, and so I'll say, yes, convert all of them into relationships. And now as soon as I do that, what I can start doing is query albums. This is a music database. Um, let me show you what the schema looks like. Uh, Chinook. Right, that's the, so that's the schema that I have here. It's a music database, I have albums. Albums have artists, albums have tracks. And, um, and as soon as I import that here, I can do albums on my API, ID, title, um, and I can find the artist and the name, right? Um, and I'm getting that response here, right? So whatever, 300 elements or so um, in, the, in the shape that I wanted to, right? And I can, this is the way you'd make queries to like say that I only want, let's say the first 10, and you'll only get 10 responses, right? So, um, so that's kind of what GraphQL looks like. Um, underneath it, just to kind of make this make sense for you, this is a post endpoint. I'm sending this as a string to the server. The server takes this string and, and uh, responds with this. The experience as a front end developer is amazing because if I make an error, let's say I misspell something and I call it uh, uh, whatever, TLE, right? I get a little red underline, if you can see. And then if I hover over it, it says, can't query field TLE, did you mean title? Yes, I did mean title. There's AI in this in this API experience, right? So, so I'm 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 the as a front end developer, I I like using GraphQL, right? What I can also do is query for uh, the GraphQL API. In this case, is made by Hasura, but you can have your own as well. So, what I'm going to do now is query for the music tracks. Uh, I'm going to make an aggregate query to fetch the count, right? So if you notice, you'll see that every time I run the query, you're seeing that the count is changing, right? And the count changes because, well, I'm importing data, right? Um, and now what I can do is I can convert this to a subscription, and you'll see that this data just keeps changing, right? So as a front-end developer, I don't care. I don't care. There is something changing on the back end. Can I make a subscription to it? Yes, I can. I will subscribe to it. It works. I'm done, right? Um, and so now if anything changes on the back end, I'm kind of getting that information real time on, on the app, um, and I can kind of deal with it, right? So, so this is kind of the GraphQL portion of it. Um, the other portion of it, which is the eventing side of things, is um, we allow you to create event triggers. Um, and so this means that you can create a trigger called, you know, whatever. Let's say echo. Every time on the profile table there's an insert, we'll go call this webhook, which is http bin.org slash post. Right? So now if I go in and insert something, so this gives us an excuse to try out a mutation. So let's do a GraphQL mutation to insert data. This is like a post. So I'm going to insert profile. Um, I'm going to insert objects, name, whatever, ASDF, returning ID. Right? So I inserted a new profile. I'm going to insert a bunch more. Right, I inserted these. Um, every time there was an insert, I had an event trigger attached to it, uh, which means that I can go in and these events get delivered. Um, they did not get delivered, uh, presumably because I made an error in my URL endpoint. Um, but, and, and I can now set up retry logic on these to ensure that they get delivered multiple times, or I can respect a back off header so that you can implement your own kind of exponential back off. But that's the payload that gets sent, that this is the data that was inserted. Um, this was the person who inserted it, uh, and um, and the response says that whatever this not found because I had a bad URL. But um, but you get the idea, right? So so this is kind of what this looks like, uh, and I yeah. Um, let me just convert this to a full screen again, right? So so that's kind of what we do. Um, but but this is just one implementation of doing this with Postgres. 
Um, if you have your kind of own setup and you have a more complicated data, data layer setup, uh, you'd probably have to piece these things together yourself. Um, but, but this architecture and this idea of using real-time GraphQL as an API, of having um, eventing on the state which is uh, atomic so that you're capturing stuff reliably, which is reliable so that you're delivering stuff reliably, um, and then having that trigger async serverless functions, um, I call this the three-factor pattern because it reminds you of 12-factor, um, and it sounds simpler, but it's not simpler. It's much worse. Um, and so, and, and that's, kind of, um, that's kind of it, but um, feel free to, um, please do reach out to me if you have any questions, and uh, check the architecture pattern out at threefactor.app. Um, check Hasra out at hasra.io. We're a young project, it's open source. Please uh, try it out, uh, you know, give us feedback. I also have uh, funky stickers, so uh, please come and uh, collect some funky stickers. If, uh, if you all are here uh, over the next one or two days and you guys are doing or exploring stuff with GraphQL and serverless, um, let's, uh, I would love to talk about that. I'd love to learn from you, uh, from your implementation, what kind of problems you're running into, especially with serverless, um, how you're dealing with state, how you're dealing with contracts, um, are you putting multiple serverless functions in the same repo, uh, I, do you have multiple repos for each of them? What your local dev CI CD stuff looks like? Uh, would love to talk to you about that, so um, um, feel free to reach out. But uh, that's, that's it from my side, and we can do questions. Yeah? Uh, just one sec, let me put you the mic so everyone can hear. Sure. Um, thank you, that was great. Um, just two questions here. So um, with GraphQL, some um, folks that I know that implemented it, they ran into performance problems when uh, it was under high load. I'm wondering if you've uh, seen anything with that. And then my second question, I haven't implemented much serverless stuff, but um, is it possible, is it best practice, is it common to implement a microservice uh, with serverless? Does that, does that even make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take the GraphQL part first. So, so GraphQL and performance is a big problem because, uh, so, so there, are, there are a few ways to alleviate it, but what happens with GraphQL frequently is that the way you implement a GraphQL server is if you were implementing a REST server, you would have URLs that are mapped to functions. Right? Like a typical Rails app or a Django app or a Flask app, you have a URL that maps to a function. In a GraphQL server, the, the graph of the query, so if I do query albums artists, album has a function and artist has a function. So whenever I make that query, the album function is called, the artist function is called, data is kind of aggregated, put together, and you get that response. Um, unfortunately, in, in, um, in, in bad implementations, what will ha end up happening is that you'll end up making n plus one queries. So let's say, for example, I'm fetching albums and artists. There are 10 albums. So what you'll do is you'll make one request to fetch the 10 albums. For each of the 10 albums, you'll make one request to fetch the artist. Right? So you're making 11 requests to your database or to other services to aggregate this data into a JSON API. This sucks. Um, this is horrible. Right? Um, and, and this is why, um, and, and this is painful to implement. And there are ways to get around this, and there are ways that you can't get around this. Um, but the way that we get around this, for example, is that when you make this query, um, you can see that it's super fast, although it feels like it's on a server. And you can make like 1,000 of these requests per second in um, 50 megs of RAM. And we do this because we compile this to a single SQL query. Um, and so like however large your GraphQL query is, we compile that to one, uh, one SQL query. We inject the right access control rules so that you're looking at your data as an application user. Um, and that kind of solves a lot of the performance problems that you get. Um, there are other kinds of performance problems with GraphQL that you would also see with the REST API that are not unique to GraphQL. But those you'd solve in the same way that you were doing on REST. You do some server-side caching, so querying from the database, you query from Redis, whatever, right? Um, the, the second portion of that question about serverless is, yes, um, it's an emerging pattern to think of your microservice and deploy your microservice with serverless, to think of serverless as just a new container, right? That, that's like, like we, had, we had VMs, we had containers, now we have serverless, which is this new thing and we'll just package our entire microservice and deploy it as a serverless function, um, and then it'll hit the main function, and then it'll delegate to one of the routes inside the microservice. Uh, yeah, that works. I don't think there's, I mean, I see some people doing that. Um, there's also a very systematic way of doing that. There's something called Zappa. Um, so there wouldn't, there wouldn't be a need at that point for Docker? Yes, 
yes, but 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 with Docker, you can still reason about. So, for example, let's say you want to create a request counter. You can have a counter variable that you keep as a global variable that gets incremented in memory, right? Because you have you have the notion of something persisting across invocations. So, in serverless, you don't have that. So, if your microservice is written in a way that it does not depend on the fact that it is running continuously, even when there are no requests. Nothing's hap it's you, you don't rely on the fact that it's running. Like you don't have this notion of a global variable that you can keep or a temporary file system that you can save to. Um, and so if your microservice is written in that sense, in, in that style, sure, it's kind of like serverless. And and there are tools emerging like Zappa that help you convert a Flask microservice into a bunch of serverless functions automatically. Um, but 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 serverless is not really like the functions approach is a slightly different mental model. It's like uh, if you've if you've programmed with Haskell, it's like uh, it's like you only ever have a pure function. You there is you you can't do anything. You you there is no global variable. You can't refer to a global variable. You can't do anything. It's just that one function. Everything has to happen inside that function, right? Um, and so so if, so so that's the change that's required. But you might be able to get away with wrapping your entire microservice into a serverless function. You first, because you're on my way. For the async one, <coughs> can we use the frontend observables, right? Yeah. Or getting it, uh, I'm saying, before, without using GraphQL. Uh, no, the, the, problem, the problem is observables will help you handle the event once you get the event. Right. That is, that is how observables, observables will help you. So GraphQL client for AngularJS uses, uh, Observ uses observables, right? But the problem here is, what is the mechanism to capture events on the client? That's the problem. Observables help you once you have the right, event. How will you get the event? Uh, my REST endpoint, my REST service can return, uh, return observable objects, right? And then the JavaScript. How will it return? Observable. How will it return stuff? Like imagine that order page. I close my order page. I open it again. Like That's how will I? I mean, how will it, the server push data to me? No, it, it cannot. It, it can send only one time. That's what. That's, That's what yeah. The, so here, when I created the order, after I created the order, I got multiple events, right? I got order is validated, done. Order is paid, done. Something else has happened, done. So, so that mechanism is, is the problem. Okay. Just one more the second part is like uh, for the request collapse. So, GraphQL by natively you can get the request collapse. Right? Like you don't need to call uh, multiple services. You just call like one time. So, the same thing the gateway is also tried to solve. Right? Gateways yeah. like Kong or Zool, they also try to solve the same. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. And a common pattern for this is called backend for frontend (BFF). Yes. So you build a REST API that aggregates over other REST APIs. Yes. Yeah, but like, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, like SoundCloud had this BFF approach, but you're still building those APIs. With GraphQL, the idea is that the, the GraphQL developer doesn't handle multiple routes. I build one GraphQL server, and then you as a front-end developer can query whatever you want, I don't care. And in production, we'll whitelist it. In production, we won't allow you to query whatever you want. In development, you can query for whatever you want, and we whitelist it so that um, it's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, so we had a couple of problems with uh, starting to implement serverless and uh, see if you had any solutions for them. One is uh, with using serverless and everything's its own function, how do you manage the uh, repositories for those functions and maintain it without having to have like a thousand different uh, projects, et cetera. And then another one would be uh, what have you done for concerns of like connection pooling? Where it's a normal thing for API servers, but serverless is going to have to connect every time yep, it does yep, something. Yep, yep. Um, great questions. Uh, we have two blog posts out that talk about exactly these, both of these problems. Um, I prefer a, the the way we solve the structuring code organization approach is uh, I'm a big fan of monorepos, and uh, and so we just have we just put all of the functions in the right kind of folders in the monorepo. And then we have CI/CD automation that picks up the right functions from the right places, deploys to wherever, like AWS or Google Cloud or wherever it needs to be deployed, maybe at a different endpoint or whatever, right? Sets up the environment variables, goes updates things. Uh, so that works fine. Uh, but but I, I think the answer to that question really is, how are you thinking about the ownership of your serverless functions? The repo ownership and the business logic ownership should should be closely linked, right? So if you think it's this case where you want to have one repo per function, go for it. But if you feel like, no, it's 
I, I feel like this team is managing a bunch of these serverless functions together. That's fine as well. For connection pooling, we did a few very interesting experiments. Um, we ran AWS Lambda, uh, which would then connect to the, which would connect to an RDS instance directly, uh, without going through a connection pool. It will just like open up a new connection every single time. This is the worst possible thing to do, but it was just to see what happens, right? Um, and so very quickly it errors out. Like you start making 100 requests, you make 100 invocations, it will fail. So the way AWS encourages you to solve this problem is by creating a, a connection pool variable uh, that is outside the scope of the function. And, and, and what ends up happening is because the, because the cloud vendor is, re is running those containers, is recycling those containers, they actually keep that, that, they keep that variable um, in memory. So the connection maintains across invocations of your serverless function, but you don't have any control over it. So maybe you get connection pooling, maybe you don't. Um, so the way we've solved this problem is uh, we very frequently for RDS deploy a PG bouncer, um, and then the and it just runs on an EC2, and the PG bouncer just connects to RDS. I don't know why RDS doesn't give you a good PG bouncer by default. Like I think DigitalOcean's managed uh, database offering has a has an inbuilt like connection pooling uh, system. But as soon as you add PG bouncer, you can do we 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 tried out 5,000 invocations in a second on. Uh, on Lambda, which we're connecting through PG Bouncer, no errors, uh, like complete zero error rate. Uh, Aurora, you can't connect to Aurora directly. Aurora is the serverless thing; it doesn't work. It errors out faster than RDS Postgres does. Um, it's it's better to just have PG Bouncer. So yeah. So I saw the, your uh, um, the design of keeping the microservices an API and then a database, right. simple structure. Um, this is exactly how I have it, but small things changes. Um, instead of a microservices, um, the microservices is built on gRPC services. Right. Instead of being HTTP. So the API gateway, I'm keeping it as gRPC gateway. So now I would like to use your Hasura framework. Got so it. How do I plug in? Is there an option to plug in on the gRPC gateway? Right. As a front end. Um. As so, so your front end is making gRPC calls right now. Uh, no. The, okay. My front end is going to call the REST API. Your front end calls a REST API call, and then your REST API gateway does gRPC, right? No, no, no. The gRPC gateway uh -huh. um, supports the REST API calls. Oh, got it, got it. Okay. So it's like a um, proxy. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we, yeah. So, so there are there are two, three ways to do this. So on the front end, for example, like you do GraphQL, the GraphQL query string is sent over HTTP. Um, the GraphQL query string can also be sent over gRPC, but I, gRPC is not a very common front end to gateway thing. Uh, but let's say you want to keep that as REST, and after the gateway you want to do gRPC stuff. Uh, the, we, don't, we don't do gRPC yet, but I think, if you, I think if you raise an issue on the repo, we should be able to add gRPC support fairly easily. Can you keep your in front of the gRPC? You can, yeah. You would, ha in, if you have to use it the way you currently are using it without replacing a component, you would have to keep Hasura in front of gRPC. Uh, and yeah, you'd have to keep it in front of gRPC. But the ideal way of doing it is for Hasura to just support gRPC. Then I'm going with the three layers. Correct. Which is what you should not do, and which is why you, what you should do is open an issue and say support gRPC, and we'll support gRPC. That's the, <laughs> that's the right way to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how do you deal with uh, authorization? Right. Um, so we took inspiration from Postgres's row level security, um, Postgres RLS. Uh, we re-implemented, yeah, we re-implemented Postgres RLS at the API layer. So you can give declarative configurations on top of your models to specify what access people have. So for example, I can go to the profile table and say permissions, a user can only access data where the ID is equal to some session user ID, right? I'm doing all of this through the UI, but you can do this declaratively as well. Like whatever I do through the UI is just a, is, is a declarative setup as well. Um, and then you kind of say whether you want access to these columns, you want to limit, um, you want to rate limit like the number of responses that you get, whatever size limit the responses that you get. Um, so that's kind of one way of doing it. Um, but this is basically what the API layer does is that whenever you get a header, which contains an authorization header or a cookie, um, 
Hasura, uh, like our system resolves that and converts that into session variables like user ID and role. Um, and then the permission rules uh, refer to these variables. So the SQL that we create, instead of when you query for query profile ID name, we convert it to select ID common name from, profi from profile where ID equal to cookie.user ID. So that's the, that's the compiled SQL, uh, which works. Any other questions? All right. Well, oh, sorry, we got one more. I yeah, always we think we they're all done. <laughs> and there's one left. <laughs> so, did you have any problems with uh, uh, start times for the serverless? Like, uh, for like serverless? Serverless. Yes. Um, yes. It's uh, so. So yes and no. So if you have consistent load, like you all you right. Let's say you have a website. And you're just always getting uh, 10 API calls every instant. Uh, then this is not a problem because the cloud vendors keep it warm for you. Uh, but if you don't have sustained traffic and it's spiky, then what ends up happening is that it takes time for the first. It, it can take. They don't even give you a guarantee. The cloud vendor tells you it will take maybe 200 milliseconds, but it can actually be anything. There is no SLA on how much time it takes to start. Uh, in our case, this is not a problem because it's async anyway. The serverless function is running asynchronously anyway, right? Like something, the the API layer, the GraphQL API layer is not serverless. The GraphQL API layer is a container, which is one to an auto scale, not zero to an auto scale. Um, so so that is running always, and the event that triggers serverless, that can the serverless function can start whenever it wants. It doesn't matter because whenever it asynchronously happens, uh, I will get the update on my UI. Because it's asynchronous, I don't actually care about. There's no hard limit on. The user experience is not made better or worse. Does that make sense? Yes, but that's, that's it. There'll be a timeout right on the gateway. When you call the there is no gateway here, right? When you call the server. I call the server. That first request ends. I create the order. That request is stopped. It's ended. I create the order. I get order ID. Done. Now I open up a web socket to say subscribe order ID. So that first request is ended within like 10 milliseconds. It's create order ID. I instantly get the response back, and then it's stopped. Does that make sense? We're at the hour, so I'm going to cut it off there and let our speaker get away. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for answering all our questions. Thank you. Thank you. See you folks at game night.
Hi. Hello everyone, welcome to the developer track. We'll get started here with our next talk. Uh, we've got Alexander here talking about fast HTTP string processing. Um, without further ado, I'll let him get started and get you guys into it and we'll talk, uh, we'll have questions at the end. Uh, I'll come around and answer your questions if you raise your hand. Thank you. Okay, thank you for introduction. Uh, good evening, see hackers. So um, let me start from introduction, who am I, uh, what we do, and uh, so on. So um, uh, we uh, develop custom software in uh, high-performance networking area more than uh, 10 years, and usually we, uh, the area includes uh, security applications like uh, web application firewalls, uh, VPNs, uh, whatever, uh, usually we develop the stuff in Linux kernel and uh, provide some uh, performance optimization of existing solutions and so on. One example of uh, such project which we are proud of is uh, Positive Technologies Application Firewall. The project was mentioned by Gartner Magic Quadrant in 2015 in uh, Visual and uh, also we develop Tempest FWU. This is a project which uh, I will be talking more about this uh, presentation. And this uh, application delivery controller, open source, of course, so it's uh, embedded into Linux CPI IP stack. And uh, if we talk about application delivery controller, then uh, usually this uh, uh, aggregation of uh, HP accelerator and uh, firewall, which provides you uh, efficient uh, load balancing, uh, web cache, uh, whatever you need from uh, HP accelerator, plus uh, additional filtration of DDoS attacks, uh, web securities, and so on. In uh, case of uh, Tempest, Tempest uh, it's uh, since it's built into uh, Linux CPI IP stack, it's very fast, it's comparable with uh, kernel bypass 
our approaches and uh, at the same time it's very flexible you can manage it uh, just like you manage Apache and Nginx uh, whatever so if you compare Tempest FW with uh, Nginx we typically see two uh, to three times better performance and if we compare it with CSTAR an example of DPTK based uh, web server we show very similar numbers for four CPU cores just begin of the graph uh, we started to work on uh, Tempest FW when we started uh, to work on uh, positive technologies application firewall. That time we had to develop a uh, web application firewall. This uh, kind of uh, application firewall which works on HP layer and provides you web security. It filters out uh, as much as possible web uh, attacks. Uh, attacks. Also, uh, it protects from uh, DDoS uh, attacks from uh, on application layer, and usually such applications are built on top of usual uh, HP proxies, uh, HA proxy, Nginx, whatever. And that time we realized that uh, usual uh, HP uh, proxies aren't good for filtration logic. They could be perfect for application logic, for example, to deliver content, to manage it, to mangle it, or what, what, whatever you need, but not for security aspects. And uh, that time we started uh, Tempest of w, uh, w inspired from NetFilter, so NetFilter is a kernel firewall working in TCP IP stack, so we just made a continuation of TCP IP stack to HTTP, and now we uh, have uh, Tempest of W. I want to make a disclaimer that uh, I will talk a, a lot about Nginx during my presentation, and the reason um, why I choose only exactly Nginx is that uh, Nginx is very simple, and everybody knows it, so it's just a good reference for presentation. During the presentation, I will concentrate on uh, HP processing, especially crucial for high-performance HP processing and uh, security aspects. Uh, I will uh, consider two uh, main questions. The first one is uh, HP state machine, uh, efficient state machine, and uh, HP strings processing. And uh, you might uh, wonder why do we talk about HP strings if we have HP2. After all, uh, HP 1.1 is about strings, and HP2 is mostly about binary data. Uh, however, if I would start from the last reason. Actually, uh, the state of the art that HP2 was uh, adopted in most HP servers in addition to existing HP 1.1. It means that we have a HP uh, 1.1 server and we have a special decoder for HTTP 2. And when we decode HTTP 2, then we pass the decoded uh, data into uh, standard HP 1.1 uh, parser. This is just how, how the most server behave. The second thing is that uh, we have uh, dynamic tables, compression in HTTP 2. However, they are limited in size, and some of the headers uh, can easily uh, outsize the uh, dynamic table. The example of the headers is cookie, URI, and um, referral. And uh, we might note that uh, these uh, HTTP fields are very crucial for security. So let's have a look at uh, dummy HP float against the Nginx uh, access log switched off. Uh, we see HP parser as a uh, hotspot in the profile. And I want to mention that in this exactly uh, profile, we see that the profile is flat. It means that if we optimize the uh, bottleneck, then we won't get dramatic performance improvement in this case. So uh, how usual HP uh, parsers work? Typically, we have a loop over ingress data, and we have a couple of switch statements. The first one uh, is for state, the second one for uh, input characters. So we have an auxiliary variable uh, state. Uh, we have an ingress uh, character B. We start from the 
loop and first statement, we pass to current state and uh, current um, character. So we typically made a jump uh, and probably we get the instruction cache uh, miss here. Next, we go to the end of the loop uh, and uh, we uh, repeat the next uh, cycle with new state. And uh, here we go, we just, uh, we, we made, uh, made the spin, but we actually uh, moved, just moved down for the next state. Uh, so ideally, we should uh, get what we have on the uh, right, but actually we are just spinning all over the loop. That's not good. Uh, if we look at the request line parsing in Nginx, this is a, a snippet from real code. And uh, there are a couple of notes about how Nginx works. So first of all, it works with copied network I.O. It means that all the data of the requests are in memory. And if we uh, process uh, get method, then it means that the method is fully in RAM. We don't need to bother with uh, various data chunks. Uh, and uh, now Nginx uses the knowledge. It uh, spins over the data, character by character, calculates the length of current token, then after that, uh, runs the switch on the length of the token. Uh, this, uh, we, now we're going to uh, see what GCC optimizes for such state machines. So when we have a, a switch statement, we have a two uh, possibilities how the statement is organized. The first one is on the left uh, is that we have uh, enum of sequential numbers from 0 to 26. And uh, in this case, we, instead of scanning um, case statements in the, inside the switch one by one, uh, we uh, can run a lookup uh, table. So at the middle of assembly snippet, we have a lookup table. It's just a, a sequential array of pointers. And uh, with the first jump, we just uh, jump by address of, uh, from the lookup table. So with two memory uh, re the references we get to the required state. The second uh, possibility for switch statement is uh, not consequ consequent states. So in this enum, we have uh, uh, various parts uh, states. And now we cannot organize lookup table because all the offsets in the ta tables are very different. And uh, the highest index in the table is quite too large. So we fall back to binary search, and uh, GC compiles your switch statement into binary search over the states. Uh, next, let's have a look at um, uh, Nginx uh, parser. Typically, it's about uh, 9 kilobytes of size. Uh, it's uh, like a bit more than three times less than CPU uh, layer one uh, cache size. And it, uh, in total, it implements only a bit more than 80 states. Uh, Nginx pass is very simple. This is because it uh, needs to do only basic tokenization and do not care about uh, strict HTTP validation. But uh, for security reasons, we need to know uh, what the headers are. We need to understand which headers are passed to backend servers and so on. So we need to provide much more uh, sophisticated uh, HTTP parser to carefully analyze what the headers are. So in Tempesta currently we have more than uh, 500 states. And uh, Tempesta uses zero copy I.O. It means that all the um, uh, functions about uh, I.O. Uh, aren't, uh, aren't so important in uh, profile. So large and uh, accurate uh, HP parser becomes the even more uh, strong bottleneck of the system. And uh, the bad thing about uh, zero copy I.O. is not is that currently we need to bother with data chunks. We can get uh, HP methods separated in a couple of chunks, so we cannot uh, compute the size of the uh, token. Uh, so uh, we started to do the same as uh, Regal does. 
uh, we just use uh, direct, uh, direct labels and jumps uh, plus two switch statements. So the, corner, uh, um, the, the main point of this uh, technique is uh, state. A definition we have a case statement and we have a direct label and now we uh, execute a switch statement on the first entrance to the function and uh, the bad thing about this technique is that now uh, if in nginx case we have a for or while loop and we have a, a we have a program counter we have a data counter inside the uh, loop header. Uh, now we need to move all the logic inside the move marker and uh, now the state machine executes the code ev on each uh, state. So typically such state machines uh, generate much larger code. However, GC on uh, optimization purpose uh, does the, um, some, something similar. So if we uh, look at the assembly code of state machine with uh, 20 or 30 states, we might see that about five or six states will uh, have the same logic. I mean, um, in increment of uh, data pointers, check the bounds, and so on. Uh, next thing which we did is uh, to use uh, GC extension labels as values, and now we remember uh, labels address in parser, and uh, now we can remove switch statement at all. So we don't execute any uh, lookup tables or binary search. And uh, now we use the auxiliary variable only once when we start to pass HP request. If we have several data chunks of the uh, requ uh, request, then we still use uh, the auxiliary variable only once. Uh, let's have a uh, look at the benchmark. I just want to mention that uh, in the benchmark we usually set um, uh, task to a particular CPU. We uh, choose the smallest numbers because we need to remove all the system overheads and so on. So in uh, states, uh, in state machine with very small uh, number of states, uh, the approaches are almost indistinguishable. However, with a lot of states, we see a dramatic performance improvement uh, two or more times. If we will look at branch misses in uh, such state machine, we see that uh, while uh, switch statement state machine is two times less than the go-to driven machine, it still uh, has much more branch misses. And uh, it's uh, very, very interesting that uh, while uh, code of state machine uh, is almost 50,000 uh, bytes of code, it's much larger than uh, layer one uh, CPU instruction cache, we still uh, see uh, twice less number of K, uh, instruction cache misses. This is because uh, we do less jumps and we decrease the uh, probability of uh, cache miss uh, even in a larger uh, state machine. The next point which we observed in the state machine is that if you uh, program your state machine, then you place your most probable states and the first states at the top of the machine. And you expect that the less probable states you can place at the bottom of uh, state machine and they will be executed later or maybe uh, not prefetched to the cache at all. However, GC doesn't uh, have such knowledge about the state's probability and it's uh, free to move uh, states around the code. And uh, we observe that the less probable states uh, become at the top of the function while our, the most crucial states uh, move it to the end of the function. That's not good. So if we use a uh, compiler barrier, we can uh, force GC to uh, keep the states as way they are and uh, just uh, um, addition of the compiler barrier to state definition improves performance for four persons. Next, uh, we consider um, uh, stronger optimization, uh, compiler optimization, and surprisingly uh, at stronger optimization layer we see lower performance. And uh, if we look uh, more carefully at the, what, what the optimization switches does, we find that some of them uh, actually make the performance worse. 
And if we carefully choose the right uh, switches, then we can get the, uh, more performance. The green, um, the green switches are auto vectorization um, options. You can, um, they are by default uh, switched on on a higher layer of optimization. And unfortunately, not uh, all of them uh, can be done in all the code. For example, in our uh, HP state machine, auto vectorization doesn't uh, do anything at all. So there, there are simply no optimization uh, on the compilation phase. Uh, this bit outdated uh, GC tutorial. Uh, actually, uh, GC can uh, optimize and vectorize much more sophisticated loops than this uh, depicted on the slide. But in our case, it just doesn't work at all. Uh, next thing. Uh, in Tempesta and Nginx, we do the same trick. So if we have uh, some request method, uh, say get, of two, uh, four ca characters, then uh, instead of matching the characters one by one, we just um, uh, compile, we just uh, make uh, the integer pointer and compare two integers. However, since we have no, uh, have no idea which data came to the HP parcel and uh, we have no idea about its alignment, uh, we can uh, hit um, CPU penalty on misaligned word reading. And uh, this another MICA by benchmark, and uh, now we see that uh, misaligned uh, integer access uh, can worth performance in two times. And it's simply, it can be simply fixed if we just made uh, first uh, check whether the address align it to four bytes. If yes, then we um, uh, treat it as integer pointer. If not, then we uh, read characters by characters. Very straightforward. Uh, however, if we try to employ the optimization technique in a real life path, we might uh, find that uh, performance results uh, become even worse. What's the problem? Uh, in the benchmark, uh, to measure uh, the speed of each uh, memory uh, read uh, carefully, we had to keep um, benchmark code in one uh, compilation unit and the uh, function which uh, defines memory in another compilation unit. So now a compiler cannot uh, uh, cannot make the tricks uh, about reading the memory and have to execute the, exactly that code uh, which uh, it does, does know, does, doesn't have knowledge about. Uh, however, in um, real life parser, we don't need to uh, keep such uh, lightweight function uh, separated and just inline them into the parser. And uh, now the uh, GCC have knowledge about uh, optimization of the uh, matching routines. And uh, in that case, we uh, compile generates just different uh, code. That's no, code, uh, there's nothing special about the code. There are not more uh, significant and more branch misses. There are no more uh, cache misses. Uh, the code from a profile point of view ju just looks um, robust, just, just as uh, the NAS version. The thing is that uh, assembly code uh, generated by GC is uh, much more different and GC is just confused by uh, more complex um, statements in uh, if branches and generates less optimal code. You can find uh, more discussion about the topic in our issue on uh, GitHub. So uh, we um, end up with uh, state machines, and now we come to HP strings. And uh, let's uh, first observe why HP strings are important in HP parsers. Uh, first of all, this uh, usual URI, this my, uh, no, almost my URI from Booking.com when I tried to book a hotel in Pasadena. And if you check uh, a lot of options on Booking.com, you easily get the URI of almost one kilobyte. And uh, on the right, we have a state machine of URI parsing from Nginx. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, we see that um, 
this very long switch statement passing uh, character by character uh, URI, and uh, we just saw that the case uh, switch based um, automatons aren't so quick. So if you have a slow logic from one side and you have a very efficient uh, data to um, make, uh, to give a hard time for that logic, so why don't not to use the data in your DDoS, um, DDoS attack? So this, uh, if, if you want to uh, cause serious DDoS, it's not wise to use a simple in index uh, request uh, instead of uh, simple requests, you can just use large URI to, uh, uh, to make uh, the parser work hard, and the large URI also efficiently load your backend logic, so you can just efficiently uh, nail the target ser server by DDoS with more complex URIs. And the second thing is that uh, in Tempesta we um, search for injection attacks in URIs. So the second uh, example is injection in URIs. It's also not so long, but still uh, not also not so small URI, which we can uh, must carefully analyze. And to uh, be sure that uh, th the problem is really important, we can just uh, put a lot of uh, more or less a real life request to the um, uh, server. Again, this uh, access lock is switched off, and we can easily see that both of the Nginx uh, parser routines are on the top. And in this uh, HP flute, we um, use very complex uh, requests, and now uh, the profile isn't flat. So we have a very clear bottleneck in the HP processing. Uh, what we can do with HP strings? Uh, first of all, HP strings are very different. Uh, in comparison with uh, common C strings, they do not end with uh, zero byte. Instead, they end with various uh, delimiters. It could be one byte delimiters, two byte delimiters, and even one uh, delimiter, uh, CRLF, can be two byte or it can be one byte LF only. And the uh, second thing uh, that uh, we must carefully check a lot of alphabets uh, in uh, RFC a lot uh, strings for security purpose. And the uh, standard STL SPN uh, function provided by GLIPC uh, does very poor job on uh, scanning the accepted uh, characters. And the second interesting uh, function, which is good to optimize, is a uh, comparison. And in, in just in many places in modern HTTP passes, we see uh, special cases when you need to compare English string with some uh, statically defined uh, string in the passes. So the second string uh, should not be converted in case. In some uh, HTTP passes, we observed that uh, switch uh, statements are used just uh, as we just saw for Nginx URI parser, and we know that uh, switch driving fine state machines aren't fast at all. Um, let's make a little study about what the people do in this area. So uh, Nginx provides the most uh, straightforward logic, just uh, character by character uh, processing. It does very careful analyzing which uh, characters are lowered and not. And uh, Pico Parser, a uh, library HP uh, from uh, H207, uh, uh, can um, eat by 16 characters at once and analyze uh, them for against a lot of alphabets. Uh, Cloudflare made extension for Pico HP Parser, so now they can eat by 32. Uh, characters at once, and uh, they used AVX2 extension for that. Uh, this example, how PCM STRI uh, instruction works, uh, it might be hard to read uh, uh, the functions on the slide. Uh, uh, this um, AGC uh, intrinsic. So I select with uh, both the most important. Uh, pieces of the code. So first of all, we place 
uh, our allowed uh, alphabet in uh, static uh, static uh, memory. We define it as cons. We provide alignment uh, for the most efficient reference to the memory. And the bad thing about PCI uh, PCM STI uh, instructions that uh, it can treat by eight um, ranges or 16 characters at once. And uh, if you have a range, for example, as a second range, uh, and in the range we have only one character, then we uh, have to spend the whole range to uh, declare only one character range. Uh, so that's not comfortable. That doesn't suit all the um, uh, alphabets in RFC. Uh, so uh, Cloudflare uses a more simple approach. It's not so uh, precise as uh, Pico Parser approach, but it's very straightforward. We just uh, uh, check uh, two bounds of the uh, allowed variable and uh, also add a tab as one more uh, allowed uh, character. The code is uh, straightforward, uh, simple, and uh, fast. This is a comparison of the two parsers. We see that uh, Cloudflare version um, two times faster on large uh, data, but uh, still somewhat slower on smaller data. This is because uh, AVX uh, instruction set is more heavyweight than PCM STI. We, I used the upper limit as uh, 1.25 uh, of kilobyte because this is the highest, um, this is the largest uh, data chunk which can come to our um, zero copy uh, processor. This uh, upper limit for is a net frame. Uh, so if we compare the uh, par, uh, the string uh, processors with Asteris PN, we see that Asteris PN is incredibly slow, so it's not good to use it. And now we compare with uh, our processor. Uh, our string matching is uh, faster than, um, uh, than, both the, uh, than both the algorithms on large and small strings and uh, has very uh, very minor uh, incre increase of performance uh, in, in uh, uh, with the growing of the increased data. So um, the algorithm works in uh, several stages. So the first stage is uh, function prolog when we process the small strings. Uh, so we do exactly the same as Nginx. We define the static table URI. Uh, for allowed characters, and we run a very simple dummy uh, switch statement over four characters, not more. The limit for the uh, four characters is exactly the last statement uh, when we have massive branching. So if we add more characters, then we will slow down the last statement. And also we use uh, static branch prediction, likely a statement, uh, to make the uh, code as uh, close to the entry point of the function as possible. This is because uh, small strings are more sensitive to branch mispredictions. The main, uh, main loop body is um, this one. We have uh, three calls of basically the same uh, logic, and we uh, since AVX uh, instruction set works with 32 bytes, we actually start from 128 bytes of processing. Uh, the thing is, uh, inside the function, we execute uh, the same code in parallel in uh, four uh, data streams. Uh, this this allows the processor to eat the data quickly and um, execute code in parallel. So after the main uh, loop, we have a, a function epilog. This is uh, just uh, very close to prolog. Now, we, since we uh, finish with 16-byte uh, strings, we have to process uh, strings with tails uh, less than 16 bytes. Uh, just the same technique. And uh, here we go. This is the main... Um, main um, description of the algorithm. 
we uh, use uh, ASCII table representation, uh, which is depicted on the uh, figure. Uh, this representation uses eight uh, columns, 16 uh, rows, and we start from uh, loading uh, static uh, table. Uh, wh what we did here, uh, in the URI-BM uh, table, we, uh, we describe ASCII uh, lines, uh, ASCII table line by line. So the first line is encoded as B8. We, uh, we read the ASCII, first ASCII, uh, ASCII row in, uh, in reverse order. So we start from P little, P big, at sign, and zero. And the third uh, row is uh, R small, Q, R big, B big and uh, 2. So it's essentially F8 uh, number. So this is how we encode the ASCII lines. Uh, and now we execute shuffle of the uh, ASCII uh, constant table in accordance to uh, ingress data. So if we have uh, data as PR, uh, then uh, on the f first position, we uh, have a s characters from the first line of ASCII tables. So we good, we leave the uh, bit mask on the same position, zeroth position. Uh, however, R is from third uh, line of ASCII tables, and uh, we need to move uh, or shuffle the bit mask for f uh, third, for third um, ASCII line to the second position where our R character uh, is placed. So essentially, now we uh, just pu uh, arrange ASCII uh, lines, and we say that uh, at the first position of the string, we have a character from the first line of the ASCII tables. At the second position, we have a character from the third uh, line of ASCII tables. It's, that's straightforward. Uh, next, we want to do with the same with uh, ASCII table columns and arrange them in uh, accordance with um, ingress data. To get the ASCII columns, we need to do a bit more operation. We need to shift uh, characters for four bits left and uh, split them. However, in uh, our AVX and SC extension, we have a shift only for two bytes, so we need to add additional and uh, instruction to clear the uh, move it uh, less significant bits. So by the end and uh, left shift, we have uh, from our PR symbols, we have uh, 0707. And it means that uh, in first and the second uh, position, we have uh, characters from the very last column of ASCII tables. This is seven. And uh, we uh, may do the shuffle and uh, place the, uh, this uh, column identification defier to the first and second uh, places. Uh, now we, uh, the thing is trivial. We just uh, perform end or over the two vectors and define which characters are lowered and which not. Next, we count zeros and return the how many bytes are uh, good for us. The good thing uh, about this approach is that um, since we uh, use it dynamic, uh, in previous slides, we use it statically defined tables of encoded uh, s characters which allow it for our ASCII tables. And now we can uh, dynamically define uh, in the table which characters are allow it for our URI, which characters are allow it in our uh, user agent or any different HTTP header. And the resulting algorithm with uh, dynamic uh, tables instead of static tables will work with very close speed. So um, these are two examples of attacks. The first one is from uh, Black Hat uh, talk. We, uh, the injection uses uh, add sign uh, character. It's probably not the most, uh, most common character in your eyes. So if you don't need to handle the characters in your application, you can just define this range for your eye and exclude the character. The same you can do for user agent. 
I was surprised that it's uh, it's handy to launch uh, attack in the, even user agent uh, could be static uh, header, but nevertheless uh, there are attacks in uh, such headers. And uh, dollar dollar sin is isn't a common character in user agent, so we can exclude it as well. So we can define dynamic tables which characters are allowed and not. So the last one is uh, string comparison. This is very straightforward and very simple. We just uh, do uh, two things, uh, three things. The first thing is we convert uh, case of the characters in only one string. So in all the characters we uh, compare uh, in first uh, vector, we compare each character with uh, A and Z uh, constants. And uh, if the character uh, is in, in from, from, the, from the range, then we convert the case. Uh, we use a couple of tricks from Hackers Delight uh, book uh, to uh, reduce number of comparison in uh, first two lines. And uh, also we uh, had to subtract um, H0 from both the sides uh, to uh, move from signed, uh, signed comp from unsigned comparison to signed. So, however, the idea of the things are very, very simple. Since we, uh, once we uh, determined which characters must be converted to different case, we just execute end operation with uh, uh, cast uh, case uh, conversion constants. And next, we just do all with uh, our original string. We get the uh, string with uh, um, converted case, and now we can compare it with the second string. Also, not so much operations, uh, very simple, and uh, runs quickly. Uh, it was mentioning that libc also use, I think, this uh, 2.18 or 2.19 version of libc. I didn't check the later versions, but that version of libc uh, uses AVX instruction set, but um, in IVX2, we can get more speed and uh, the results are on the side. Uh, the last topic, so we end up with the parsers, and uh, the last topic which I want to discuss is uh, FPU context switch. The thing is uh, that when we use uh, single instruction, multiple data instructions in your programs, or just compile uh, arbitrary uh, C program with highest uh, level of optimization and compiler uses auto vectorization, uh, then you use um, registers from FPU unit. So the registers for single instruction multiple data lives in a different unit. And uh, the thing is that when you switch from user space to kernel and back from kernel to user space, you don't uh, spend time on saving and restoring the uh, single instruction multiple data registers. However, if you switch from one user space program to another, you have to save and restore uh, single instruction multiple data registers. So basically, kernel doesn't use uh, single instruction multiple data. However, if you need to uh, use the extension like uh, crypto or some other uh, kernel code, you can explicitly uh, save and restore uh, state of FPU. This is done by these two calls. And uh, since Tempest uh, works in Linux TCP IP stack, we care about the stuff. And uh, to uh, reduce the effect of uh, context switch, we uh, save uh, context uh, switch, we save um, single instruction multiple data register when software queue begins and uh, TCP IP uh, stack starts working. And uh, we restore the state when we uh, finish our job and let the user space to run further. And uh, just to uh, think, uh, just to see how, how the uh, single instruction multiple data context switches are bad, there's uh, another micro benchmark that shows dramatic uh, performance uh, problems. However, as we just saw we, for 
program, program alignment, uh, this uh, micro benchmarks aren't uh, do not show the pro problem for uh, full program. So if we are very bad at micro benchmark, it doesn't mean that you see the huge penalties on context switch for your user space program. However, uh, being in kernel is good that we uh, can eliminate uh, the problem of FPU context switch as, pass, as, as much as possible. So I'm basically done. This uh, useful links. Uh, the first two links is my blog post about the topics which I discussed in this presentation. They're relatively old. Um, it's also good to read uh, Cloudflare blog, and Hackers Delights is always good and useful. So uh, thank you, um, questions, and we'll be happy to see you on our GitHub. So thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Just one quick question. I don't really I haven't really understood you say that uh, for this mini state machine, uh, GCC can sometimes reorder most uh, popular, most important values uh, with least important. And uh, you say that you eliminate this problem with just uh, memory barrier. But why memory barrier is just enough here and not exactly? Um, one moment. You are about this slide, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, look, at the left we have, um, basically this is a marker language. So, so we have a state and the next each, um, the state, uh, well, um, uh, consider that we have a state uh, processing uh, get header, post header, and the last uh, state to process unlock uh, methods character by character. So when we enter the state, we uh, since uh, get and post requests are the most frequent in uh, traffic, real life traffic, we want them to have as uh, closer to entry point of the function as possible. Uh, that, that's clear. However, GCC rearranges, um, if we use uh, direct labels, uh, GCC is free to rearrange the code uh, as possible. And uh, uh, compiler barrier is uh, exactly the thing that, uh, which prevents a uh, compiler from rearranging uh, code across the barrier. So if we have a barrier, we say to the compiler explicitly that please leave the code all, uh, above the barrier, at the above the barrier, and uh, which is after the barrier, uh, it must be leave after the barrier. A compiler is free to rearrange the code above the bar barrier, uh, but not cause the uh, barrier. Yeah. Different use cases, but yeah, probably it's a nice side effect. Yeah, I actually, actually I always uh, have been using the barrier in different semantics, but this one, which we figured it out for state machines, it's uh, very, very interesting. Just a question for me, actually. A, a memory barrier there is a, a little bit costly. Is it is it possible to use profile guided optimizations to get GCC to recognize that the get and the post should be first? Sort of cheat. Uh, this is not a memory barrier, this is a compiler barrier. Uh, m maybe I didn't get your qu oh, question. Yeah, no, so you're right, it's a this, uh, Yeah, this is a different so thing. It's not that expensive. I see. Uh -huh. yeah, good point. Any other questions? Well, cool. Well, thank you very much. That was okay. quite an awesome thank thing. You guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. That was great. Thank you guys very much. And this ends the developer track for today. Yeah, of course. Uh, is it possible to use this mini state machine for other purposes, for example, for parsing JSON or something? Parsing JSON? Yeah. Because I mean, I see similar. And I want, because I was trying to do.